The New World, A History of the English-Speaking Peoples, Volume B. Winston Spencer Churchill Preface for Reaching Events took place in the two centuries covered by this volume. The New World of the American continent was discovered and settled by European adventure. In the realms of speculation and belief, poetry and art, other new worlds were open to the human spirit. Between 1485 and 1688 the English peoples began to spread out all over the globe. They confronted and defeated the might of Spain. Once the freedom of the seas had been won the American colonies sprang into being. Lively and assertive communities grew up on the western shores of the Atlantic Ocean, which in the course of time were to become the United States. England and Scotland adopted the Protestant faith. The two kingdoms of the island became united under a Scottish dynasty. A great civil war was fought on abiding issues of principle. The country sustained a republican experiment under the massive personality of Oliver Cromwell. But, at the nation's demand, the royal tradition was revived. At the end of this volume the Protestant faith has been secured under a Dutch monarch, Parliament is far advanced on the road to supremacy in the affairs of state. America is fast developing, and a prolonged and worldwide struggle with France is close at hand. W.S.C. Chartwell Westerham Kent September 4, 1956 Book I Innocence and Reformation Chapter Another Round World have now reached the dawn of what is called the 16th century, which means all the years in the hundred years that begin with 15. The name is inevitable in English, but confusing. It covers a period in which extraordinary changes affected the whole of Europe. Some had been on the move for a long time, but sprang into full operative force at this moment. For two hundred years or more the Renaissance had been stirring the thought and spirit of Italy, and now came forth in the vivid revival of the traditions of ancient Greece and Rome, insofar as these did not affect the foundations of the Christian faith. The popes had in the meanwhile become temporal rulers, with the lusts and pomps of other potentates, yet they claimed to carry with them the spiritual power as well. The revenues of the church were swelled by the sale of indulgences to remit purgatory both for the living and the dead. The offices of bishop and cardinal were bought and sold, and the common people taxed to the limit of their credulity. These and other abuses in the organization of the church were widely recognized and much resented, but as yet they went uncorrected. At the same time literature, philosophy, and art flowered under classical inspiration, and the minds of men to whom study was open were refreshed and enlarged. These were the humanists, who attempted a reconciliation of classical and Christian teachings, among the foremost of whom was Erasmus of Rotterdam. To him is due a considerable part of the credit for bringing Renaissance thought to England. Printing enabled knowledge and argument to flow through the many religious societies which made up the structure of medieval Europe, and from about 1450 onwards printing presses formed the core of a vast ever-growing domain. There were already 60 universities in the Western world, from Lisbon to Prague, and in the early part of the new century these voluntarily opened up broader paths of study and intercourse which rendered their life more fertile and informal. In the Middle Ages education had largely been confined to training the clergy, now it was steadily extended, and its purpose became to turn out not only priests but lay scholars and well-informed gentlemen. The man of many parts and accomplishments became the Renaissance ideal. This quickening of the human spirit was accompanied by a questioning of long-held theories. For the first time in the course of the 15th century men began to refer to the preceding millennium as the Middle Ages. Though much that was medieval survived in their minds, men felt they were living on the brink of a new and modern age. It was an age marked not only by splendid achievements in art and architecture, but also by the beginnings of a revolution in science associated with the name of Copernicus. That the earth moved round the sun, as he conclusively proved and Galileo later asserted on a celebrated occasion, was a novel idea that was to have profound effects upon the human outlook. Hitherto the earth had been thought of as the center of a universe all designed to serve the needs of man. Now vast new perspectives were opening. The urge to inquire, to debate, 
and seek new explanations spread from the field of classical learning into that of religious studies. Greek and even Hebrew texts, as well as Latin, were scrutinized afresh. Inevitably this led to the questioning of accepted religious beliefs. The Renaissance bred the Reformation. In 1517, at the age of 34, Martin Luther, a German priest, denounced the sale of indulgences, nailed his theses on this and other matters on the door of Wittenberg Castle Church, and embarked on his venturesome intellectual foray with the Pope. What began as a protest against church practices soon became a challenge to church doctrine. In this struggle Luther displayed qualities of determination and conviction at the peril of the stake which won him his name and fame. He started or gave an impulse to a movement which within a decade swamped the continent, and proudly bears the general title of the Reformation. It took different forms in different countries, particularly in Switzerland under Zwingli and Calvin. The latter's influence spread from Geneva across France to the Netherlands and Britain, where it was most strongly felt in Scotland. There are many varieties of Luther's doctrine, but he himself adhered rigorously to the principle of salvation by faith, not works. This meant that to lead a good and upright life on earth, as many pagans had done, was no guarantee of eternal bliss. Belief in the Christian revelation was vital. The words of Holy Writ and the promptings of individual conscience, not papal authority, were Luther's guiding lights. He himself believed in predestination. Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden because Almighty God made him do so. Hence the original sin of man. About one tenth of the human race might escape or have escaped consequential eternal damnation in the intervening years. All monks and nuns alike were however entitled to console themselves by getting married. Luther himself set the example by marrying a fugitive nun when he was forty, and lived happily ever after. The Reformation affected every country in Europe, but none more than Germany. Luther's movement appealed to the nationalism of the German people who were restive under the exactions of Rome. He gave them a translation of the Bible of which they have remained rightly proud. He also gave the German princes the opportunity to help themselves to church property. His teachings in the hands of extremists led to a social war in southern Germany, in which scores of thousands of people perished. Luther himself was passionately on the opposite side to the masses he had inflamed. Though he had used in the coarsest terms the language which roused the mob he did not hesitate to turn on them when they responded. He would go to all lengths to fight the Pope on doctrinal issues, but the oppressed multitude who gave him his strength did not make effective appeal to him. He called them pigs, and grosser names, and rebuked the overlords, as he described the aristocracy and well-to-do governing powers, for their slackness in repressing the peasants' rebellion. Heresies there had always been, and over the centuries feeling against the church had often run strong in almost every country of Europe. But the schism that had begun with Luther was novel and formidable. All the actors in it, the enemies and the defenders of Rome alike, were still deeply influenced by medieval views. They thought of themselves as restorers of the purer ways of ancient times and of the early church. But the Reformation added to the confusion and uncertainty of an age in which men and states were tugging unwillingly and unwittingly at the anchors that had so long held Europe. After a period of ecclesiastical strife between the papacy and the Reformation, Protestantism was established over a great part of the continent under a variety of sects and schools, of which Lutheranism covered the larger area. The Church in Rome, strengthened by the heart-searching Catholic revival known as the Counter-Reformation and in the more worldly sphere by the activities of the Inquisition, proved able to maintain itself through a long series of religious wars. The division between the assailants and defenders of the old order threatened the stability of every state in modern Europe and wrecked the unity of some. England and France came out of the struggle scarred and shaken but in themselves united. A new barrier was created between Ireland and England, a new bond of unity forged between England and Scotland. The Holy Roman Empire of the German people dissolved into a dust of principalities and cities, the Netherlands split into what we now know as Holland and Belgium. Dynasties were threatened, 
old loyalties forsworn. By the middle of the century the Calvinists were the spearhead of the Protestant attack, the Jesuits the shield and sword of Catholic defense and counterattack. Not for another hundred years would exhaustion and resignation put an end to the revolution that began with Luther. It ended only after Central Europe had been wrecked by the Thirty Years' War, and the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 terminated a struggle whose starting point had been almost forgotten. It was not until the 19th century that a greater sense of toleration based upon mutual reverence and respect ruled the souls of men throughout the Christian world. A well known Victorian divine and lecturer, Charles Beard, in the 1880s poses some blunt questions. Was, then, the Reformation, from the intellectual point of view, a failure? Did it break one yoke only to impose another? We are obliged to confess that especially in Germany, it soon parted company with free learning, that it turned its back upon culture, that it lost itself in a maze of arid theological controversy, that it held out no hand of welcome to awakening science. Even at a later time it has been the divines who have most loudly declared their allegiance to the theology of the Reformation who have also looked most askance at science, and claimed for their statements an entire independence of modern knowledge. I do not know how, on any ordinary theory of the Reformation, it is possible to answer the accusations implied in these facts. The most learned, the profoundest, the most tolerant of modern theologians, would be the most reluctant to accept in their fullness the systems of Melanchthon and of Calvin. The fact is, that while the services which the reformers rendered to truth and liberty by their revolt against the unbroken supremacy of medieval Christianity cannot be overestimated, it was impossible for them to settle the questions which they raised. Not merely did the necessary knowledge fail them, but they did not even see the scope of the controversies in which they were engaged. It was their part to open the flood gates, and the stream, in spite of their well meant efforts to check and confine it has since rushed impetuously on, now destroying old landmarks, now fertilizing new fields, but always bringing with it life and refreshment. To look at the Reformation by itself, to judge it only by its theological and ecclesiastical development, is to pronounce it a failure, to consider it as part of a general movement of European thought, to show its essential connection with ripening scholarship and advancing science to prove its necessary alliance with liberty, to illustrate its slow growth into toleration, is at once to vindicate its past and to promise it the future. One while the forces of Renaissance and Reformation were gathering strength in Europe the world beyond was ceaselessly yielding its secrets to European explorers, traders, and missionaries. From the days of the ancient Greeks some men had known in theory that the world was round, now in the 16th century navigations were to prove it so. The story goes back a long way. In medieval times travelers from Europe had turned their steps to the east, their imagination fired with tales of fabulous kingdoms and wealth lying in regions which had seen the birth of man, stories of the realm of Prester John, variously placed between Central Asia and the modern Abyssinia, and the later, more practical account of the travels of Marco Polo from Venice to China. But Asia too was marching against the West. At one moment it had seemed as if all Europe would succumb to a terrible menace looming up from the East. Hidden Mongol hordes from the heart of Asia, formidable horsemen armed with bows, had rapidly swept over Russia, Poland, Hungary and in 1241 inflicted simultaneous crushing defeats upon the Germans near Breslau and upon European chivalry near Budapest. Germany and Austria at least lay at their mercy. Providentially in this year the great Khan died in Mongolia, the Mongol leaders hastened back the thousands of miles to Karakoram, their capital, to elect his successor, and Western Europe escaped. Throughout the Middle Ages there had been unceasing battle between Christian and infidel on the borders of Eastern and Southern Europe. The people of the frontiers lived in constant terror, the infidel steadily advanced, and in 1453 Constantinople had been captured by the Ottoman Turks. Dangers of the gravest kind now jarred and threatened the wealth and economy of Christian Europe. 
the destruction of the Byzantine Empire and the Turkish occupation of Asia Minor imperiled the land route to the east. The road which had nourished the towns and cities of the Mediterranean and founded the fortunes and the greatness of the Genoese and the Venetians was now barred. The turmoil spread eastwards, and though the Turks wanted to preserve their trade with Europe for the sake of the tolls they levied, commerce and travel became more and more unsafe. Italian geographers and navigators had for some time been trying to find a new sea route to the Orient which would be unhampered by the infidel, but although they had much experience of shipbuilding and navigation from the busy traffic of the East and Mediterranean they lacked the capital resources for the hazard of oceanic exploration. Portugal was the first to discover a new path. Helped by English crusaders, she had achieved her independence in the 12th century, gradually expelled the Moors from her mainland, and now reached out to the African coastline. Prince Henry the Navigator, grandson of John of Gaunt, had initiated a number of enterprises. Exploring began from Lisbon. All through the later 15th century Portuguese mariners had been pushing down the west coast of Africa, seeking for gold and slaves slowly extending the bounds of the known world, till, in 1487, Bartholomew Dias rounded the great promontory that marked the end of the African continent. He called it the Cape of Storms, but the King of Portugal with true insight renamed it the Cape of Good Hope. The hope was justified, in 1498 Vasco de Gama dropped anchor in the harbour of Calicut. The sea route was open to the wealth of India and the farther east. An event of greater moment for the future of the world was meanwhile taking shape in the mind of a Genoese named Christopher Columbus. Brooding over the dreamlike maps of his fellow countrymen, he conceived a plan for sailing due west into the Atlantic beyond the known islands in search of yet another route to the east. He married the daughter of a Portuguese sailor who had served with the navigator and from his father-in-law's papers he learnt of the great oceanic ventures. In 1486 he sent his brother Bartholomew to seek English backing for the enterprise. Bartholomew was captured by pirates off the French coast, and when he finally arrived in England and won the notice of Henry Tudor, the new king, it was too late. Christopher however had gathered the support of the joint Spanish sovereigns, Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile and under their patronage in 1492 he set sail into the unknown from Palos, in Andalusia. After a voyage of three months he made landfall in one of the islands of the Bahamas. Unwittingly he had discovered, not a new route to the east, but a new continent in the west, soon to be called America. It was nearly a hundred years before England began to exert her potential sea power. Her achievements during this period were by comparison meagre. The merchants of Bristol tried to seek a northwest passage beyond the Atlantic to the Far East, but they had little success or encouragement. Their colleagues in London and Eastern England were more concerned with the solid profits from trade with the Netherlands. Henry Tudor however appreciated private enterprise provided it did not involve him in disputes with Spain. He financed an expedition by John Cabot, who was a Genoese like Columbus and lived in Bristol. In 1497 Cabot struck land near Cape Breton Island. But there was little prospect of trade, and an immense forbidding continent seemed to block further advance. On a second voyage Cabot sailed down the coast of America in the direction of Florida, but this was too near the region of Spanish efforts. Upon Cabot's death the cautious Henry abandoned his Atlantic enterprise. The arrival of the Spaniards in the New World, and their discovery of precious metals, had led them into wordy conflict with the Portuguese. As one of the motives of both countries was the spreading of the Christian faith into undiscovered hinterlands, they appealed to the Pope, in whose hands the gift of new countries was at this time conceived to lie. By a series of bulls in the 1490s the Borgia Pope Alexander VI drew a line across the world dividing the Spanish and Portuguese spheres. This remarkable dispensation stimulated the conclusion of a treaty between Spain and Portugal. A north-south line 370 leagues west of the Azores was agreed upon and the Portuguese felt entitled to occupy Brazil. Although the Portuguese were first in the field of oceanic adventure their country was too small to sustain such efforts. 
It is said that half the population of Portugal died in trying to hold their overseas possessions. Spain soon overtook them. In the year of Columbus' first voyage, Granada, the only Moorish city which survived on Spanish soil, had fallen to the last great crusading army of the Middle Ages. Henceforward the Spaniards were free to turn their energies to the New World. In less than a generation a Portuguese captain, in Spanish pay, Magellan, set out on the voyage to South America and across the Pacific that was to take his ship round the globe. Magellan was killed in the Philippines, but his chief officer brought his ship home round the Cape of Good Hope. The scattered civilizations of the world were being drawn together, and the new discoveries were to give the little kingdom in the northern sea a fresh importance. Here was to be the successor of both Portugal and Spain, though the time for entering into the inheritance was not yet. But now the spices of the east were traveling by sea to the European market at Antwerp. The whole course of trade was shifted and revolutionized. The overland route languished, the primacy of the Italian cities was eclipsed by northwest Europe, and the future lay not in the Mediterranean, but on the shores of the Atlantic, where the new powers, England, France, and Holland, had ports and harbors which gave easy access to the oceans. The wealth of the New World soon affected the old order in Europe. In the first half of the 16th century, Cortes overcame the Aztec Empire of Mexico and Pizarro conquered the Incas of Peru. The vast mineral treasures of these lands now began to pour across the Atlantic. By channels which multiplied gold and silver flowed into Europe. So did new commodities, tobacco, potatoes, and American sugar. The old continent to which these new riches came was itself undergoing a transformation. After a long halt its population was again growing and production on the farms and in the workshops was expanding. There was a widespread demand for more money to pay for new expeditions, new buildings, new enterprises, and new methods of government. The manipulation of finance was little understood either by rulers or by the mass of the people, and the first recourse of impoverished princes was to debase their currency. Prices therefore rose sharply, and when Luther posted his theses at Wittenberg the value of money was already rapidly falling. Under the impulse of American silver the now swept across the continent a series of inflationary waves unparalleled until the 20th century. The old world of landlords and peasants found it harder to carry on, and throughout Europe a new force gathered influence and honor with the overlords and began to exert its power. For merchants, traders, and bankers it was an age of opportunity. Most famous among them perhaps was the Fugger family of Germany, who gained a graceful reputation by placing their immense wealth at the service of Renaissance art. On their financial resourcefulness both popes and emperors at one time depended. As ever in times of rapid inflation, there was much hardship and many difficulties in adjustment. But a strong sensation of new growth and well-being abounded, and ultimately every class benefited by the general amelioration. For a world which, a century before, had lost perhaps a third of its population by the Black Death there was a wonderful stimulus of mind and body. Men were groping their way into a larger age, with a freer interchange of more goods and services and with far greater numbers taking an effective part. The new world had opened its spacious doors, not only geographically by adding North and South America as places for Europe to live in, but by enlarging its whole way of life and outlook and the uses it could make of all it had. Dot chapter to the Tudor dynasty for a generation and more the English monarchy had been tossed on the rough waters of a disputed succession. On August 22, 1485, Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond, had won a decisive victory near the small midland town of Market Bosworth, and his rival, the usurper Richard III, was slain in the battle. In the person of Henry VII a new dynasty now mounted the throne, and during the twenty-four years of careful stewardship that lay before him a new era in English history began. Henry's first task was to induce magnates, church, and gentry to accept the decision of Bosworth and to establish himself upon the throne. He was careful to be crowned before facing the representatives of the nation, thus resting his title first upon conquest and only secondly on the approbation of Parliament. At any rate, 
Parliament was committed to the experiment of his rule. Then he married, as had long been planned, the heiress of the rival house, Elizabeth of York. Lack of money had long weakened the English throne, but military victory now restored to Henry most of the crown lands alienated during the 15th century by confiscation and attainder, and many other great estates besides. He already possessed a valuable nucleus in the inheritance of the Lancastrian kings whose heir he was. The North Country estates of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, were his by right of conquest, and later the treason and execution of Sir William Stanley, who had been discontented with his rewards after Bosworth, brought spacious properties in the Midlands into the royal hands. Henry was thus assured of a settled income. But this was not enough. It was essential to regulate the titles by which land was held in England. The rapid succession of rival monarchs had produced a feeling of insecurity and legal chaos among the landowners. Execution and death in battle had shattered the power of the great feudal houses. The survivors and the mass of smaller landed gentry were in constant danger of losing their estates by actions in the law courts started by personal enemies and based on past allegiances or treacheries. It was difficult to find a man whose family had not supported a losing side at some point or other during the civil wars. All this was extremely dangerous to Henry, for if the landowners were uncertain and insecure about the legal possession of their property they might follow another usurper if one should appear. Legislation was therefore passed stating that all who gave their allegiance to the king for the time being, that is, to the king upon the throne, should be secure in their lives and property. This idea of an actual king as distinct from a rightful king was characteristic of the new ruler. Sure of himself, he did not shrink from establishing his power upon a practical basis. Then there were the frontiers. Throughout the history of medieval England there runs a deep division between north and south. In the south a more fully advanced society dwelt in a rich countryside with well-developed towns and a prosperous wool trade with Flanders and Italy. The Wars of the Roses had been a serious threat to this organized life, and it was in the South that Henry found his chief support. In the words of a chronicler, he could not endure sea trade sick. He secured favorable terms for English merchants who traded with the Netherlands. Commerce was succored by peace. He put down disorder in the countryside, and representatives of the merchant classes cooperated with him in Parliament. Henry's careful attention to this body sprang from a real community of interests, the need for settled government. If this was despotism, it was despotism by consent. The North was very different. Great feudal houses like the Pasis dominated the scene. The land was mountainous and barren, the population lawless and turbulent. Communications were slow, and the king's authority was often ignored and sometimes flouted. The long tradition of border warfare with the Scots, the figures of the moss troopers, and ballads of cattle raids and the burning of villages still survived. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, had been popular in these parts. His spirit was in harmony with the surroundings. In a rough and ready fashion he had governed well, and the city of York remained faithful to his memory even after Bosworth. Henry had not only to preserve order and authority in these regions, but also to establish a secure frontier against the Scots. As the new owner of the Gloucester estates he had acquired a strategic base in the north. It was impossible to govern England from London in the 15th century. The machinery of administration was too primitive, and it was essential to delegate authority. Councils were accordingly established to administer the northern parts and the Welsh marches. Trusted servants were given wide powers of administration, and new officials who owed everything to their master and were trained in the law now began to play a decisive part in the work of government. They had always been active in the king's household and the courts of law. Now for the first time they had the ascendancy over the old nobles of the feudal age. Such were men like Henry Wyatt, the king's trusted agent in the north and captain of the key castle of Berwick. and Edmund Dudley in the south, and from them and there like the Sidneys, Herberts, Cecils, and Russells were descended. The threat of internal disorder marched with the menace from beyond the sea. 
Henry had to keep ceaseless watch for the invasion of pretenders supported by foreign aid. His position depended upon his own political skill and judgment, and not on any hereditary sanction. The court of Burgundy was a center of plots against him, the Duchess being the sister of Richard III, and twice she launched pretenders against the Tudor regime. The first was Lambert Simnel, who finished ingloriously as a scullion in the royal kitchens. The second and more formidable was Perkin Warbeck, the son of a boatman and collector of taxes at Tournai, put forward as the younger of the princes murdered in the tower. Backed by discontented Yorkist nobles in Ireland, by Burgundian money, Austrian and Flemish troops, and Scottish sympathy, Warbeck remained at large for seven years, plotting openly. Thrice he attempted to seize the English throne. But the classes who had backed the king since Bosworth stood by him. Warbeck's invasion of Kent was repulsed by the yokels before the military arrived, his attack from Scotland penetrated only four miles across the border, and a Cornish rising in 1497 which he joined melted away. He fled to Sanctuary, whence he was taken to London and kept in custody. Two years later, after two attempts at escape, he was executed, after confessing his guilt, on the scaffold at Tyburn. The affair ended in ignominy and ridicule, but the danger had been a real one. Henry had many reasons to feel his throne shake a little beneath him. The Wars of the Roses had weakened English authority in Wales, but it was in Ireland that their effects were most manifest. The dynastic struggle had been eagerly taken up in Ireland, there were Lancastrians and Yorkists among the great Anglo Irish families and there were Lancastrian and Yorkist cities in the English Pale around Dublin and among remote outposts of the Englishry like Limerick and Galway. But all this turmoil was a mere continuation of clan feuds. The Butler family, under its hereditary chief, the Earl of Ormond, was Lancastrian, because it had always been more loyal to the King of England than the rival house of Fitzgerald. The Fitzgeralds led by the Earl of Kildare in Ulster and the Earl of Desmond in Munster, both having close alliances of blood and marriage with the native chiefs, were Yorkist in sympathy, because they thus hoped to promote their own aggrandizement. In Munster the Desmond Fitzgeralds were already more Irish than the Irish. In the Pale, Kildare, who was called Garrett Moore, or Great Earl, might perform his feudal duties and lead the English but on his remoter lands on the Shannon a different rule prevailed. Lord's deputy from England found it profitless to assert their legal powers in face of Kildare's dominating local position and island-wide alliances. There was even a chance, unknown since the defeat and death of Edward Bruce, that his great house might provide a dynasty for all Ireland. But even if Kildare remained loyal to England would he adhere to a Yorkist king or a Lancastrian king? His kinsman Desmond supported Lambert Simnel, there was good reason to suspect that he himself supported Perkin Warbeck. Sir Edward Poynings, appointed Lord Deputy of Ireland in 1494, tried to limit his powers of mischief. He persuaded the Irish Parliament at Drogheda to pass the celebrated Poynings Law, subordinating the Irish Parliament to the English which was not repealed for 300 years and remained a grievance till the 20th century. Kildare was attainted and sent over to London, but Henry was too wise to apply simple feudal justice to so mighty an offender, with his fighting clan on the outskirts of Dublin, and cousins, marriage kin, and clients all over the island. The charges against the great earl were serious enough apart from his suspect favour to Perkin Warbeck, had he not burned down the cathedral of Cashel? The earl admitted it, but excused himself in a fashion that appealed to the king. I did, but I thought that the archbishop was inside. Henry VII accepted the inevitable with a dictum that is famous, if not authentic. Since all Ireland cannot govern the Earl of Kildare, let the Earl of Kildare govern all Ireland. Kildare was pardoned, freed, married to the king's cousin. Elizabeth sent John, and sent back to Ireland, where he succeeded Poynings as Lord Deputy. Power in Ireland still rested on the ability to call out and command a sufficiency of armed men. In this the English king exercised a potent and personal influence. 
he could clothe with the royal insignia and status of deputy any great noble who could muster and control the fighting men. On the other hand, by raising butlers and burks the king could make it impossible for even a Kildare to control the great clan chiefs. This precarious and shifting balance was for a while the only road to establishing a central government. No English king had yet found how to make his title of Lord of Ireland any more real than his title of King of France. But a powerful ally was at hand. Artillery, which had helped to expel the English from France, now aided their incursion into Ireland. The cannons spoke to Irish castles in a language readily understood. But the cannons came from England. The Irish could use but could not make them. Here for a time was the key to an English control over Irish affairs far beyond the outlook of Henry VII or Sir Edward Poynings. For generations the chiefs of the Fitzgeralds, from their half Gaelic court, had terrorized the Pale and kept to Irish eyes a more truly royal state than the harassed deputies of the English monarch in Dublin Castle. Now in the advance of culture precedence was regulated by gunpowder. Henry's dealings with Scotland are characteristic of his shrewd judgment. His first move was to shake the position of the Scottish king, James IV, by shipping armaments through Berwick to the baronial opponents of the crown and by continual intrigues with the opposing factions. Border aids, as often in the past, troubled the peaceful relations of the two kingdoms and an ugly situation arose when James lent his support to the pretender Perkin Warbeck. But Henry's ultimate aims were constructive. He signed a truce with James which was confirmed by treaty. Although not obviously a man of imagination, he had his dreams. He may even have looked to the time when the everlasting fight between Scots and English would end and the ceaseless danger of a Franco-Scottish alliance which had threatened medieval England so often should be forever broken. At any rate, Henry took the first steps to unite England and Scotland by marrying his daughter Margaret to James IV in 1502, and there was peace in the north until after his death. With France too his policy was eminently successful. He realized that more could be gained by the threat of war than by war itself. Henry summoned Parliament to consent to taxation for a war against France, and proceeded to gather together a small army which crossed to Calais in 1492 and besieged Boulogne. At the same time he entered into negotiations with the French king, who, unable to face Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, and England simultaneously, was compelled to buy him off. Henry gained both ways. Like Edward IV, he pocketed not only a considerable subsidy from France, which was punctually paid, but also the taxes collected in England for war. The most powerful new monarchy in Europe was Spain, recently forged into a strong state by the united efforts of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile and their successful warfare against the Moors. Their marriage marked the unification of the country. From 1489, when Henry's eldest son, Arthur, was betrothed to their daughter, the Infanta Catherine. England and Spain worked steadily together to secure booty from France, Spain in the form of territory, Henry as an annual tribute in cash, which amounted in the earlier years to about a fifth of the regular revenues of the crown. Henry VII as a statesman was imbued with the new, ruthless political ideas of Renaissance Europe. His youth, as an exile in foreign courts with a price upon his head, had taught him much. He had watched marriage negotiations, treaties, the hire of professional men at arms to fight the battles of Louis XI and Charles of Burgundy, the regulation of trade, the relations between the national monarchies of France and the territorial nobility, between church and state. Weighing and discussing the problems of the day, he sharpened his Welsh shrewdness with the refinements and exact analysis of practical politics which were then reaching a higher development among the Latin races. He strove to establish a strong monarchy in England, moulded out of native institutions. Like his contemporary, Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence, Henry worked almost always by adaptation, modifying old forms ever so slightly, rather than by crude innovation. Without any fundamental constitutional change administration was established again on a firm basis the king's council was strengthened. It was given parliamentary authority to examine persons with or without oath, and condemn them, 
on written evidence alone, in a manner foreign to the practice of the common law. The court of the Star Chamber met regularly at Westminster, with the two chief justices in attendance. It was originally a judicial committee of the King's Council, trying cases which needed special treatment because of the excessive might of one of the parties or the novelty or enormity of the offence. The complaints of the weak and oppressed against the rich and mighty, cases of retainer which involved keeping private armies of liveried servants, and of embracery, which meant corruption of juries, all these became their sphere. But the main function of the king's council was to govern rather than to judge. The choice of members lay with the monarch. Even when chosen they could not attend of right, they could be dismissed instantly, meanwhile they could stop any action in any court in England and transfer it to themselves, arrest anyone, torture anyone. A small inner committee conducted foreign affairs. Another managed the finances, hacking a new path through the cumbrous practices of the medieval exchequer, treasurers were now appointed who were answerable personally to the king, and at the centre was the king himself, the embodiment of direct personal government, often authorising or auditing expenditure, even the most trifling, with great sprawling initials which may still be seen at the record office in London. Henry VII was probably the best businessman to sit upon the English throne. He was also a remarkably shrewd picker of men. Few of his ministers came from the hereditary nobility, many were churchmen almost all were of obscure origin. Richard Fox, Bishop of Winchester, Chief Minister, and the most powerful man in England after the King, had been a schoolmaster at Hereford before he met Henry in Paris and they became companions in exile. Edmund Dudley was an under-sheriff of the City of London, who came under the King's notice in connection with the regulation of the Flanders wool trade. John Stile who invented the first diplomatic cipher and was appointed ambassador to Spain, began his career as a grocer or a mercer. Richard Mpson was the son of a sieve maker. Henry was at first not yet strong enough to afford mistakes. Daily, in all his leisure, he made notes on political affairs, on matters which required attention, especially touching persons, whom to employ, to reward, to imprison, to outlaw, exile or execute dot like the other princes of his age. His main interest, apart from an absorbing passion for administration, was foreign policy. He maintained the first permanent English envoys abroad. Diplomacy, he considered, was no bad substitute for the violence of his predecessors, and early, accurate, and regular information was essential to its conduct. A spy system was organized even in England and the excellence of Henry's foreign intelligence is described in a dispatch of the Milanese envoy to his master Duke Ludovic. The king has accurate information of European affairs, from his own representatives, from the subjects of other countries in his pay, and from merchants. If your highness should desire to send news to him it should be given neither in special detail or before others can convey it. And again, the change in affairs in Italy has altered him, not so much the dispute with the Venetian about Pisa, about which the king has letters every day, as the league which he understands has been made between the Pope and the King of France. Also, like other princes, Henry built and altered. His chapel at Westminster and his palace at Richmond are superb monuments of his architectural taste. Though personally frugal, he maintained a calculated pageantry. He wore magnificent clothes, superb jewels, rich and glittering collars, and moved in public under a canopy of state, waited upon by noblemen, with a court where about seven hundred persons dined daily in the tower at his expense, entertained by jesters, minstrels, huntsmen, and his famous leopards. How far Henry VII was a conscious innovator, turning his back on ancient ways, is in dispute among historians. Even during the last years of the Wars of the Roses the Yorkist sovereigns were preparing the foundations of a new, powerful, and centralized state. Under Henry VII these thwarted hopes became realities. His skill and wisdom in transmuting medieval institutions into the organs of modern rule has not been questioned. His achievement was massive and durable. He built his power amid the ruins and ashes of his predecessors.
he thriftily and carefully gathered what seemed in those days a vast reserve of liquid wealth. He trained a body of efficient servants. He magnified the crown without losing the cooperation of the commons. He identified prosperity with monarchy. Among the princes of Renaissance Europe he is not surpassed in achievement and fame by Louis XI of France or Ferdinand of Spain. It is often forgotten that almost all existing portraits of Henry VII are based upon a single death mask, accurate no doubt as to features, but tending to give him a hard and grave appearance, which does not tally with any contemporary description. Yet they seem to accord with what is known of his character and career. The picture in the National Portrait Gallery is however dated four years before his death, and here his quick, hard grey eyes look out from an arched setting. Delicate, well-kept hands rest lightly upon the bottom of the frame. His lips are set tight, with a faint smile breaking the corners. There is an air of disillusionment, of fatigue, of unceasing vigilance, and above all of sadness and responsibility. Such was the architect of the Tudor monarchy, which was to lead England out of medieval disorder into greater strength and broader times. Chapter 3 King Henry V. The age in which the young King Henry VIII grew up was, when seen from the perspective of later centuries, one in which an old order was dying. But it scarcely seemed so to those who lived in it. The change most visible to the eyes of a ruler was the creation of the modern European state system. This novelty, menacing and baffling, was no remote phenomenon. Across the Channel the new French monarchy had emerged much strengthened from the Hundred Years' War. Louis XI and his son, Charles VIII, were no longer mere heads of a loosely integrated group of feudal principalities. They ruled a united and populous France from the Channel to the Mediterranean. The most formidable of French feudatories, the King of England, had been finally expelled from the land where his predecessors had been great lords and claimants to an equality with the House of France. Only Calais remained to the heir of William the Conqueror and Henry Plantagenet. Meanwhile the cadet branch of the French royal line, the House of Burgundy, which had for nearly a century disputed the authority of the kings of France, had come to an end with the death of Charles the Bold in 1477. Louis XI contrived to lay hands on Burgundy itself. All the rest of the Burgundian inheritance passed through the marriage of Mary of Burgundy to the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian. Henceforth the Habsburgs controlled the duchies, counties, lordships, and cities that the Dukes of Burgundy had, with craft and fortune, acquired in the Netherlands and Belgium. Now Habsburg and Valois confronted one another on the northeastern frontiers of France. It was the opening of a long struggle. But although time was to show the instability of royal authority in France, the Valois kings ruled over a unity that could be called a French state. And the head of that state had come out of the long struggle with England doubly strengthened. He could now raise taxes from non-noble classes without any need to appeal to the estates, and he had a permanent army. With his revenues he could hire Swiss infantry, make and maintain his great artillery park, and take into his pay the ardent chivalry of France. One medieval state seemed to defy this process of aggregation and concentration. The Holy Roman Empire was visibly in dissolution. But for two generations past the Emperor had been the head of the House of Habsburg, and what arms could not do diplomacy and luck did. As Emperor, Maximilian was forever illustrating the difference between reach and grasp, but he had married the greatest heiress in Europe. The House of Austria thus began to act on the maxim of gaining its major victories by marriage. In the next generation the council was followed with even more brilliant results, for the Archduke Philip, heir of Maximilian and Mary, married an even greater heiress than his mother, the Infanta Joanna, heir to Castile, Aragon, Sicily, and Naples. It was her sister who had accelerated the rise of the House of Tudor by marrying Prince Arthur and after him King Henry VIII. In this world of growing power the King of England had to move and act with far fewer resources than his neighbours. His subjects numbered not many more than three millions. He had smaller revenues, no standing army, no state apparatus answerable only to the royal will. 
and yet by the mere proximity of France and the Imperial Netherlands England was forced to play a part in European politics. Her king was involved in wars and negotiations, shifts in alliances and changes in the balance of power, of which he had had little experience and could only in a secondary degree affect. Dot in this changing world, where battle on land was decided by the invincible Spanish infantry of Gonsalvo de Cordova, the great captain, or occasionally by the Swiss infantry and the terrible cavalry of Gaston de Foix or other generals of the French king. The old politics, the old tried recipes of war and victory that had stood English kings in good stead for so long, were of little avail. And so for a century the rulers of England had to move warily, threatened with disaster and conscious of dangerous weakness if any shift of continental politics should leave England alone in face of France or Spain. Until the death of his elder brother, Prince Arthur, Henry had been intended for the church. He had therefore been brought up by his father in an atmosphere of learning. Much time was devoted to serious studies, Latin, French, Italian, theology, music, and also to bodily exercise, to the sport of jousting, at which he excelled, to tennis, and hunting the stag. His manner was straightforward, and he impressed one of the cleverest women of the age, Margaret of Austria, regent of the Netherlands as a young man on whose word reliance could be placed. Owing to his father's careful savings he had at his accession more ready money than any other prince in Christendom. The ambassadors reported favorably on him. His majesty is the handsomest potentate I have ever set eyes on, above the usual height, with an extremely fine calf to his leg, his complexion fair and bright, with auburn hair combed straight and short in the French fashion and a round face so very beautiful that it would become a pretty woman, his throat rather long and thick. He speaks French, English, Latin, and a little Italian, plays well on the lute and harpsichord, sings from a book at sight, draws the bow with greater strength than any man in England, and jousts marvelously. He is fond of hunting, and never takes his diversion without tiring eight or ten horses which he causes to be stationed beforehand along the line of country he means to cover. He is extremely fond of tennis, at which game it is the prettiest thing in the world to see him play, his fair skin glowing through a shirt of the finest texture. One Henry in his maturity was a tall, red-headed man who preserved the vigor and energy of ancestors accustomed for centuries to the warfare of the Welsh marches. His massive frame towered above the throng, and those about him felt in it a sense of concealed desperation, of latent force and passion. A French ambassador confessed, after residing for months at court, that he could never approach the king without fear of personal violence. Although Henry appeared to strangers open, jovial, and trustworthy, with a bluff good humor which appealed at once to the crowd, even those who knew him most intimately seldom penetrated the inward secrecy and reserve which allowed him to confide freely in no one. To those who saw him often he seemed almost like two men, one the merry monarch of the hunt and banquet and procession, the friend of children, the patron of every kind of sport, the other the cold, acute observer of the audience chamber or the council, watching vigilantly, weighing arguments refusing except under the stress of great events to speak his own mind. On his long hunting expeditions, when the courier arrived with papers, he swiftly left his companions at the chase and summoned the councillor's attendant for what he was wont to call London business. Bursts of restless energy and ferocity were combined with extraordinary patience and diligence. Deeply religious, Henry regularly listened to sermons lasting between one and two hours and wrote more than one theological treatise of a high standard. He was accustomed to hear five masses on church days, and three on other days, served the priest at mass himself, was never deprived of holy bread and holy water on Sunday, and always did penance on Good Friday. His zeal in theological controversy earned him from the Pope the title of Defender of the Faith. An indefatigable worker, he digested a mass of dispatches, memoranda, and plans each day without the help of his secretary. He wrote verses and composed music. Profoundly secretive in public business, 
he chose as his advisers men for the most part of the meanest origin, Thomas Wolsey, the son of a poor and rascally butcher of Ipswich, whose name appears on the borough records for selling meat unfit for human consumption, Thomas Cromwell, a small attorney, Thomas Cranmer, an obscure lecturer in divinity. Like his father he distrusted the hereditary nobility, preferring the discreet counsel of men without a wide circle of friends. Early in his reign he declared, I will not allow anyone to have it in his power to govern me. As time passed his willfulness hardened and his temper worsened. His rages were terrible to behold. There was no noble head in the country, he once said, but he would make it fly, if his will were crossed. Many heads were indeed to fly in his thirty-eight years on the throne. This enormous man was the nightmare of his advisers. Once a scheme was fixed in his mind he could seldom be turned from it, resistance only made him more stubborn, and, once embarked, he always tended to go too far unless restrained. Although he prided himself on his tolerance of any expression of opinion by his advisers, however outspoken, it was usually unwise to continue to oppose him after he had made up his mind. His Highness, as Sir Thomas More put it to Wolsey, esteemeth nothing in counsel more perilous than one to persevere in the maintenance of his advice because he hath once given it. The only secret of managing him, both Wolsey and Cromwell disclosed after they had fallen, was to see that dangerous ideas were not permitted to reach him. But arrangements of this sort could not be complete. His habit was to talk to all classes, barbers, huntsmen, his yeomen cooked to the king's mouth and particularly anyone, however humble, connected with the sea, to ferret out opinions, and ride off on hunting expeditions which sometimes lasted for weeks. He showed himself everywhere. Each summer he went on progress through the country, keeping close to the mass of his subjects, whom he understood so well. Almost his first act, six weeks after the death of his father in 1509, was to marry his brother Arthur's widow, Princess Catherine of Aragon. He was aged 18 and she was five years and five months older. She had made great efforts to fascinate him and succeeded so well that while Ferdinand and Henry VII had made plans for the match long beforehand, and had obtained from the Pope a dispensation for a marriage within the degrees of affinity prohibited by the Church, there can be no doubt that Henry was eager to complete the proceedings. Catherine was at Henry's side during the first twenty-two years of his reign, while England was becoming a force in European affairs, perilous for foreign rulers to ignore. Until she reached the age of thirty-eight she remained, apart from three or four short lapses, the mistress of his affections, restrained his follies, and in her narrow way helped to guide public affairs between the intervals of her numerous confinements. Henry settled down to married life very quickly, in spite of a series of misfortunes which would have daunted a less robust character. The Queen's first baby was born dead, just after Henry's nineteenth birthday, another died soon after birth a year later. In all there were to be five such disappointments. The king continued the standing alliance with his father-in-law, Ferdinand of Aragon, which had brought honor and wealth to England. He supported the Pope, and was sent the Golden Rose, the highest distinction which could be conferred on any Christian prince. He deliberated with his father's grave counsellors, William Warham, Lord Chancellor and Archbishop of Canterbury, Richard Fox, Bishop of Winchester, Thomas Rutal, Bishop of Durham and Royal Secretary, and under their guidance pursued for a short time the policy which his father had always favoured, isolation, provided that France continued to pay tribute. But Henry was on the edge of the vortex of Europe's new politics. Should he plunge in? The richest cities of Europe had changed hands many times during the last few years, paying tribute on each occasion. Frontiers were altering almost from month to month. Ferdinand of Aragon, Catherine's father, had conquered the Kingdom of Naples, and the two French border provinces of Serdani and Ravsilan. Other princes had done nearly as well. Amid the alluring vistas of conquest which opened up before Henry his father's aged counsellors remained obstinately men of peace. Henry VII had only once sent English levies abroad, 
preferring to hire mercenaries who fought alongside foreign armies. Henry VIII now determined that this policy should be reversed. For some time he had been watching Dean Wolsey of Lincoln, a discovery of the Marquis of Dorset, whose sons had been to Magdalen College School at Oxford when Wolsey was the master there. Dorset had liked Wolsey well enough to invite him to stay for the Christmas holidays and had provided him with several livings. The young priest then obtained a post as chaplain to the governor of Calais. Besides academic learning Wolsey possessed a remarkable aptitude for negotiation and finance, he had been bursar of Magdalene College, and Henry VII, sensing his abilities, had taken him over from the governor and employed him on minor official business abroad. He was promoted by Henry VIII to the council board in November 1509, with the office of armoner to the royal household. He was then aged 36. Two years later, Wolsey's growing influence may be perceived in the decision to join the Holy League against France, for it was in the same week that Wolsey signed his first documents as an executive member of the council. He was put in charge of preparations for the war, and his former pupil, the young Marquis of Dorset, was commander in chief. France was preoccupied with Italian adventures, and Henry planned to reconquer Bordeaux lost sixty years before, while King Ferdinand invaded Navarre, an independent kingdom lying athwart the Pyrenees, and the Pope and the Republic of Venice operated against the French armies in Italy. The year was 1512, and this was the first time since the Hundred Years' War that an English army had campaigned in Europe. The English expedition to Gascony failed. Ferdinand took the whole of Navarre, and, according to Dr. William Knight, the senior English ambassador in Spain, showed great zeal, passing his cannon across the Pyrenees and inviting the English to join him in operations against France. But the English found that the style of warfare they had learned in the Wars of the Roses, with long bows and ponderously armed mounted men, had become obsolete on the continent. Both Ferdinand and the French employed professional infantry, Swiss and Austrian, who advanced at a great pace in solid squares with 18-foot peaks bristling in every direction. The primitive firearms of the day, known as arquebuses, were too heavy and slow firing to inflict serious damage on these fast-moving squares. Ferdinand sent a great deal of military advice to Henry, and suggested that he should use his gathered wealth to procure an overwhelming professional force of his own. But, before Henry could adopt this plan, Dorset's army, as unaccustomed to Gascon wine as to French tactics, and ravaged by dysentery, disintegrated. The troops refused to obey their officers and boarded the transports for home. Dorset abandoned a fruitless campaign and followed them. After negotiations lasting throughout the winter of 1512-13 Ferdinand and the Venetians deserted Henry and the Pope and made peace with France. The Holy League they concluded, although high-sounding in name, had proved futile as a political combination. In England the responsibility for these failures was cast on the new advisor, Wolsey. In fact it was in the hard work of administration necessitated by the war that he had first shown his abilities and immense energy. The lay members of the council however had from the beginning opposed a war policy managed by a priest and had intrigued to get rid of him. But Henry VIII and the Pope never wavered. Pope Julius II, who had been besieged by a French force in Rome, had excommunicated the entire French army, and now grew a beard, an adornment then out of fashion, and swore he would not shave until he was revenged on the King of France. Henry, not to be outdone, also grew a beard. It was auburn, like his hair. He arranged to hire the Emperor Maximilian, with the Imperial artillery and the greater part of the Austrian army, to serve under the royal standard of England. The Emperor, we are told, was requested to spread his standard, but refused to do so, saying he would be the servant, for the campaign, of the King and Saint George. These arrangements, though costly, were brilliantly successful. Under Henry's command, the English, with Austrian mercenaries, routed the French in August 1513 at the Battle of the Spurs, so called because of the rapidity of the French retreat. Bayard, 
the most famous knight in Europe, was captured, together with a host of French notables. Tournai, the richest city of all northeast France, surrendered at the mere sight of the imperial artillery, and was occupied by an English garrison. To crown all, Queen Catherine, who had been left behind as regent of England, sent great news from the north. To aid their French ally the Scots in the king's absence had crossed the Tweed in September and invaded England with an army of 50,000 men. Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey, son of Richard III's Duke of Norfolk, slain at Bosworth, and still under the family attainder, was nonetheless entrusted with the command. This skillful veteran, the only experienced general left in England after Dorset's failure, knowing every inch of the ground, did not hesitate to march round the Scottish army, and, although outnumbered by two to one, placed himself between the enemy and Edinburgh. At Flodden Field a bloody battle was fought on September 9, 1513. Both armies faced their homeland. The whole of Scotland, Highland and Lowland alike, drew out with their retainers in the traditional silterons, or circles of spearmen, and around the standard of their king. The English archers once again directed upon these redoubtable masses a long, intense, and murderous arrow storm. Moreover, the bills or axes in the hands of English infantry were highly effective against the Scottish spears in hand-to-hand -hand assault, while the English cavalry awaited the chance of piercing the gaps caused by slaughter. When night fell the flower of the Scottish chivalry lay in their ranks where they had fought, and among them King James IV. This was the last great victory gained by the Longbow. Surrey was rewarded by the restoration of the Norfolk dukedom. In Scotland a year old child succeeded to the throne as James v. His mother, the regent, was Henry's sister Margaret, and peace now descended on the northern border for the greater part of the reign. Fitting celebrations were arranged in Brussels by the emperor's daughter, Margaret of Austria. Henry, now twenty-two, was permitted to spend whole nights dancing in his shirt with the leading beauties of the imperial court. In this, the Milanese ambassador reported, he performs wonders, leaping like a stag. The council had forbidden gaming and the presence of women in the English lines, but for him, the ambassador added, the Austrians provide everything. His rewards were princely, he never sat down to the table without losing in a royal manner, and the chief personalities were gratified with rich presents. Chapter 4 Cardinal Wolsey During the autumn of 1513, the French were hard pressed from all sides. Wolsey, through the Emperor, hired a Swiss army, which invaded Burgundy by way of Besancon, the fortress capital of French Comte, a part of the Burgundian inheritance that had passed into Habsburg hands. Dijon was captured. The French had no troops of their own which could resist the Swiss, and doubled their tail to hire fresh mercenaries from abroad. Henry had every intention of renewing his campaign in France in 1514, but his successors had not been to their liking of Ferdinand of Spain. Ferdinand now set about making a separate peace with France, into which he also tried to draw the Emperor Maximilian. Faced with the defection of his allies, Henry was quick to launch a counterstroke. First he looked to the defences of the realm, and took measures to strengthen his navy. Then he sought and obtained a favourable peace treaty with France, thereby securing exactly double the amount of annual tribute that had been paid to his father. The crowning event of the peace was the marriage between Henry's young sister, Mary, and Louis XII himself. She was seventeen, he was fifty-two. The story runs that she extracted from her brother the promise that if she married this time for diplomacy she would be free next time to marry for love. Promise or no promise, that is what she did. She was Queen of France for three months, then, as Queen Dowager, and to Henry's displeasure, she cut short her widowhood by marrying Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. But in this case the royal wrath subsided and Henry VIII joined in the wedding festivities. The marriage ultimately bore tragic fruit, a grandchild was the Lady Jane Grey, who was for ten days to be Queen of England. Among those who had crossed with the bridal retinue to France was a young girl named Mary Boleyn. She was one of three nieces of the Duke of Norfolk, 
all of whom successively engaged the dangerous and deadly love of Henry VIII. Mary and her sister Anne had been educated in France at an expensive academy attached to the French court. On her return to England Mary married William Carey, a gentleman of the bedchamber, and before long became the king's mistress. Her father was upon this favour created Lord Rochford, while her sister, Anne, continued her studies in France. Wolsey was richly rewarded for the foreign successes. He received the bishopric of Lincoln during the course of the negotiations, then, after the peace terms were settled, the archbishopric of York, and, a year later, after long negotiation by the king on his behalf, in September 1515, a cardinal's hat. This shower of ecclesiastical honours did not however give Wolsey sufficient civil authority, and in December 1515 Henry created him a Lord Chancellor in place of Warham whom he forced to resign the great seal. For fourteen years Wolsey in the king's name was the effective ruler of the realm. He owed his position not only to his great capacity for business, but to his considerable personal charm. He had an angel's wit, one of his contemporaries wrote, for beguiling and flattering those whom he wished to persuade. In the king's company he was brilliant, convivial, and a gay seeker out of new pastimes. All this commended him to his young master. Other would be counsellors of Henry's saw a different side of the cardinal's character. They resented being scornfully overborne by him in debate, they detested his arrogance, and envied his ever growing wealth and extensive patronage. At the height of his influence, Wolsey enjoyed an income equivalent to about £500,000 a year in early 20th century money. He kept 1,000 servants and his palaces surpassed the king's in splendor. He loaded profitable favors upon his relations, including his illegitimate son, who held eleven church appointments, and their incomes, while still a boy. These counts against him gradually added up in the course of years. But for the time being, and it was for a long time, as chief ministers go, he successfully held in his grasp an accumulation of power that has probably never been equaled in England. The king's popularity rose with the achievements of his reign. There were many, of course, who grumbled at the war taxes imposed during the previous two years, but while pouring money into pageantry and magnificence, Wolsey managed to tap new sources of revenue. Henry's subjects were taxed much as they had been under his father which was more likely than any other subjects in Europe. Indeed, the north of England, which had to support billeting and border warfare, was excused taxation altogether. Successes abroad enabled Wolsey to develop Henry VII's principles of centralized government. During the twelve years that he was Lord Chancellor Parliament met only once, for two sessions spreading over three months in all. The Court of Star Chamber grew more active. It developed new and simple methods copied from Roman law, by which the common law rules of evidence were dispensed with, and persons who could give evidence were simply brought in for interrogation, one by one, often without even the formality of an oath. Justice was swift, fines were heavy, and no one in England was so powerful that he could afford to flout the Star Chamber. When a common soldier of the Calais garrison once sent his wife to complain of his treatment by the Lord Deputy of Calais she received a full hearing. The new generation grown up after the Wars of the Roses was accustomed to royal law and order, and determined that it should prevail. Thus it was that this system of arbitrary government, however despotic in theory, however contrary to the principles believed to lie behind Magna Carta, in fact rested tacitly on the real will of the people. Henry VIII, like his father, found an institution ready to his hand in the unpaid justice of the peace, the local squire or landlord, and taught him to govern. Rules and regulations of remarkable complexity were given to the justice to administer, and later in the century justice's manuals were produced which ran through innumerable editions and covered almost every contingency which could arise in country life. The Tudors were indeed the architects of an English system of local government which lasted almost unchanged until Victorian times. Unpaid local men, fearless and impartial, because they could rely on help from the king, dealt with small matters, sitting in the villages often in twos and threes. 
Bigger matters such as roads and bridges and sheep stealing came before quarter sessions in the appropriate town. It was a rough justice that the country gentlemen meted out, and friendship and faction often cut across the interests of both the nation and the crown. If in the main they carried the directions of the crown to the people, the justices could also on occasion, by turning a deaf ear to official advice, express popular resistance to the royal will. What they did in the counties they could also sometimes do in the House of Commons. Even as Tudor rule advanced towards its climax the faithful members of Parliament were not afraid to speak their minds. Wolsey saw the dangers of the situation and preferred to work out his policy without the unappreciative Council of Parliament. Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell learned to handle the Commons with discretion, though even then resistance was not unknown. But in spite of occasional friction, and even riot and rebellion in the countryside, it was on the whole a working partnership. Crown and community alike recognized what the partnership had achieved and what it had to offer. Within a few years of his accession, Henry embarked upon a program of naval expansion, while Wolsey concerned himself with diplomatic maneuver. Henry had already constructed the largest warship of the age, the Great Harry, of 1,500 tons with seven tiers one above the other, and an incredible array of guns. The fleet was built up under the personal care of the sovereign, who ordered the admiral to send word to him in minute detail how every ship did sail, and was not content until England commanded the narrow seas. Wolsey's arrangements for the foreign service were hardly less remarkable. A system of couriers and correspondents was organized over Western Europe, through whom news was received in England as quickly as during the wars of Marlborough or Wellington. The diplomatic service which Henry VII had organized with such care was used as a nucleus, supplemented by the ablest products of the new learning at Oxford, including Richard Pace, John Clarke, and Richard Sampson, the last two destined to become bishops later in the reign. The dispatches of this period, at the height of the Renaissance, are as closely knit and coloured as any in history, each event, the size of armies, rebellions in Italian cities, movements within the College of Cardinals, taxes in France, is carefully weighed and recorded. For some years at least Wolsey was a powerful factor in balancing weight in Europe. The zenith of this brilliant period was reached at the Field of the Cloth of Gold in June 1520, when Henry crossed the Channel to meet his rival, Francis I of France, for the first time. Henry's main perplexity was, we are told, about his appearance. He could not decide how he would look best, in his beard as usual or clean shaven. At first he yielded to Catherine's persuasion and shaved. But directly he had done so he regretted the step and grew the beard again. It reached its full luxuriance in time to create a great impression in France. At the field of the cloth of gold, near Gisnes, the jousting and feasting, the colour and glitter, the tents and trappings, dazzled all Europe. It was the last display of medieval chivalry. Many noblemen, it was said, carried on their shoulders their mills, their forests, and their meadows. But Henry and Francis failed to become personal friends. Henry, indeed, was already negotiating with France's enemy, the new Emperor Charles V, who had lately succeeded his grandfather, Maximilian. At Gisnes he attempted to outdo Francis both by the splendor of his equipment and the cunning of his diplomacy. Relying on his great physical strength, he suddenly challenged Francis to a wrestling match. Francis seized him in a lightning grip and put him on the ground. Henry went white with passion but was held back. Although the ceremonies continued Henry could not forgive such a personal humiliation. He was, in any case, still seeking friends elsewhere. Within a month he had concluded an alliance with the Emperor, thus forfeiting the French tribute. When the Emperor declared war on Francis English wealth was squandered feverishly on an expedition to Boulogne and subsidies to mercenary contingents serving with the Emperor. Wolsey had to find the money. When Kent and the eastern counties rose against a species of capital levy imposed by Wolsey in the second year of war, and absurdly misnamed the amicable grant, the king pretended he did not know of the taxation. The government had to beat retreat, and the campaign was abandoned. 
Wolsey now got the king's consent to make secret overtures for peace to Francis. These overtures were Wolsey's fatal miscalculation. Only six weeks later, the Imperial armies won an overwhelming victory over the French at Pavia, in northern Italy. After the battle, the entire peninsula passed into the hands of the Emperor. Italy was destined to remain largely under Habsburg domination until the invasions of Napoleon. But although Francis himself was taken prisoner and crushing terms of peace were imposed on France, England did not share in the spoils of victory. Henry could no longer turn the scales in Europe. The blame was clearly Wolsey's, and the king decided that perhaps the cardinal had been given too free a hand. He insisted on visiting the great new college which Wolsey was building at Oxford, Cardinal College, destined to become Christ Church the largest and most richly endowed in the university. When he arrived he was astonished at the vast sums which were being lavished upon the masonry. It is strange, he remarked to the cardinal, that you have found so much money to spend upon your college and yet could not find enough to finish my war. Up till now he had been inseparable from Wolsey. In 1521 he had sent to the scaffold the Duke of Buckingham, son of Richard III S. Buckingham and close in line of succession to the throne. His crime had been leading the opposition of the displaced nobility to the king's chosen chancellor. But after Pavia Henry began to have second thoughts. Perhaps, he decided, Wolsey would have to be sacrificed to preserve the popularity of the monarch. Then there was Queen Catherine. In 1525 she was aged 40. At the field of the cloth of gold, five years before. King Francis had mocked at her behind the scenes with his courtiers, saying she was already old and deformed. A typical Spanish princess, she had matured and aged rapidly, it was clear that she would bear Henry no male heir. Either the king's illegitimate son, the Duke of Richmond, now aged six, would have to be appointed by act of parliament, or perhaps England might accept Catherine's child, Mary, now aged nine as the first Queen of England in her own right since Matilda. It was still doubtful if a woman could succeed to the throne by English law. Would England tolerate being ruled by a woman? Might Mary not turn out very like her Spanish mother, narrow and bigoted, a possible queen perhaps in Spain, or France, or Austria, countries full of soldiers, but not acceptable to the free English, who had obeyed Henry VII and Henry VIII because they wished to obey and although there was no central army except the beefeaters in the tower, would Mary be able to rule in the Tudor manner, by favour and not by force? The long clash of the Wars of the Roses had been a nightmare to the nation which a disputed succession might revive. To the monarch these great questions of state were also questions of conscience, in which his sensual passions and his care for the stability of the realm were all fused together. They perplexed Henry for two more years. The first step, clearly, was to get rid of Catherine. In May 1527 Cardinal Wolsey, acting as papal legate and with the collusion of the king, held a secret ecclesiastical court at his house in Westminster. He summoned Henry to appear before him, charged with having married his deceased brother's wife within the degrees of affinity prohibited by the laws of the church. Henry's authority had been a bull of dispensation obtained by Ferdinand and Henry VII in 1503, which said in effect that since the marriage between Catherine and Arthur had not been consummated Catherine was not legally Henry's deceased brother's wife and Henry could marry Catherine. Although Catherine, on the advice of successive Spanish ambassadors, maintained to her dying day that her marriage with Arthur had not been consummated, nobody was convinced. She had lived under the same roof with Prince Arthur for seven months. After hearing legal argument for three days, the court decided that the point should be submitted to a number of the most learned bishops in England. Several bishops replied, however, that provided papal dispensation had been secured, such a marriage was perfectly lawful. Henry then tried to persuade Catherine herself that he and she had never been legally married, that they had lived in mortal sin for eighteen years. He added that as he intended to abstain from her company in future he hoped she would retire far from court. 
Catherine burst into tears and firmly refused to go away. About a fortnight later, Wolsey crossed the Channel to conduct prolonged negotiations for a treaty of alliance with France. While Wolsey was away, Henry became openly infatuated with Anne Boleyn. Since she had returned from school in France, Anne had grown into a vivacious, witty woman of twenty-four, very slender and frail, with beautiful black eyes and thick black hair so long that she could sit on it which she wore flowing loose over her shoulders. Mistress Anne, wrote the Venetian ambassador, is not the handsomest woman in the world. She is of middle height, dark-skinned, long neck, wide mouth, rather flat-chested. She had a fiery temper, was outspoken and domineering, and although not generally liked soon gained a small following, many of them noted for their leanings towards the new religious doctrines of Luther. We first hear of Anne Boleyn at court in a dispatch of the imperial ambassador dated August 16, 1527, four months after Henry had begun proceedings for the annulment of his marriage. Did he plan the divorce and then find Anne? Or had he arranged to marry Anne from the beginning? We shall never know, for Henry was very secretive in his private matters. Three may keep counsel, he observed a year or two later, if two be away and if I thought my cap knew my counsel I would cast it into the fire and burn it. His love letters were secured by papal agents, and are now in the Vatican Library, but, while prettily phrased, they are undated, and disclose little except that Anne Boleyn kept him waiting for nearly a year. Henry had been carefully guarded by Wolsey and Catherine. He had had mistresses before, but never openly. The appearance at court of a lady with whom he spent hours at a time created an extraordinary stir. Together Anne and Henry arranged to send a special royal ambassador to Pope Clement VII, independently of the resident ambassador chosen by Wolsey, to seek not only an annulment of the king's marriage, but also a dispensation to marry again at once. Dr. William Knight, now over seventy, was brought forth from retirement to undertake this delicate mission. Two entirely different sets of instructions were prepared for Knight. One made no mention of the proposed new marriage and was to be shown to Wolsey as he passed through Compton on his way to Rome, the other was the one on which Knight was to act. Wolsey was shown the Dami instructions as arranged, and at once saw that they had been drafted by ignorant laymen. He hurried home to have the instructions altered, and thus learned all. But although he now took over the management of the negotiations every expedient proved fruitless. The papal legate, Cardinal Campeggio, who was sent to England to hear the case used all possible pretexts to postpone a decision. Now that Italy had fallen to the Habsburgs the Pope was at the mercy of the imperial soldiery. In 1527 they shocked Europe by seizing and sacking Rome. The Pope was now practically a prisoner of Charles V who was determined that Henry should not divorce his aunt. This broke Wolsey. New counsellors were called in. A follower of the Duke of Norfolk, Dr. Stephen Gardner, was appointed secretary to the king. Soon after this appointment Dr. Cranmer, a young lecturer in divinity at Cambridge and a friend of the Boleyns, made a helpful new suggestion to Gardner, that the question whether the king had ever been legally married should be withdrawn from the lawyers and submitted to the universities of Europe. The king at once took up the idea. Cranmer was sent for and complimented. Letters and messengers were dispatched to all the universities in Europe. At the same time the king had the writs sent out for a parliament, the first for six years, to strengthen his hand in the great changes he was planning. Norfolk and Gardner, not Wolsey, completed the arrangements. Wolsey retired in disgrace to his diocese of York, which he had never visited. On one occasion he came to Grafton to see the king. But when he entered he found that Anne was there, Norfolk insulted him to his face, and he was dismissed without an audience. On October 9, 1529, Wolsey's disgrace was carried a step farther by an indictment in the king's bench under one of the statutes of Premunia passed in the reign of Richard II. These acts of Parliament were designed to uphold the jurisdiction of the royal courts against the church courts, and had been one of Wolsey's favourite instruments for exacting money for the king for technical offences. 
they provided that anyone who obtained in the court of Rome or elsewhere any transfers of cases to Rome, processes, sentences of excommunication, bulls, instruments, or any other things whatsoever which touch, the king, against him, his crown and regalty, or his realm, should lose the royal protection and forfeit all his goods to the king, while the proceedings were going forward in king's bench. Norfolk and Suffolk came to Wolsey to take away the great seal as a mark that he was no longer Lord Chancellor. But Wolsey protested, saying that he had been made Chancellor for life. Next day they came again, bearing letters signed by the King. When they had gone with the seal the great Cardinal broke down, and was found seated, weeping and lamenting his misfortunes. Anne was determined however to ruin him. She had set her heart on York Place the London residence of the Archbishops of York, which was, she decided, of a convenient size for her and Henry, large enough for their friends and entertainments, yet too small to permit Queen Catherine to live there also. Anne and her mother took the king to inspect the cardinal's goods in York Place, and Henry was incensed by the wealth which he found. The judges and learned counsel were summoned and the king asked how he could legally obtain possession of York Place which had been regarded as belonging to the Archbishops of York in perpetuity. The judges advised that Wolsey should make a declaration handing over York Place to the King and his successors. A judge of the King's bench was accordingly sent to Wolsey. A member of his household, George Cavendish, has left an account of the Cardinal's last days. According to him Wolsey said, I know that the King of his own nature is of a royal stomach. How say you? Master Shelley. May I do it with justice and conscience, to give that thing away from me and my successors which is none of mine? The judge explained how the legal profession viewed the case. Then said the cardinal, I will in no wise disobey, but most gladly fulfill and accomplish his princely will and pleasure in all things, and in especial in this matter, inasmuch as ye, the fathers of the law, say that I may lawfully do it. How be it I pray you show his majesty from me, that I most humbly desire his highness to call to his most gracious remembrance that there is both heaven and hell. Henry cared nothing for the fulminations of a cardinal. Threats merely made him take more sweeping measures. The charge under Premier was supplemented by a charge of traitorous correspondence with the King of France, conducted without the King's knowledge. Five days after Wolsey had been found guilty under Premunia the Earl of Northumberland came to the castle of the Archbishop of York at Corwood, near York, and, trembling, said in a very faint and soft voice, My lord, I arrest you of high treason. Where is your commission? Quoth the cardinal. Let me see it. Nay, sir, that you may not, replied the earl. Well, then, said the cardinal, I will not obey your arrest. Even as they were debating this matter there came in counsel in Walsh, and then said the cardinal, Well, there is no more to do. I trow, gentlemen, ye be one of the king's privy chamber, your name, I suppose, is Walsh, I am content to yield unto you, but not to my lord of Northumberland without I see his commission. And also you are a sufficient commissioner yourself in that behalf inasmuch as ye be one of the king's privy chamber, for the worst person there is a sufficient warrant to arrest the greatest peer of this realm by the king's only commandment, without any commission. As Wolsey journeyed back to London, where the cell in the tower used by the Duke of Buckingham before his execution was again being placed in readiness, he fell ill, and when he neared Leicester Abbey for the night he told the monks who came out to greet him, I am come to leave my bones among you. About eight in the morning two days later he sank into a last decline, murmuring to those gathered at the bedside, if I had served God as diligently as I have done the king he would not have given me over in my grey hairs. Soon afterwards he died, and they found next to his body a shirt of hair, beneath his other shirt, which was of very fine linen holland cloth. This shirt of hair was unknown to all his servants except his chaplain. Wolsey's high offices of state were conferred on a new administration. Gardner secured the bishopric of Winchester, the richest see in England, Norfolk became president of the council, and Suffolk the vice president. 
during the few days that elapsed until Wolsey was replaced by Sir Thomas More as Lord Chancellor the King applied the Great Seal himself to documents of state. With the death of the Cardinal political interests hitherto submerged made their bid for power. The ambition of the country gentry to take part in public affairs in London, the longing of an educated, wealthy Renaissance England to cast off the tutelage of priests, the naked greed and thirst for power of rival factions, began to shake and agitate the nation. Henry was now 38 years old. Chapter 5 Break with Rome Cranmer's idea of an appeal to the universities about Henry's marriage to Catherine had proved a great success, and the young lecturer was rewarded with an appointment as ambassador to the emperor. Even the University of Bologna in the Papal States declared that the king was right and that the Pope could not set aside so fundamental a law. Many others concurred, Paris, Toulouse, Orleans, Padua, Ferrara, Pavia, Oxford, and Cambridge. The king had known all along that he was right, and here, it seemed, was final proof. He determined to mark his displeasure with the Pope by some striking measure against the power of the Church of England. Why, he asked, was the right of sanctuary allowed to obstruct the king's justice? Why were parsons permitted to live far away from their parishes and hold more than one living while underpaid substitutes did the work for the absentees? Why did Italians enjoy the revenues of English bishoprics? Why were the clergy demanding fees for probit on wills and gifts on the death of every parishioner? The king would ask his learned commons to propose reforms. Some years earlier, in 1515, a celebrated case had shaken the church in England. A London merchant tailor, Richard Hun, had stood out against church fees, and the dispute had expanded into a bold challenge to ecclesiastical authority. As a result Hun was arrested, and imprisoned by the clergy in the Lollard Tower, where he was subsequently found hanged. Was it suicide or murder? Opposition in Parliament and the city grew in volume, and reached up to the Bishop of London himself. But these early rumblings of a reformation had been silenced by the then immovable power of Wolsey. Now the Commons eagerly resumed their interrupted task. A committee was formed of all the lawyers in the House, and they drafted the necessary bills in record time. The House of Lords, where the bishops and abbots still had more votes than the lay peers, agreed to the bills reforming sanctuaries and abolishing mortuary fees which affected the lower clergy only, but when the probate bill came up to the lords the Archbishop of Canterbury in especial, and all the other bishops in general, both frowned and grunted. Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, a representative of the old school, warned the lords that religious innovation would bring social revolution in its train. He pointed to the National Czech Revolt led by John Huss. My lords, he said. You see daily what bills come here from the Commons House, and all is for the destruction of the Church. For God's sake see what a realm the Kingdom of Bohemia was, and when the Church went down, then fell the glory of the Kingdom. Now with the Commons is nothing but down with the Church, and all this seemeth is for lack of faith only. The Commons soon heard of this bold speech, and members pointed out the implication of the last words that laws the commons made were laws made by pagans and heathen people and not worthy to be kept. They formed a deputation of thirty leading members, headed by the speaker, and went off to complain to the king. Henry summoned the offending bishops and asked Fisher to explain. Fisher shuffled. He had only meant, he declared, that the bohemians lacked faith, not the commons. With this interpretation the other bishops agreed. But this bland excuse, we are told, pleased the commons nothing at all. Sharp exchanges took place before the probate bill could be forced through the lords, and rancor grew. Thus from the outset the Reformation House of Commons acquired a corporate spirit, and during its long life, longer than any previous parliament, eagerly pursued any measure which promised revenge against the bishops for what it deemed their evasion and duplicity over the probate bill hostility to the episcopate smouldered, and marked the commons for more than a hundred years. The king was already delighted with what they had done, and went about telling everybody, including the imperial ambassador. We have issued orders, he said, 
for the reform of the clergy in our kingdom. We have already clipped their claws considerably by taking away from them several taxes imposed by their own excessive authority on our subjects. We are now about to undertake the annects, the first year's income which the bishops paid to Rome on consecration, and prevent ecclesiastics from holding more than one benefice. But he made it clear at once that he remained fully orthodox in matters of doctrine, that he was merely adhering to the principle of Colet and other leading divines whom he had known in his youth, that men could be Catholic though critical of papal institutions. If Luther, he declared, had confined himself to denouncing the vices, abuses, and errors of the clergy, instead of attacking the sacraments of the church and other divine institutions, we should all have followed him and written in his favour. After this blunt though reasoned statement the negotiations in Rome for annulling the king's marriage encountered even greater obstacles. But Henry all his life was only spurred by opposition, and he determined to show he was in earnest. During December 1530 the Attorney General charged the whole body of the clergy with breaking the 14th century statutes of premunire and provisors which had been passed to limit the powers of the Pope. This they had done by acquiescing in Wolsey's many high-handed actions in his role as papal legate. Henry, after defeating the bishops in the matter of probate by enlisting the support of Parliament, knew that convocation would not defy him. When the papal nuncio intervened to stiffen them against the king all the clergy present were astonished and scandalized. Without allowing him even to open his mouth they begged him to leave them in peace since they had not the king's leave to speak with him. In return for a pardon for contravening premunire and provisors the king extracted large sums from convocation, £100,000 from the province of Canterbury and £19,000 from York, which was much more than at first they were prepared to pay. After further negotiation he also obtained a new title. On February 7, 1531, the clergy acknowledged that the king was their especial protector, one and supreme lord, and, as far as the law of Christ allows, even supreme head. Parliament, which had been prorogued from month to month since the great doings about probate in 1529, was now recalled to hear and disseminate the royal view on the divorce. Lord Chancellor Moore came down to the house and said, there are some who say that the king is pursuing a divorce out of love for some lady, and not out of any scruple of conscience, but this is not true, and he read out the opinions of twelve foreign universities and showed a hundred books drawn up by doctors of strange regions, all agreeing that the king's marriage was unlawful. Then the Lord Chancellor said, now you of this commons house may report in your counties what you have seen and heard, and then all men shall openly perceive that the king hath not attempted this matter of will or pleasure, as some strangers report, but only for the discharge of his conscience and surety of the succession of his realm. Throughout these proceedings Queen Catherine remained at court. The king, although he rode and talked openly with Anne, left Catherine in charge of his personal wardrobe including supervision of the laundry and the making of his linen. When he required clothes he continued to apply to Catherine, not Anne. Anne was furiously jealous, but for months the king refused to abandon his old routine. A new attempt was then made by the Berlin party to persuade Catherine to renounce her rights. On June 1, 1531, she was waited on by Norfolk, Suffolk, and Gardner, Anne's father now Earl of Wiltshire, Northumberland, and several others. As before she refused to renounce anything. Finally, about the middle of July, Anne took the king on a long hunting expedition, away from Windsor Castle, longer than any they had ever made together. Catherine waited, day after day, until a month had gone by, but still there was no news of the king's return. At last the messenger came, the king would come back. But His Majesty did not wish to see the Queen, she was commanded to retire instantly to Wolsey's former palace at Moor, in Hertfordshire. Henceforward she and her daughter Mary were banished from court. The winter of 1531-32 was marked by the tensest crisis of Henry's reign. A form of excommunication, or even interdict, had been drafted in Rome, 
ordering the king to cast off his concubine and within fifteen days, only the penalties being left blank. The shadow of papal wrath hung over England. At court Christmas was kept with great solemnity. All men, states a chronicler, said there was no music in that Christmas, because the queen and ladies were absent. But, as in the dark days in the early part of the reign, after the failure of the Bordeaux expedition, the king pursued his inflexible course to the end. Opposition merely confirmed him in his plans. The annex bill of which he had boasted to the imperial ambassador was drafted as a fighting measure, in case the worst occurred. It armed the king for a greater struggle with the papacy than had preceded Magna Carta. If the court of Rome, its preamble ran, endeavoured to wield excommunication, interdict, or process compulsory in England, then all manner of sacraments and divine service should continue to be administered, and the interdict should not by any prelate or minister be executed or divulged. If anyone named by the king to a bishopric were restrained by bulls from Rome from accepting office he should be consecrated by the archbishop, or anyone named to an archbishopric. And the annates, a mainstay of the papal finances, were limited to 5% of their former amount. This was the most difficult bill which Henry ever had to steer through Parliament. He was obliged to go down to the House of Lords himself at least three times, and even then seemed likely to fail, until he thought of an entirely new expedient, the first public division of the House. He thought of a plan that those among the members who wished for the king's welfare and the prosperity of the kingdom, as they call it, should stand on one side of the house and those who opposed the measure on the other. For fear of the king's indignation a number of them went over, and with considerable amendment the bill was passed. The next step was to make the clergy submit to the royal supremacy. Henry got the commons to prepare a document called the supplication against the ordinaries, directed against the authority of church courts. Ordinaries was the legal term for bishops and their deputies who enjoyed rights of jurisdiction. Although convocation was truculent at first, making submission only in vague and ambiguous terms, Henry refused to compromise, and at the third attempt they agreed to articles of his own, making him effective master of the church in England. On the very afternoon these articles were submitted for the royal consent, May 16, 1532, Sir Thomas More resigned the Lord Chancellorship as a protest against royal supremacy in spiritual affairs. He had tried to serve his sovereign faithfully in everything, now he saw that Henry's courses must inevitably conflict with his own conscientious beliefs. Thus the English Reformation was a slow process. An opportunist king measured his steps as he went, until England was wholly independent of administration from Rome. Wolsey had done much to prepare the way. He had supported the papacy during some of its most critical years, and in return had been allowed to exercise wide and sweeping powers which were usually reserved to the Pope himself or to one of his visiting legates. England therefore was more accustomed than any other province of Christendom to papal jurisdiction being vested in one of its own priests, and this made it easier to transfer it to the crown. Wolsey had also brought papal authority in his own person nearer to men's lives than it had ever been, and this unsought familiarity bred dislike. The death in August of old Archbishop Warham, principal opponent of the king's divorce, opened further possibilities and problems. Henry did not hasten to appoint a successor. He had to consider how far he could go. If there were a struggle could any of his bishops be trusted to forget the oath which they had sworn to the Pope at their consecration? Would there be a rebellion? Would the Emperor, Queen Catherine's nephew, invade England from the Low Countries? Could the King rely on French neutrality? In order to weigh these factors at first hand the King went over to Boulogne with only a few friends, including Anne Boleyn, for personal discussion with Francis I he returned reassured confident that he could carry through even the most startling appointment to Canterbury, he recalled Cranmer from his embassy. Cranmer had been married twice, the second time in Germany after ordination, in the new German fashion for priests, to the niece of a well-known Lutheran. Since the marriage of priests was still illegal in England, Cranmer's wife went ahead in disguise. 
Kranma himself took leave of the emperor at Manchu on November 1st Street, 1532, and left the following day, arriving in London in the middle of December. A week later he was offered the Archbishopric of Canterbury. He accepted. Henceforward, until Henry died, Cranmer's wife was always hidden, and if she accompanied him was obliged, according to popular repute, to travel with the luggage in a vast chest specially constructed to conceal her. A month later, Henry secretly married Anne Boleyn. Historians have never discovered for certain who performed the ceremony, or where. Cranmer himself was not the priest. Both he and the imperial ambassador reported subsequently that the marriage had taken place in January 1533. Undoubtedly, in the eyes of the Roman Catholic world, Henry VIII committed bigamy, for he had been married nearly 25 years to Catherine of Aragon, and his marriage had not yet been annulled in Rome, or even in England, by any court or any public act. He simply assumed he had never been legally married at all and left the lawyers and clergy to put the matter right afterwards. Cranmer became archbishop in the traditional manner. At the king's request bulls had been obtained from Rome by threatening the papacy with a rigorous application of the Act of Annates. Cranmer swore to obey the Pope with their usual oath, though reservations were made before and afterwards, and he was consecrated with the full ceremonial. This was important. The man who was to carry through the ecclesiastical revolution had thus been accepted by the Pope and endowed with full authority. Two days afterwards however a bill was introduced into Parliament vesting in the Archbishop of Canterbury the power, formerly possessed by the Pope, to hear and determine all appeals from the ecclesiastical courts in England. Future attempts to use any foreign process would involve the drastic penalties of premunia. The judgments of the English courts were not to be affected by any papal verdict or by excommunication, and any priest who refused to celebrate divine service or administer the sacraments was made liable to imprisonment. This momentous bill, the work of Thomas Cromwell, which abolished what still remained of papal authority in England, passed through Parliament in due course, and became known as the Act of Appeals. The following month Henry himself wrote a letter describing his position as king and sovereign, recognizing no superior in earth but only God, and not subject to the laws of any earthly creature. The breach between England and Rome was complete. Having established his supremacy, Henry proceeded to exploit it. In March 1533 Convocation was asked two questions, was it against the law of God, and not open to dispensation by the Pope? for a man to marry his brother's wife, he being dead without issue, but having consummated the marriage? Answer by the prelates and clergy present, yes. By Bishop Fisher of Rochester, no. Was Prince Arthur's marriage with Queen Catherine consummated? Answer by the clergy, yes. By the bishop, no. Thereupon the bishop was arrested and committed to the tower. About ten days later the Duke of Norfolk with royal commissioners waited on Queen Catherine at Ampthill. Every sort of reason was advanced why she should renounce her title voluntarily. She was blocking the succession. Her daughter would not be accepted by the country as queen, and England might be plunged in chaos if she continued her unreasonable obstruction. If she resigned a great position would still be open to her. She refused to resign. Then she was informed of the decisions of convocation. Steps would be taken to deprive her of the rank of queen, to which she was no longer entitled. She declared her determination to resist. But the commissioners had still another announcement to make. Catherine was in any case queen no longer, for the king was already married to Anne Boleyn. Thus Henry's secret marriage became known. A fortnight later Grandma opened a court at Dunstable and set a proctor to Ampthill citing Catherine to appear. She refused. In her absence the archbishop pronounced judgment. Catherine's marriage with Henry had existed in fact but not in law, it was void from the beginning, and five days afterwards the marriage with Anne was declared valid. Queen Anne Boleyn was crowned on June 1 in Westminster Abbey. The following month it became clear that the new queen was expecting a child. As the confinement approached Henry remained with her at Greenwich, and took the greatest care she should not be disturbed. 
Much bad news came in from across the seas and frontiers, but on such occasions Henry rode out into the country and met the council in the open, to prevent the queen from conjecturing the gravity of the situation, or perhaps to avoid the plague. A magnificent and valuable bed, which had lain in the treasury since it had formed part of a French nobleman's ransom, was brought forth, and in it on September 7, 1533. The future Queen Elizabeth was born. Although bonfires were lighted, there was no rejoicing in Henry's heart. A male heir had been his desire. After he had defied the whole world, perhaps committed bigamy, and risked deposition by the Pope and invasion, here was only a second daughter. Do you wish to see your little daughter? the old nurse asked, according to one account. My daughter, my daughter! replied the king in a passion. You old devil! you witch, don't dare to speak to me. He galloped at once away from Greenwich, away from Anne, and in three days had reached Wolf Hall, in Wiltshire, the residence of a worthy old courtier, Sir John Seymour, who had a clever son in the diplomatic service and a pretty daughter, a former maid of honour to Queen Catherine. Jane Seymour was about twenty-five, and although she was attractive no one considered her a great beauty. Her skin reported the imperial ambassador, is so whitish that it may be called rather pale. She is not very clever, and is said to be rather arrogant. But she was gay, and generally liked, and Henry fell in love with her. After the birth of Elizabeth criticism of the king and his ecclesiastical measures could no longer be stifled. If the choice was between two princesses, men said, then why not choose Mary, the legitimate one? but the king would have none of this argument. An act was passed vesting the succession in Elizabeth. In March 1534 every person of legal age, male or female, throughout the kingdom was forced to swear allegiance to this act and renounce allegiance to all foreign authority in England. The clergy were prohibited from preaching unless specially licensed, a bidding prayer one was prescribed for use in all churches, containing the words, Henry VIII being immediately next unto God, the only and supreme head of this Catholic Church of England, and Anne his wife, and Elizabeth daughter and heir to them both, our princess. To publish or pronounce maliciously by express words that the king was a tyrant or heretic was made high treason. As the brutality of the reign increased many hundreds were to be hanged, disemboweled, and quartered on these grounds. Fisher and Sir Thomas More, who both refused the oath, were confined in the tower for many months. At his trial Moore offered a brilliant defence, but the king's former trust in him had now turned into vengeful dislike. Under royal pressure the judges pronounced him guilty of treason. While Fisher was in the tower the Pope created seven cardinals, of whom one was John, Bishop of Rochester, kept in prison by the King of England. Directly Henry heard the news he declared in anger several times that he would send Fisher's head to Rome for the cardinal's hat. Fisher was executed in June 1535 and more in July. For their fate the king must bear the chief responsibility, it is a black stain on his record. Shortly afterwards Henry was excommunicated and in theory deprived of his throne by the Pope. The resistance of Moore and Fisher to the royal supremacy in church government was a noble and heroic stand. They realized the defects of the existing Catholic system, but they hated and feared the aggressive nationalism which was destroying the unity of Christendom. They saw that the break with Rome carried with it the threat of a despotism freed from every fetter. More stood forth as the defender of all that was finest in the medieval outlook. He represents to history its universality, its belief in spiritual values, and its instinctive sense of otherworldliness. Henry VIII with cruel acts decapitated not only a wise and gifted counsellor, but a system which, though it had failed to live up to its ideals in practice, had for long furnished mankind with its brightest dreams. The king was still paying court to Jane Seymour when it became known that Anne was expecting another baby. But this time Henry refused to have anything to do with her. She was haggard and ill and had lost her freshness. Rumours were current at court that he had only spoken to her ten times in three months, although formerly he could hardly bear to be separated from her for an hour. Anne became distracted with anxiety, 
and was obsessed with fears of her rising against her and the infant Elizabeth in favor of Catherine and Mary. Without consulting the king or his council, she sent messages to Mary through her governess, making all sorts of promises if Mary would swear to the act of succession and renounce her claim to the throne. Promises were followed by threats, but Mary refused to give way. One day, after an unfavorable report from the governess, Anne was found in a tempest of tears. Soon afterwards her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, strode into the room and told her that Henry had had a serious accident out hunting. In her grief and alarm she nearly fainted. Five days later she miscarried. The king, instead of pitying her, gave way to an uncontrollable outburst of rage. He visited her, repeating over and over again, I see that God does not mean me to have male children. As he turned to leave he added angrily that he would speak to her again as soon as she was better. Anne replied that it was not her fault she had failed to bear another child. She had been frightened when she heard of the king's fall, besides, she loved him so passionately, with so much more fervor than Catherine, that it broke her heart when she saw that he gave his love to others. At this allusion to Jane the king left the room in a towering passion, and refused for days to see her. Jane Seymour was installed at Greenwich. Through her serving man, who had been taken into the pay of the imperial ambassador, we have a story of the royal courtship. One day the king sent a page down from London with a purse full of gold and a letter in his own handwriting. Jane kissed the letter, but returned it to the page unopened. Then, falling on her knees, she said, I pray you beseech the king to understand by my prudence that I am a gentlewoman of good and honorable family, without reproach, and have no greater treasure in the world than my honor, which I would not harm for a thousand deaths. If the king should wish to make me a present of money, I beg him to do so when God shall send me a husband to marry. The king was greatly pleased. She had, he said, displayed high virtue and to prove that his intentions were wholly worthy of her he promised not to speak to her in future except in the presence of her relations. In January 1536 Queen Catherine died. If the king was minded to marry again he could now repudiate Queen Anne without raising awkward questions about his earlier union. It was already rumored by the Seymour party that in her intense desire for an heir Queen Anne had been unfaithful to the king soon after the birth of Elizabeth with several lovers. If approved, this offence was capital. The Queen had accordingly been watched, and one Sunday two young courtiers, Henry Norris and Sir Francis Weston, were seen to enter the Queen's room, and were, it was said, overheard making love to her. Next day a parchment was laid before the King empowering a strong panel of councillors and judges, headed by the Lord Chancellor, or any four of them, to investigate and try every kind of treason. The king signed. On Tuesday the council sat all day and late into the night, but as yet there was not sufficient evidence. The following Sunday a certain Smeaton, a gentleman of the king's chamber, who played with great skill on the lute, was arrested as the queen's lover. Smeaton subsequently under torture confessed to the charge. On Monday Norris was among the challengers at the May Day tournament at Greenwich and as the king rode to London after the jousting he called Norris to his side and told him what was suspected. Although Norris denied everything he also was arrested and taken to the tower. That night Anne learned that Smeaton and Norris were in the tower. The following morning she was requested to come before the council. Although her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, presided at the examination, no Queen of England, Anne complained afterwards should have been treated with such brutality. At the conclusion of the proceedings she was placed under arrest, and kept under guard until the tide turned to take her upriver to the tower. So quickly had the news spread that large crowds collected along the river bank, and were in time to watch her barge rowing rapidly upstream with a detachment of the guard. Her uncle Norfolk, and the two Chamberlains, Lord Oxford and Lord Sands, on board. At the traitor's gate she was handed over to the constable of the tower, Sir William Kingston. The same evening, at York Palace, when the Duke of Richmond, the king's bastard son, came as usual to say good night to his father, 
The king burst into tears. By God's great mercy, he said, you and your sister Mary have escaped the hands of that damned poisonous strumpet. She was plotting to poison you both. Henry tried to forget his shame and disgrace in a ceaseless round of feasting. His Majesty, wrote the Imperial Ambassador, who however may well be suspected of malicious bias, has been gayer since the arrest than ever before. He is going out to dinner here, there, and everywhere with the ladies. Sometimes he returns along the river after midnight to the sound of many instruments or the voices of the singers of his chamber, who do their utmost to interpret his delight at being rid of that thin old woman. In fact she was aged twenty-nine, he went to dinner recently with the Bishop of Carlisle and some ladies, and next day the bishop told me that he had behaved with almost desperate gaiety. On Friday morning the special commissioners of treason appointed the previous week, including Anne Boleyn's father, the Earl of Wiltshire, and the entire bench of judges except one, formed the court for the trial of Anne's lovers. A special jury consisting of twelve knights had been summoned, and found the prisoners guilty. They were sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, but execution was deferred until after the trial of the Queen. This opened the following Monday in the Great Hall of the Tower. Twenty-six peers, half the existing peerage, sat on a raised dais under the presidency of the Duke of Norfolk, named Lord High Steward of England for the occasion. The Lord Chancellor, Sir Thomas Audley, who as a commoner by birth was not entitled to judge a Queen, sat next to the Duke to give legal advice. The Lord Mayor and a deputation of aldermen attended, with members of the public, by the King's command, in the well of the hall. The Queen was brought in by Sir Edmund Walsingham, the Lieutenant of the Tower, to listen to the indictment by the Attorney General. She was charged with being unfaithful to the King, promising to marry Norris after the King was dead, giving Norris poisoned lockets for the purpose of poisoning Catherine and Mary, and other offences, including incest with her brother. The Queen denied the charges vigorously, and replied to each one in detail. The peers retired, and soon returned with a verdict of guilty. Norfolk pronounced sentence, the Queen was to be burnt or beheaded, at the King's pleasure. Anne received the sentence with calm and courage. She declared that if the king would allow it she would like to be beheaded like the French nobility, with a sword, and not, like the English nobility, with an axe. Her wish was granted, but no executioner could be found in the king's dominions to carry out the sentence with a sword, and it was found necessary to postpone the execution from Thursday to Friday while an expert was borrowed from Street Homer, in the emperor's dominions. During Thursday night she slept little. Distant hammering could be heard from the courtyard of the tower, as a low scaffold, about five feet high, was erected for the execution. In the morning the public were admitted to the courtyard, and the Lord Chancellor entered soon afterwards with Henry's son, the Duke of Richmond, Cromwell, and the Lord Mayor and Alderman. On May 19, 1536, the headsman was already waiting, leaning on his heavy two handed sword, when the constable of the tower appeared followed by Anne in a beautiful night robe of heavy grey damask trimmed with fur, showing a crimson kirtle beneath. She had chosen this garment in order to leave her neck bare. A large sum had been given to her to distribute in arms among the crowd. I am not here, she said to them simply, to preach to you, but to die. Pray for the king, for he is a good man and has treated me as well as could be. I do not accuse anyone of causing my death neither the judges nor anyone else, for I am condemned by the law of the land and die willingly. Then she took off her pearl-covered headdress, revealing that her hair had been carefully bound up to avoid impeding the executioner. Pray for me, she said, and knelt down while one of the ladies in waiting bandaged her eyes. Before there was time to say a paternoster she bowed her head, murmuring in a low voice, God have pity on my soul. God have mercy on my soul, she repeated, as the executioner stepped forward and slowly took his aim. Then the great blade hissed through the air, and with a single stroke his work was done. As soon as the execution was known, Henry appeared in yellow, with a feather in his cap, 
and ten days later was privately married to Jane Seymour at York Place. Jane proved to be the submissive wife for whom Henry had always longed. Anne had been too dominating and too impulsive. When that woman desires anything, one of the ambassadors had written of Anne two years before her execution. There is no one who dares oppose her, or could do so if he dared, not even the king himself. They say that he is incredibly subject to her, so that when he does not wish her to do what she wishes she does it in spite of him and pretends to fly into a terrible rage. Jane was the opposite, gentle or proud, and Henry spent a happy eighteen months with her. She was the only queen whom Henry regretted and mourned, and when she died, still aged only twenty-two, immediately after the birth of her first child, the future Edward Vi, Henry had her buried with royal honours in St. George's Chapel at Windsor. He himself lies near her. Chapter 6 The end of the monastery a storefall had been bliss at court while Jane was queen, rural England was heavy with discontents. Henry was increasingly short of revenue and church properties offered a tempting prize. Just before Anne's trial he had gone down to the House of Lords in person to recommend a bill suppressing those smaller monasteries which contained fewer than twelve monks. There were nearly four hundred of them, and the combined rent of their lands amounted to a considerable sum. The religious orders had for some time been in decline, and parents were becoming more and more averse to handing over their sons to the cloisters. Monks turned to the land in search of recruits and often waive the old social distinctions, taking the sons of poor tenant farmers. But the number of novices was rarely sufficient. At some houses the monks had given up all hope of carrying on, and squandered the endowments, cutting down woods, pawning the plate, and letting the buildings fall into disrepair or ruin. Grave irregularities had been discovered by the ecclesiastical visitors over many years. The idea of suppression was not altogether new. Wolsey had suppressed several small houses to finance his college at Oxford, and the king had since suppressed over twenty more for his own benefit. Parliament made little difficulty about winding up the smaller houses, when satisfied that their inmates were either to be transferred to large houses or pensioned off. During the summer of 1536 royal commissioners toured the country completing the dissolution as swiftly as possible. The king had now a new chief advisor. Thomas Cromwell, in turn mercenary soldier in Italy, cloth agent, and money lender, had served his apprenticeship in statecraft under Wolsey, but he had also learned the lessons of his master's downfall. Ruthless, cynical, Machiavellian, Cromwell was a man of the new age. His ambition was matched by his energy and served by a penetrating intelligence. When he succeeded Wolsey as the king's principal minister he made no effort to inherit the pomp and glory of the fallen cardinal. Nevertheless his were more solid achievements in both state and church. In the administration of the realm Cromwell devised new methods to replace the institutions he found at hand. Before his day government policy had for centuries been both made and implemented in the royal household. Though Henry VII had improved the system he had remained in a sense a medieval king. Thomas Cromwell thoroughly reformed it during his ten years of power, and when he fell in 1540 policy was already carried out by government departments, operating outside the household. Perhaps his greatest accomplishment, though not so dramatic as his other work, was his inception of the government service of modern England. Cromwell is the uncommemorated architect of our great departments of state. As first minister Cromwell handled the dissolution of the monasteries with conspicuous, cold-blooded efficiency. It was a step which appealed to the well-to-do. The high nobility and country gentry acquired on favourable terms all kinds of fine estates. Sometimes a neighbouring merchant or a syndicate of city men and courtiers, bought or leased the confiscated lands. Many local squires had long been stewards of monastic lands, and now bought properties which they had managed for generations. Throughout the middle classes there was great irritation at the privileges and wealth of the church. They resented the undue proportion of the national income engrossed by those who rendered no economic service. The king was assured of the support of parliament and the prosperous classes. Most of the displaced monks, 
nearly 10,000 in all, faced their lot with relief or fortitude, assisted by substantial pensions. Some even married nuns, and many became respectable parish clergy. The dissolution brought lands into the crown's possession worth at the time over £100,000 a year, and by the sale or lease of the rest of the former monastic properties the crown gained a million and a half, a huge sum for those days, though probably much less than the properties were worth. The main result of this transaction was in effect, if not in intention, to commit the landed and mercantile classes to the Reformation settlement and the Tudor dynasty. The immediate impact on the masses is more difficult to judge. There does not seem to have been any widespread unemployment or distress among the sturdy proletariat, but many poor, weak, and ailing folk, especially in the north, who had found their only succor in the good works of the monastic orders, were left untended for a long time. In the north also, where the old traditions died hard, the new order aroused stiffer resistance than in the south, and the new lay landlord could be harsher than his clerical predecessor. But laymen were not the only enclosing landlords, and more than one pre Reformation abbot had sought by one means or another to improve farming and husbandry through enclosure. English agriculture, to meet the demands of a growing population and an expanding cloth industry, was turning from arable farming to pasture. Hence, the broad acres on the ecclesiastical estates were now fertilized by the ideas and the money of their new owners, the country gentlemen and merchants. The Reformation is sometimes blamed for all the evils attributed to the modern economic system. Yet these evils, if such they were, had existed long before Henry VIII began to doubt the validity of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Thomas More, who did not live to see events run their course, had already in Utopia outlined to his contemporaries the sharp features of the new economy. In the field of religious belief, the Reformation brought profound change. The Bible now acquired new and far-reaching authority. The older generation considered that Holy Writ was dangerous in the hands of the unlearned and should only be read by priests. I never read the scripture, said the Duke of Norfolk, nor never will read it. It was merry in England afore the new learning came up, yea, I would all things were as hath been in time past. But complete printed Bibles, translated into English by Tyndall and Coverdale, had appeared for the first time late in the autumn of 1535, and were now running through several editions. The government enjoined the clergy to encourage Bible reading, and there were well-founded rumours that Thomas Cromwell, the king's vicegerent in spiritual affairs, had helped to promote the translation. Preaching, even by licensed preachers, was altogether suspended until Michael Elmer's except in the presence of a bishop, and in August 1536 Cromwell ordered the Paternoster and Commandments to be taught in the mother tongue instead of in Latin. Next year the institution of a Christian man, prepared by Cranmer for popular edification, displayed a distinct leaning to the new opinion. Here indeed was a change and a revelation. The country folk were deeply agitated particularly in the fiercely Catholic and economically backward North. In the autumn, when the new taxes came to be assessed after Michael Elmer's, farmers and yokels collected in large numbers throughout the north of England and Lincolnshire, swearing to resist the taxes and maintain the old order in the church. The revolt, which took the name of the Pilgrimage of Grace, was spontaneous. Its leader, a lawyer named Robert Ask, had his position thrust upon him. The nobles and higher clergy took no part. Although the rebels greatly outnumbered the loyal levies, and the king had no regular troops except the yeomen of the guard, Henry at once showed what Wolsey had called his royal stomach. He refused to compromise with rebellion. When his commissioners of taxes were taken prisoners by the rebels in Lincolnshire he sent a terrifying message. This assembly is so heinous that unless you can persuade them to disperse and send a hundred of their ringleaders with halters round their necks to the lieutenant to do with them as shall be thought best, we see no way to save them. For we have already sent the Duke of Suffolk, our lieutenant, with a hundred thousand men, horse and foot, in harness, with munitions and artillery. We have also appointed another great army to invade their territories as soon as they are out of them and to burn, 
spoil, and destroy their goods, wives, and children with all extremity. After this the commissioners reported that the common people as a whole were prepared to recognize the king as supreme head of the church and to allow him for this once to have the first fruits and the tenths from the clergy together with the subsidy he was demanding. But, they said, he shall have no more money of the commons during his life, nor shall he suppress no more abbeys. They still protested against the king's choice of councillors, and demanded the surrender of Cromwell, Cranmer, and four bishops who were suspected of heresy. The king replied with vigor. Concerning choosing of counselors, I never have read, heard, nor known that princes, counselors, and prelates should be appointed by rude and ignorant common people. How presumptuous then are ye, the rude commons of one shire, and that one of the most brute and beastly of the whole realm, and of least experience, to find fault with your prince. As to the suppression of religious houses, Know that this is granted us by all the nobles, spiritual and temporal, of this our realm, by act of parliament, and not set forth by any counsellors upon their mere will and fantasy as you full falsely would persuade our realm. If they did not submit, the king added, they with their wives and children would be utterly destroyed by the sword. The Yorkshire rebels had much the same aims as their oath shows, for the love I do bear unto Almighty God's faith I swear. To expulse all villain blood and evil counsels against the commonwealth from his grace and his privy counsel, to keep before me the cross of Christ, in my heart his faith, the restitution of the church, the suppression of these heretics and their opinions. In early 1537 the rebellion collapsed as quickly as it had arisen, but Henry determined to make examples of the ringleaders. Seventy were hanged as traitors at Carlisle Assizes alone, and when Norfolk, the victorious general, seemed inclined to clemency the king sent word that he desired a large number of executions. Altogether some 250 of the insurgents were put to death. The rebels had objected to the taxes and the suppression of the monasteries. Henry now replied by tightening up the collection of taxes, and began suppressing the larger monasteries the moment the revolt was put down. As a further blow to the old school the government commissioned in Paris a great printing of English Bibles, more sumptuous than any previous edition, and in September 1538 directed that every parish in the country should purchase a Bible of the largest volume in English, to be set up in each church, where the parishioners might most commodiously resort to the same and read it. Six copies were set up in St. Paul's, in the city of London, and multitudes thronged the cathedral all day to read them, especially, we are told, when they could get any person that had an audible voice to read aloud. This Bible has remained the basis of all later editions, including the authorized version prepared in the reign of James I. Up to this point Thomas Cromwell had consistently walked with success but he now began to encounter the conservatism of the older nobility. They were more than content with the political revolution, but they wanted the reformation to stop with the assertion of the royal supremacy, and they opposed the doctrinal changes of Cranmer and his following. The Duke of Norfolk headed the reaction, and the king, who was rigidly orthodox, except where his lusts or interests were stirred, agreed with it. Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester and later Queen Mary's advisor, was the brain behind the Norfolk party. Its leaders took pains to point out that France and the Emperor might invade England and execute the sentence of deposition which the Pope had pronounced. The King himself was anxious to avoid a total religious cleavage with the European powers. The Catholic front seemed overwhelmingly strong, and the only allies which Cromwell could find abroad were minor German princelings. With these large issues in their keeping, Norfolk's faction vigilantly awaited their chance. It came, like so much of the action of this memorable reign, as a result of the conjugal affairs of the king. As Henry refused to compromise with the continental Lutherans on matters of doctrine or modifications of the church services, Cromwell could do no more than seek a political alliance with the Lutheran princes of northern Germany, bring over learned Lutheran divines and negotiate a German marriage for one of the English princesses, or even for Henry himself. The king was now a widower. 
One continental house he considered marrying into was the Duchy of Cleves, which to some extent shared his own attitude in religion, hating the papacy, yet restricting Lutheranism. Then news arrived of a startling diplomatic development. The French and imperial ambassadors waited together on the king to inform him that Francis I had invited the Emperor Charles V, who was in his Spanish dominions, to pass through Paris on his way to put down a revolt at Ghent, and the emperor had accepted. The two sovereigns had resolved to forget old grudges and make common cause. An alliance with the princes of northern Germany against the two Catholic monarchs now seemed imperative, and negotiations for a marriage between Henry and Anne, the eldest princess of Cleves, were hurried on. Anne's charms, Cromwell reported, were on everybody's lips. Everyone, he announced, praises her beauty both of face and body. One says she excels the Duchess of Milan as the golden sun does the silver moon. Holborn, the court painter, and a masterly delineator of his age, had already been sent over to paint the portrait, which may now be seen in the Louvre. It does not flatter the princess. This, the English ambassador at Cleves warned the king, is a very lively image. Anne, he added, spoke only German, spent her time chiefly in needlework, and could not sing or play any instrument. She was thirty years old, very tall and thin, with an assured and resolute countenance, slightly pockmarked, but was said to possess wit and animation, and did not overindulge in beer. Anne spent Christmas at Calais, waiting for storms to abate, and on the last day of the year 1539 arrived at Rochester. Henry had sailed down in his private barge, in disguise, bearing a fine sable fur among the presents. On New Year's Day he hurried to visit her. But on seeing her he was astonished and abashed. Embraces, presents, compliments, all carefully arranged on the voyage, were forgotten. He mumbled a few words and returned to the barge, where he remained silent for many minutes. At last he said very sadly and pensively, I see nothing in this woman as men report of her, and I marvel that wise men should have made such a report as they have done. Say what they will, he told Cromwell on his return, she is nothing fair. The personage is well and comely, but nothing else. If I had known before as much as I know now she would not have come within this realm. Privately he dubbed her the Flanders Mare. But the threat from abroad compelled the king to fulfill his contract. You had me pushed into a tight corner, he told the French ambassador afterwards, but, thank God, I am still alive, and not so little a king as I was thought. Since he now knew as much about the canon law on marriage as anyone in Europe, he turned himself into the perfect legal example of a man whose marriage might be annulled. The marriage was never consummated. He told his intimate counselors that he had gone through the form of it from political necessity against his true desire, and without inward consent, for fear of making a ruffle in the world and driving Anne's brother the duke into the hands of the emperor and the king of France. There was a pre-contract, not sufficiently cleared, in that she had been promised to the son of the duke of Lorraine and not released. In fact he was merely waiting, watching the European situation, until it was safe to act. Norfolk and Gardner now saw their chance to break Cromwell as Wolsey had been broken, with the help of a new lady. Yet another of Norfolk's nieces, Catherine Howard, was presented to Henry at Gardner's house, and captured his affections at first sight. The Norfolk faction soon felt strong enough to challenge Cromwell's power. In June 1540 the king was persuaded to get rid of Cromwell and Anne together. Cromwell was condemned under a bill of attainder charging him principally with heresy and broadcasting erroneous books and implicitly with treason. Anne agreed to have her marriage annulled, and convocation pronounced it invalid. She lived on in England, pensioned and in retirement, for another seventeen years. A few days after Cromwell was executed on July 28 Henry was privately married to his fifth wife, Catherine Howard. Catherine, about twenty-two with auburn hair and hazel eyes, was the prettiest of Henry's wives. His Majesty's spirits revived, his health returned, and he went down to Windsor to reduce weight. The King, reported the French ambassador in December, has taken a new rule of living, 
to rise between 5 and 6, hear mass at 7, and then ride till dinner time, which is at 10 in the morning. He says that he feels much better in the country than when he lived all winter in his houses at the gates of London. But wild, tempestuous Catherine was not long content with a husband nearly thirty years older than herself. Her reckless love for her cousin, Thomas Culpepper, was discovered, and she was executed in the tower in February 1542 on the same spot as Anne Boleyn. The night before the execution she asked for the block so that she could practice laying her head upon it, and as she mounted the scaffold said, I die a queen, but would rather die the wife of Culpepper. God have mercy on my soul. Good people, I beg you to pray for me. Henry's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, was a serious little widow from the Lake District, thirty-one years of age, learned, and interested in theological questions who had had two husbands before the king. She married Henry at Hampton Court on July 12, 1543, and until his death three years later made him an admirable wife, nursing his ulcerated leg, which grew steadily worse and in the end killed him. She contrived to reconcile Henry with the future Queen Elizabeth, both Mary and Elizabeth grew fond of her and she had the fortune to outlive her husband. The brilliant young Renaissance prince had grown old and wrathful. The pain from his leg made Henry ill-tempered, he suffered fools and those who crossed him with equal lack of patience. Suspicion dominated his mind and ruthlessness marked his actions. At the time of his marriage with Catherine Parr he was engaged in preparing the last of his wars. The roots of the conflict lay in Scotland. Hostility between the two peoples still smouldered, ever and again flickering into flame along the wild border. Reviving the obsolete claim to suzerainty, Henry denounced the Scots as rebels, and pressed them to relinquish their alliance with France. The Scots successfully defeated an English raid at Halidon Rig. Then in the autumn of 1542 an expedition under Norfolk had to turn back at Kelso, principally through the failure of the commissariat, which, besides its other shortcomings, left the English army without its beer and the Scots proceeded to carry the war into the enemy's country. Their decision proved disastrous. Badly led and imperfectly organized, they lost more than half their army of 10,000 men in Solway Moss and were utterly routed. The news of this second flodden killed James V, who died leaving the kingdom to an infant of one week, Mary, the famous Queen of Scots. At once the child became the focus of the struggle for Scotland. Henry claimed her for the bride of his own son and heir, but the Scots Queen Mother was a French princess, Mary of Guise. The pro-French Catholic party, led by Cardinal Beaton, resisted, repudiated Henry's terms, and began negotiations for marrying Mary to a French prince. Such a marriage could never be accepted by England. The imperial ambassador, who sought Henry's aid in the emperor's struggle with France, found himself eagerly welcomed at court. Once again England and the Empire made common cause against the French, and in May 1543 a secret treaty was ratified between Charles V and Henry. Throughout the year, and well into the spring of 1544, the preparations continued. While Scotland was left to Edward Seymour, brother of Queen Jane, and now Earl of Hertford, the king himself was to cross the Channel and lead an army against Francis in cooperation with an imperial force from the northeast. The plan was excellent, but the execution failed. Henry and Charles distrusted each other, each suspected the other of seeking a separate peace. Wary of being drawn too deep into the emperor's plans, Henry sat down to besiege Boulogne. The town fell on September 14th and Henry was able to congratulate himself on at least one tangible result from his campaign. Five days later the emperor made his peace with Francis, and refused to listen to Henry's complaints and exhortations. Meanwhile the English in Scotland, after burning Edinburgh and laying waste much country, ceased to make headway, and in February 1545 were defeated at Moor. Henry's position was extremely grave. Without a single ally, the nation faced the possibility of invasion from both France and Scotland. 
the crisis called for unexampled sacrifices from the English people, never had they been called upon to pay so many loans, subsidies, and benevolences. To set an example Henry melted down his own plate and mortgaged his estates. At Portsmouth he prepared for the threatened invasion in person. A French fleet penetrated the Solent and landed troops in the Isle of Wight, but they were soon driven off, and the crisis gradually passed. Next year a peace treaty was signed, which left Boulogne in English hands for eight years, at the end of which time France was to buy it back at a heavy price. Scotland was not included in the settlement. The war in the north smouldered on, bursting into flame for a time at the assassination of Cardinal Beaton, but yielding no definite results. Henry completely failed in Scotland. He would make no generous settlement with his neighbours, yet he lacked the force to coerce them. For the next fifty years they were to tease and trouble the minds of his successors. In 1546 Henry was as yet only fifty-five. In the autumn he made his usual progress through Surrey and Berkshire to Windsor, and early in November he came up to London. He was never to leave his capital alive again. In these last few months one question dominated all minds, the heir to the kingdom was known, a child of nine, but who would be the power behind the throne? Norfolk or Hartford? The party of reaction or the party of reform? A sudden and unexpected answer was given. On December 12, 1546, Norfolk and his son Surrey, the poet, were arrested for treason and sent to the tower. Surrey's foolish conduct had made trouble inevitable. He had talked wildly of the time when the king should be dead, and, inconveniently remembering his descent from Edward I, he had quartered the royal arms with his own, despite the herald's prohibitions. The king remembered that years before Norfolk had been put forward as a possible heir to the throne, and Surrey had been suggested as a husband for Princess Mary. His suspicions aroused, he acted swiftly. In mid January, Surrey was executed. Parliament assembled to pass a bill of attainder against Norfolk. On Thursday, the 27th, the royal assent was given and Norfolk was condemned to death. But that same evening, the king himself was dying. The physicians dared not tell him so, for prophesying the king's death was treason by act of parliament. Then, as the long hours slowly passed, Sir Anthony Denny, boldly coming to the king, told him what case he was in, to man's judgment not like to live, and therefore exhorted him to prepare himself for death. The king took the grim news with fortitude. Urged to summon the archbishop, he replied that first he would take a little sleep, and then, as I feel myself, I will advise upon the matter. While he slept Hartford and Paget walked the gallery outside, scheming and contriving how to secure their power. Shortly before midnight the king awoke. He sent for grandma. When he came Henry was too weak to speak, he could only stretch out his hand to grandma. In a few minutes the supreme head had ceased to breathe. Henry's rule saw many advances in the growth and the character of the English state, but it is a hideous blot upon his record that the reign should be widely remembered for its executions. Two queens, two of the king's chief ministers, a saintly bishop, numerous abbots, monks and many ordinary folk who dared to resist the royal will were put to death. Almost every member of the nobility in whom royal blood ran perished on the scaffold at Henry's command. Roman Catholic and Calvinist alike were burned for heresy and religious treason. These persecutions, inflicted in solemn manner by officers of the law, perhaps in the presence of the council or even the king himself, form a brutal sequel to the bright promise of the Renaissance. The sufferings of devout men and women among the faggots, the use of torture, and the savage penalties imposed for even paltry crimes, stand in repellent contrast to the enlightened principles of humanism. Yet his subjects did not turn from Henry in loathing. He succeeded in maintaining order amid the turmoil of Europe without army or police and he imposed on England a discipline which was not attained elsewhere. A century of religious wars went by without Englishmen taking up arms to fight their fellow countrymen for their faith. We must credit Henry's reign with laying the basis of sea power, with a revival of parliamentary institutions, with giving the English Bible to the people, 
and above all with strengthening a popular monarchy under which succeeding generations worked together for the greatness of England while France and Germany were racked with internal strife. Chapter 7 The Protestant struggle of English Reformation under Henry VIII had received its guiding impulse from the king's passions and his desire for power. He still deemed himself a good Catholic. However, none of his Catholic wives had borne him a son. Catherine of Aragon had given birth to the future Queen Mary, Anne Boleyn to the future Queen Elizabeth, but it was Jane, daughter of the Protestant House of Seymour, who had produced the future Edward Vi. Fears of a disputed succession lay deeply engraved in Henry VIII and in his whole people, and it was chiefly the desire and the duty to safeguard the throne of England for his only legitimate son that had impelled him in his later years to break not only with Rome but with his inmost religious convictions. Nevertheless the Catholic Norfolks retained much of their power and influence. Their kinswoman Catherine Howard might be executed, their son, the poet Surrey, might follow her to the scaffold, monastery lands might be seized and the Bible printed in English, but while Henry lived they constituted a check and barrier to the reforming party. Henry had restrained Cranmer's doctrinal innovations, and in the main upheld the whole Norfolk interest, represented in religion by Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester. Thus there was a working compromise. Henry wanted his own way on his throne and in his choice of consort, but he saw no need to change the faith or even the ritual to which his subjects had been born. With the new reign, a deeper and more powerful tide began to flow. The guardian and chief counsellor of the child king was his uncle, Edward Seymour, now Duke of Somerset. He and Cranmer proceeded to transform the political reformation of Henry VIII into a religious revolution. Foreign scholars from Germany and Switzerland, and even from distant Poland, were given shares in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge to educate the new generation of clergy in the Reformed doctrines. The Book of Common Prayer, in shining English prose, was drawn up by Cranmer and accepted by Parliament in 1549. Then followed, after Somerset's fall, the 42 Articles of Religion, and a second prayer book, until, on paper at least, England became a Protestant state. Somerset and Cranmer were both men of sincerity, they believed in the religious ideas which they intended their countrymen to accept, but the mass of the people neither knew nor cared about theological warfare, and there were many who actively opposed the imported foreign creeds. Somerset himself was merely one of the regents appointed under Henry's will, and his position as protector, at once dazzling and dangerous, had little foundation in law or precedent. Rivals crowded jealously upon him. His brother, Thomas Seymour, Lord High Admiral, had his own ambitions. The pale child Edward Vi, who was constitutionally consumptive, might not live long. The next Protestant heir was Princess Elizabeth. She was living with Lady Catherine Parr, last and most fortunate of Henry's wives, and Catherine Parr was now married to the Admiral. He thought fit to make advances to the young princess even before the death of his wife, and girlish romps took place in her bedroom that led to scandal. Proofs were discovered of Thomas Seymour's plots against his brother, and the protector was forced in January 1549 to dispose of him by act of attainder and the block on Tower Hill. Thus Somerset surmounted the first crisis of the new reign. Far more serious than such personal threats were the distresses and discontents in the countryside. The life and economy of medieval England were fast dissolving. Landlords saw that vast fortunes could be made from wool, and the village communal strips barred their profits. Warfare had been going on for decades between landowner and peasantry. Slowly and surely the rights and privileges of the village communities were infringed and removed. Common land was seized, enclosed, and turned to pasture for flocks. Dissolution of the monasteries removed the most powerful and conservative element in the old system, and for a time gave fresh impetus to a process already underway. The multiplication of enclosures caused distress throughout the realm. In some counties as much as one third of the arable land was turned over to grass, and the people looked in anger upon the new nobility, fat with sacrilegious spoil, 
but greedy still. Somerset had thus to face one of the worst economic crises that England has endured. Not only was the widespread unemployment, but also hardship caused by Henry's debasement of the coinage. The popular preachers were loud in denunciation. The Sermon of the Plough, preached by Hugh Latimer at Paul's Cross in 1548, is a notable piece of Tudor invective. In times past men were full of pity and compassion, but now there is no pity, for in London their brother shall die in the streets for cold, he shall lie sick at the door between stock and stock, that is, between the doorposts, and then perish for hunger. In times past, when any rich man died in London, they were wont to help the scholars at the universities with exhibition. When any man died they would bequeath great sums of money toward the relief of the poor. Charity is waxen cold, none helpeth the scholar nor yet the poor, now that the knowledge of God's word is brought to light, and many earnestly study and labor to set it forth, now almost no man helpeth to maintain them. In the spring of 1549 Latimer preached a course of sermons on the evils of the age, upon the monstrous and portentous dearth made by man. You landlords, you rent raisers, I may say you steplords, you have for your possessions yearly too much. I tell you, my lords and masters, this is not for the king's honor. It is to the king's honor that his subjects be led in the true religion. It is the king's honor that the commonwealth be advanced, that the earth be provided for, and the commodities of this realm so employed, as it may be to the setting of his subjects on work and keeping them from idleness. If the king's honor, as some men say, standeth in the great multitude of people, then these grey's ears, enclosers, and rent raisers are hinderers of the king's honor, for whereas have been a great many householders and inhabitants, there is now but a shepherd and his dog. My lords and masters, such proceedings do intend plainly to make of the yeomanry slavery. The enhancing and rearing go all to your private commodity and wealth. Ye had a single too much, and now ye have double too much, but let the preacher preach till his tongue be worn to the stumps, nothing is amended. Somerset was surrounded by men who had made their money by the methods which Latimer denounced. He himself sympathized with the yeoman and peasantry, and appointed commissions to inquire into the enclosures. But this increased the discontent, and encouraged the oppressed to take matters into their own hands. Two rebellions broke out. The Catholic peasantry in the southwest rose against the prayer book, and the yokels of the eastern counties against the enclosing landlords. This gave a fine handle to Somerset's enemies. In Germany in 1524-26 the Reformation had been followed by the Bloody Peasants' War, in which the poorer classes in the countryside and the towns rose with the blessing of the reformers wing lie against their noble oppressors. The same thing seemed about to happen in the England of 1549. Foreign mercenaries suppressed the Western Rebellion. But in Norfolk the trouble was more serious. A Tanriona named Robert Kidd took the lead. He established his headquarters outside Norwich on Mousehold Hill, where about 16,000 peasants gathered in a camp of turf huts roofed with boughs. Under a large oak tree, Kidd, day after day, tried country gentlemen charged with robbing the poor. No blood was shed, but property acquired by enclosing common land was restored to the public and the rebels lived upon the flocks and herds of the landowners. The local authorities were powerless, and Somerset was known to recognize the justice of their grievances. The disorders spread to Yorkshire, and presently reverberated in the Midlands. John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, son of the man who had been Henry VII's agent, now seized his opportunity. He had proved an able soldier in the French campaigns of Henry VIII, and had been careful to hide his real character and motives. He was a self-seeking, vigorous man, and the champion of wealth and property. Now he was given command of the troops to suppress the rising. The government felt itself so militarily weak that followers of the rebels were offered a free pardon. It was not unmoved. The herald came to his camp, but a small incident brought disaster. While Kit was standing by the oak tree, Meditating an interview with Warwick, 
a small urchin drew the attention of the herald's party with words as unseemly as his gesture was filthy, and he was immediately shot with an arquebus. The murder enraged Kit's followers. Fighting began. Warwick's best troops were German mercenaries, whose precise fire drill shattered the peasant array. 3,500 were killed. There were no wounded. A few made a stand for their lives behind a barricade of farm carts and surrendered. Kit was taken prisoner, and hanged at Norwich Castle. Warwick had by accident made his mark as a strong man. Somerset's enemies claimed the credit for restoring order. They blamed the rising in the east on his enclosure commissions and his sympathy for the peasants, and the rebellion in the west on his religious reforms. His foreign policy had driven the Scots into alliance with France, and he had lost Henry's one conquest, Boulogne. Warwick became the leader of the opposition. The lords in London, as Warwick's party were called, met to take measures against the protector. No one moved to support him. They quietly took over the government. After a spell in the tower, Somerset, now powerless, was for some months allowed to sit in the council, but as conditions got worse so the danger grew of reaction in his favour. In January 1552, splendidly garbed as for a state banquet, he was executed on Tower Hill. This handsome, well-meaning man had failed completely to heal the dislocation of Henry's reign and fell a victim to the fierce interests he had offended. Nevertheless the people of England remembered him for years as the good duke. His successors were less scrupulous, and even less successful. Amidst the wreck of ancient institutions, says Froude, the misery of the people, and the moral and social anarchy by which the nation was disintegrated. Thoughtful persons in England could not fail by this time to be asking themselves what they had gained by the Reformation. The government was corrupt, the courts of law were venal. The trading classes cared only to grow rich. The multitude were mutinous from oppression. Among the good who remained unpolluted the best were still on the reforming side. The nominal king of England, Edward Vi, was a cold, priggish invalid of fifteen. In his diary he noted his uncle's death without a comment. The government of Warwick, now become Duke of Northumberland, was held together by class resistance to social unrest. His three years of power displayed to the full the rapacity of the ruling classes. Doctrinal reformation was a pretense for confiscating yet more church lands, and new bishops paid for their consecration with portions of the episcopal estates. The so-called grammar schools of Edward Vi were but the beginning of spacious plans carried out in Elizabeth's reign for endowing education out of the confiscated lands of the monasteries. Thomas More's definition of government as a conspiracy of rich men procuring their own commodities under the name and title of a commonwealth fitted England very accurately during these years. One gleam of enterprise distinguishes this period. It saw the opening of relations between England and a growing new power in Eastern Europe, hitherto known as Muscovy, but soon to be called Russia. A small group of Englishmen conceived the idea of seeking a northeastern passage to Asia through Arctic waters. Upon the northern coasts of Asia there might be people who would buy cloth and other English products. As early as 1527 a small book had appeared prophesying such a discovery. One phrase rings out, there is no land uninhabitable nor sea unnavigable. In 1553 an expedition was financed by the Muscovy Company of Merchant Adventurers with the backing of the government. Sebastian Cabot, a wise old seaman who some fifty years earlier had accompanied his father on his voyage to Newfoundland, was brought in as governor of the company. In May three ships set sail under Hugh Willoughby and Richard Chancellor. Willoughby perished with his crew off Lapland, but Chancellor wintered in Archangel, and in the spring pushed overland to the court of Ivan the Terrible at Moscow. The monopoly of the German Hansa towns, which had long blocked English merchants throughout northern Europe, was now outflanked and trade began with Russia. On a second voyage Chancellor was drowned in a storm off Scotland. Another of his associates, Anthony Jenkinson, carried on his work. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth Jenkinson paid three visits to Russia and became a trusted friend of the Tsar. In the course of his travels he got as far as Bokhara, 
in Turkestan, on the old Silk Road of Marco Polo, he crossed into Persia, and was the first man to fly the English flag on the Caspian Sea. But these adventures belong to a greater age than that of Edward Vi and his successor. Under the Succession Act of 1543, the next heir to the throne was Princess Mary, the Catholic daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Northumberland might well tremble for the future. For a moment he thought of substituting Elizabeth for her half sister, but Elizabeth, now aged nineteen and wise for her years, had no intention of committing herself to such an arrangement. A desperate scheme was evolved. The younger daughter of Henry VII had married the Duke of Suffolk, and their heirs had been named in Henry VIII's will as next in line of succession after his own children. The eldest grandchild in this Suffolk line was Lady Jane Grey, a girl of sixteen. Northumberland married this girl to his son, Guilford Dudley. Nothing remained but to effect a military coup when the young king died. But Princess Mary, now aged thirty-six, took care to avoid Northumberland's advances. When Edward fell ill she took refuge on the estates of the Duke of Norfolk, ignoring a summons to appear at her brother's deathbed. On July 6, 1553, Edward Vi expired, and Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed Queen in London. The only response to this announcement was gathering resistance, Northumberland was too much hated throughout the land. The common people flocked to Mary's support. The privy councillors and the city authorities swam with the tide. Northumberland was left without an ally. In August Mary entered London with Elizabeth at her side. Lady Jane and her husband were consigned to the tower. In vain Northumberland groveled. He asserted that he had always been a Catholic, with shattering effect on the Protestant party. But nothing could save him from an ignominious death. To one of his former associates he wrote, an old proverb there is, and that most true, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Oh that it would please her good grace to give me life, yea, the life of a dog. This may serve as his epitaph. The woman who now became queen was probably the most unhappy and unsuccessful of England's sovereigns. Mary Tudor, the only surviving child of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII, had been brought up in the early years of her father's reign with all the ceremony due to the heiress to the throne. She had been betrothed at different times to the heirs both of France and the Empire. As with her mother, religion dominated her being and Catherine's divorce and the break with Rome brought tragic and catastrophic change. Mary had been declared illegitimate by act of parliament, she was pressed to forsake her religion, and endured bitter conflicts between her duty to her father and her conscience. Her half-sister and half-brother overshadowed her at court. She had clung to her confessors and her chapel throughout the reign of Edward Vi, and was naturally feared by the ruling group of Protestant politicians in London. The Spanish blood in her was strong. She entered into close and confidential relations with Reynard, the imperial ambassador. Her accession portended a renewal of the Roman connection and a political alliance with the empire. We are assured that, except in matters of religion, Mary was by nature merciful. She certainly accepted the allegiance of the counselors who came meekly to her. The most adroit among them, William Cecil was to keep close to government circles throughout her reign, and great was to be his future under her successor. Princess Elizabeth smoothly ordered mass to be said in her household, and avoided communications with men under suspicion. Secure upon the throne, Mary proceeded to realize the wish of her life, the restoration of the Roman communion. In Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester, one of Norfolk's circle in the later years of Henry VIII, she found an able and ardent servant. The religious legislation of the Reformation Parliament was repealed. But one thing Mary could not do. She could not restore to the church the lands parceled out among the nobility. The Tudor magnates were willing to go to mass, but not to lose their new property. Even so there was trouble. Mary never realized that the common people, particularly in London, coupled Catholicism with foreign influence. They had indeed been taught to do so under Henry VIII, but the feeling was older than that. The English Bible and the English prayer book were in their hands, and there was a wide, if superficial, attachment to the Reformed faith. 
Protestant leaders fled to Geneva and the German Rhineland towns. There was rioting in the capital. Gardner's life was threatened. He wore a mail shirt throughout the day and was guarded by a hundred men at night. A dead dog was flung through the window of the Queen's chamber, a halter round its neck, its ears cropped, and bearing a label saying that all the priests in England should be hanged. The most urgent question was whom Mary should marry. The Commons supported an English candidate, Edward Courtney, Earl of Devon, a descendant of the House of York. But Mary's eyes were fixed overseas. Renard, envoy of the Emperor Charles V, worked fast, and she promised to wed the Emperor's son, the future Philip II of Spain. Sir Thomas Wyatt, son of the poet of Henrietta's reign. formed a plot to prevent the marriage by force, and Courtney gathered a conspiracy against her in the West. News of the Spanish bitter oil filtered through the court and reached the people. Ugly stories of the Inquisition and the coming of Spanish troops passed from mouth to mouth. The Commons came in deputation to beg the Queen not to violate the feelings of the nation. But Mary had all the obstinacy of the Tudors and none of their political sense. She was now on the threshold of her dreams, a Catholic England united in intimate alliance with the Catholic Empire of the Habsburgs. All eyes turned to Princess Elizabeth, in watchful retirement at Hatfield. The English succession was vital to the courts of Europe. The French ambassador, no A's, began to be active. The stakes were high. In the rivalry of Valois and Habsburg, which tormented Europe, England's support might mean victory or defeat. Elizabeth was suspected of turning for advice to the Frenchman. It was suggested that she might marry Courtney. But events began to move fast. In the West Courtney precipitated a rising. Soon after the Spanish match was proclaimed rebellion broke out yet again in southern England. Sir Thomas Wyatt raised his standard in Kent and marched slowly towards London, gathering men as he came. The capital was in alarm. The citizens went in fear of the sack of their houses. But Mary, bitter and disappointed with her people, and knowing she had failed to win their hearts, showed she was not afraid. If Wyatt entered the capital her ambitions as a Catholic queen were doomed. In a stirring speech at Guildhall she summoned the Londoners to her defence. There was division among the rebels. Wyatt was disappointed by Courtney, whose rising was a pitiable failure. The Kentish rebels hoped to force terms from the Queen, not to depose her. Straggled fighting took place in the streets, and the Queen's men cut up the intruders. Wyatt was executed. This sealed the fate of Lady Jane Grey and her husband. In February 1554 the two walked calmly to their death on Tower Hill. Elizabeth's life was now in great danger. Though Wyatt had exonerated her she was the only rival claimant to the throne and the Spaniards demanded her execution before their prince was committed to marrying the Queen. But Mary had shed blood enough and Renard could not persuade her to sign away the life of her half-sister. Every argument was used. He wrote to his master, Madame Elizabeth goes to date to the tower, pregnant, they say, for she is a light woman, as her mother was. With her dead and Courtney, there will be none left in this kingdom to dispute the crown or trouble the Queen. Elizabeth indeed had very little hope, and had determined to ask, like her mother, that she might be beheaded with the sword. But, fearlessly and passionately, she denied all disloyal dealings with Courtney or Wyatt. Perhaps Mary believed her. At any rate, after some months she was released and sent to Woodstock, where, in quiet and pious seclusion, she awaited the turn of fortune. As summer came, Philip sailed northwards across the seas. Mary journeyed to Winchester to greet her bridegroom. With all the pomp of 16th century royalty the marriage was solemnized in July 1554 according to the rites of the Catholic Church. Gardner was now dead, but a successor was found in the English Cardinal Reginald Pole. Pole had been in exile throughout the reign of Henry VIII, his family having been lopped and shorn in Henry's judicial murders. This representative of the Pope was not only a prince of the Church, but practically a prince of the blood, a second cousin of the queen and a grandson of false, fleeting, perjured Clarence. 
he was a zealous and austere Catholic, and now came as legate to take his place with Renard in the intimate councils of the Queen and enforce the conversion of the whole land. Mary had been forever odious in the minds of a Protestant nation as the bloody Queen who martyred her noblest subjects. Generations of Englishmen in childhood learnt the sombre tale of their sacrifice from Fox's Book of Martyrs, with its gruesome illustrations. These stories have become part of the common memory of the people, the famous scenes at Oxford in 1555, the faggots which consumed the Protestant bishops, Latimer and Ridley, the pitiful recantation and final heroic end in March 1556 of the frail, aged Archbishop, Cranmer. Their martyrdom rallied to the Protestant faith many who till now had shown indifference. These martyrs saw in vision that their deaths were not in vain, and, standing at the stake, pronounced immortal words. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, Latimer cried at the crackling of the flames. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace, in England as I trust shall never be put out. In vain the Queen strove to join English interests to those of the Spanish state. She had married to make England safe for Catholicism, and she had sacrificed what little personal happiness she could hope for to this dream. As the wife of the King of Spain, against the interests of her kingdom, and against the advice of prudent counsellors, among them Cardinal Pole, she allowed herself to be dragged into war with France, and Calais, the last possession of the English upon the continent, fell without resistance. This national disgrace, this loss of the symbol of the power and glory of medieval England, bit deep into the hearts of the people and into the conscience of the Queen. Hope of a child to secure Catholic succession was unfulfilled. Her unhappiness was hardly redeemed by one vision of accomplishment. Yet, unchronicled and without praise, her aim witnessed one modest achievement which has rarely received the attention of historians. Mary's ministers, during her brief reign, embarked upon a major task of retrenchment and reform, by the time of her death they had done much to purge the government of the corrupt extravagance of Northumberland's regime. Philip retired to the Netherlands and then to Spain, aloof and disappointed at the barrenness of the whole political scheme. Surrounded by disloyalty and discontent, Mary's health gave way. In November 1558 she died, and a few hours later, in Lambeth Palace, her coadjutor, Cardinal Pole, followed her. The tragic interlude of her aim was over. It had sealed the conversion of the English people to the Reformed faith. In its beginning the Protestant Reformation in Europe had been a local revolt against the abuses of an organization. But this motive was removed when after some years the Catholic Church set its house in order. What remained was the insurgence of the northern races against the entire apparatus of the Roman Church in so far as this seemed to conflict with the forward movement of the human mind. The Christian revelation could now be borne forward into ages that no longer required the moulds into which the barbaric conquerors of the ancient world had, necessarily and beneficently, been constrained after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Until the reign of Henry VIII there lay beneath the quarrels of the nobility, the conflicts between king and church, between the ruling classes and the people, a certain broad unity of acceptance. The evils and sorrows of the medieval ages had lasted so long that they seemed to be the inseparable conditions of existence in a world of woe. No one had novel remedies or even consolations to propose. With the Reformation there came a new influence, cutting to the very roots of English life stirring the souls of all classes to action or resistance, and raising standards for which great and small alike were prepared to suffer or inflict the worst extremities. The old framework, which, in spite of its many jars, had held together for centuries, was now torn by a division in which all other antagonisms of class and interest were henceforward to be ranged and ruled. Hitherto, amid their quarrels and tribulations, there had been one people and one system. Henceforward, for many generations to come, not only England but all the countries of Europe were to range themselves for or against the Protestant Reformation. The violence of this convulsion can hardly be measured by us today, and it followed in England a less destructive course than in Germany or France. 
This was because the issue came to a head at a comparatively early stage, and under the strong government of the Tudors. Nevertheless the doctrinal revolution enforced by Cranmer under Edward Vi, and the counter-revolution of Gardner, Pole, and their assistants under Mary, exposed our agitated islanders in one single decade to a frightful oscillation. Here were the citizens, the peasants, the whole mass of living beings who composed the nation, ordered in the name of King Edward VI to march along one path to salvation, and under Queen Mary to march back again in the opposite direction, and all who would not move on the first order or turn about on the second must prove their convictions, if necessary, at the gibbet or the stake. Thus was New England imposed on Old England, thus did Old England in terrible counterstroke resume a fleeting sway, and from all this agony there was to emerge under Queen Elizabeth a compromise between Old and New which, though it did not abate their warfare, so far confined its fury that it could not prove mortal to the unity and continuity of national society. Chapter 8 Good Queen Bess Elizabeth was 25 years old when, untried in the affairs of state, she succeeded her half-sister on November 17, 1558. It was England's good fortune that the new queen was endowed by inheritance and upbringing with a combination of very remarkable qualities. There could be no doubt who her father was. A commanding carriage, auburn hair, eloquence of speech, and natural dignity proclaimed her King Henry's daughter. Other similarities were soon observed, high courage in moments of crisis, a fiery and imperious resolution when defied, and an almost inexhaustible fund of physical energy. She enjoyed many of the same pastimes and accomplishments as the king had done, a passion for the chase, skill in archery and hawking, and in dancing and music. She could speak six languages, and was well read in Latin and Greek. As with her father and grandfather, a restless vitality led her hither and thither from mansion to mansion so that often none could tell where in a week's time she might be sleeping. A difficult childhood and a perilous adolescence had been Elizabeth's portion. At one stage in her father's lifetime she had been declared illegitimate and banished from court. During Mary's reign, when her life might have been forfeited by a false step, she had proved the value of caution and dissemblance. When to keep silence, how to bide her time and husband her resources were the lessons she learned from her youth. Many historians have accused her of vacillation and parsimony. Certainly these elements in her character were justly the despair of her advisers. The royal treasury however was never rich enough to finance all the adventurous projects surged upon her. Nor was it always unwise amid the turbulent currents of the age to put off making irrevocable decisions. The times demanded a politic, calculating devious spirit at the head of the state, and this Elizabeth possessed. She had, too, a high gift for picking able men to do the country's work. It came naturally to her to take the credit for their successes, while blaming them for all that went wrong. In quickness of mind the Queen was surpassed by few of her contemporaries, and many envoys to her court had good reason to acknowledge her liveliness of repartee. In temperament she was subject to fits of melancholy, which alternated with flamboyant merriment and convulsive rage. Always subtle of intellect, she was often brazen and even coarse in manners and expression. When angered she could box her treasurer's ears and throw her slipper in her secretary's face. She was outwardly very free in her more tender relations with the opposite sex, so that, in the words of an illustrious counsellor, one day she was greater than man, and the next less than woman. Nevertheless she had a capacity for inspiring devotion that is perhaps unparalleled among British sovereigns. There may be something grotesque to modernize in the flattery paid her by the court, but with her people she never went wrong. By instinct she knew how to earn popular acclaim. In a sense her relationship with her subjects was one long flirtation. She gave to her country the love that she never entirely reposed in any one man, and her people responded with a loyalty that almost amounted to worship. It is not for nothing that she has come down to history as good Queen Best. Few sovereigns ever succeeded to a more hazardous inheritance than she. England's link with Spain had brought the loss of Calais and the hostility of France. Tudor policy in Scotland had broken down. 
the old military danger of the Middle Ages, a Franco-Scottish alliance, again threatened. In the eyes of Catholic Europe Mary, the Queen of Scots, and wife of the Dauphin of France, who became King Francis II in 1559, had a better claim to the English throne than Elizabeth, and with the power of France behind her she stood a good chance of gaining it. Mary of Guise, the regent and queen mother of Scotland, pursued a pro-French and pro-Catholic policy, and in Edinburgh and Paris the Guises held the keys of power. Even before the death of Henry VIII England's finances had been growing desperate. English credit at Antwerp, the centre of the European money market, was so weak that the government had to pay 14% for its loans. The coinage, which had been debased yet further under Edward Vi, was now chaotic. England's only official ally, Spain suspected the new regime for religious reasons. This is how former clerk of the council under Edward Vi surveyed the scene when Elizabeth ascended the throne, the queen poor, the realm exhausted, the nobility poor and decayed. Want of good captains and soldiers. The people out of order. Justice not executed. All things dear. Excess in meat, drink, and apparel. Divisions among ourselves. Wars with France and Scotland. The French king bestriding the realm, having one foot in Calais and the other in Scotland. Steadfast enmity but no steadfast friendship abroad. Elizabeth had been brought up a Protestant. She was a paragon of the new learning. Around her had gathered some of the ablest Protestant minds, Matthew Parker, who was to be her Archbishop of Canterbury, Nicholas Bacon, whom she appointed Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, Roger Escombe, the foremost scholar of the day, and, most important of all, William Cecil, the adaptable civil servant who had already held office as secretary under Somerset and Northumberland. Of 16th century English statesman Cecil was undoubtedly the greatest. He possessed a consuming thirst for information about the affairs of the realm, and was to display immense industry in the business of office. Cautious good judgment marked all his actions. Elizabeth, with sure instinct, summoned him to her service. This judgment I have of you, she charged him, that you will not be corrupted by any manner of gifts, that you will be faithful to the state, and that, without respect to any private will, you will give me that counsel that you think best. It was a tremendous burden which the young queen imposed upon her first minister, then aged thirty-eight. Their close and daily collaboration was to last, in spite of shocks and jars, until Cecil's death, forty years later. Religious peace at home and safety from Scotland were the foremost needs of the realm. England became Protestant by law, Queen Mary's Catholic legislation was repealed, and the Sovereign was declared Supreme Governor of the English Church. But this was not the end of Elizabeth's difficulties. New ideas were in debate, not only on religious doctrine and church government, but on the very nature and foundations of political power. Ever since the days of Wycliffe in the 1380s they had been running in secret veins under the surface of society in England, a movement of resistance to the church order. With the Reformation the notion that it might be a duty to disobey the established order on the grounds of private conviction became for the first time since the conversion to Christianity of the Roman Empire the belief of great numbers. But so closely were church and state involved that disobedience to the one was a challenge to the other. The idea that a man should pick and choose for himself what doctrines he should adhere to was almost as alien to the mind of the age as the idea that he should select what laws he should obey and what magistrates he should respect. The most that could be allowed was that he should outwardly conform and think what he liked in silence. But in the great turmoil of Europe silence was impossible. Men talked, secretly to one another, openly in their writings, which were now printed in a thousand copies kindling excitement and curiosity wherever they were carried. Even if it were granted that affairs of state could only be lawfully debated by those called thereto, common men could still search the scriptures, and try the doctrines of the church, its government, its rites and ceremonies, by the words of the evangelist and apostles. It is at this point that the party known as the Puritans, who were to play so great a role in the next hundred years, first enter English history. 
democratic in theory and organization, intolerant in practice of all who differed from their views, the Puritans challenged the Queen's authority in church and state, and although she sought for freedom of conscience and could maintain with sincerity that she made no windows into men's souls, she dared not let them organize cells in the body religious or the body politic. A discordant and vigorous minority could rupture the delicate harmony that she was patiently weaving. Protestantism must be saved from its friends. She saw in practical terms what her successor, James I, expounded in theory no bishop, no king, and she realized that unless the government controlled the church, it would be too weak to survive the Counter Reformation now gathering head in Catholic Europe. So Elizabeth had soon to confront not only the Catholic danger from abroad, but Puritan attack at home, led by fanatical exiles of Mary's reign who now streamed back from Geneva and from the Rhineland towns. Nevertheless, the Reformation in Europe took on a new aspect when it came to England. All the novel questions agitating the world, the relation of the National Church to Rome on one side and to the national sovereign on the other, its future organization, its articles of religion, the disposal of its property, and the property of its monasteries, could only be determined in Parliament, where the Puritans soon formed a growing and outspoken opposition. The gentry in Parliament were themselves divided. On two points alone perhaps were they heartily in accord, once they had got their share of abbey lands they did not mean to part with them, and anything was better than having the Wars of the Roses over again. Otherwise they fell into two great divisions those who thought things had gone far enough, and those who wanted to go a step farther. It was the future distinction of Cavalier and Puritan, Churchman and Dissenter, Tory and Whig. But for a long time it was subdued by common horror of a disputed succession and a civil war, and by the rule that only the Crown could initiate policy and public legislation. The immediate threat lay north of the border. French troops supported the French Queen Mother in Scotland. A powerful Puritan party among the Scottish nobility, abetted by the persecuted preachers, were in arms against them, while John Knox raised his harsh voice against foreign rule and from exile in Geneva poured forth his denunciations of the monstrous regiment of women. He meant of course that rule by women seemed to him unnatural. Elizabeth watched these doings with interest and anxiety. If the French party got control of Scotland their next move would be against her throne. Wanted money forbade a major military effort, but the fleet was sent to blockade the Scottish ports and prevent reinforcements arriving from France. Arms and supplies were smuggled across the border to the Protestant party. Knox was permitted to return to his native land by way of England, and his preachings had a powerful effect. A small English army intervened on the Scottish Protestant side, and at this moment Mary of Guise died. Elizabeth's efforts had been modest, but they prevailed. By the Treaty of Leith in 1560 the Protestant cause in Scotland was assured forever. France herself now plunged into religious strife, and was obliged at the same time to concentrate her forces against the Habsburg Empire. Elizabeth gained the respite and could look squarely to the future. One thing seemed certain to all contemporaries. The security of the English state depended in the last resort on an assured succession. The delicate question of the Queen's marriage began to throw its shadow across the political scene, and it is in her attitude to this challenge that the strength and subtleties of Elizabeth's character are revealed. The country was well aware of the responsibility which lay upon her. If she married an Englishman her authority might be weakened, and there would be fighting among the suitors. The perils of such a course were borne in on her as she watched the reactions of her court to her long and deep affection for the handsome, ambitious Robert Dudley, a younger son of Northumberland, whom she made Earl of Leicester. This was no way out. During the first months of her reign she had also to consider the claims of her brother-in-law, Philip II of Spain. A Spanish marriage had brought disaster to her sister, but marriage to Philip might by a powerful friend, refusal might drive his religious animosity into the open. But by 1560 she had achieved a temporary security and could wait her time. Marriage into one of the reigning houses of Europe would mean entangling herself in its European policy and facing the hostility of her husband's rivals. 
in vain the houses of parliament beg their virgin queen to marry and produce an heir. Elizabeth was angry. She would admit no discussion. Her policy was to spend her life in saving her people from such a commitment, and using her potential value as a match to divide a European combination against her. Meanwhile there was Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots. Her young husband, King Francis II, had died shortly after his accession, and in December 1560 she returned to her own kingdom. Her mother's uncles, the Guises, soon lost their influence at the French court, and her mother-in-law, Catherine de' Medici, replaced them as regent for King Charles IX. Thus in the last half of the 16th century women for a time controlled three countries, France, England, and Scotland. But of the three only the grip of Elizabeth held firm. Mary Stuart was a very different personality from Elizabeth, though in some ways her position was similar. She was a descendant of Henry VII, she held a throne, she lived in an age when it was a novelty for a woman to be the head of a state, and she was now unmarried. Her presence in Scotland disturbed the delicate balance which Elizabeth had achieved by the Treaty of Leith. The Catholic English nobility, particularly in the North, were not indifferent to Mary's claims. Some of them dreamed of winning her hand. But Elizabeth knew her rival. She knew that Mary was incapable of separating her emotions from her politics. The Queen of Scots lacked the vigilant self-control which Elizabeth had learnt in the bitter years of childhood. Mary's marriage points the contrast between the two sovereigns. Elizabeth had seen and avoided the danger of choosing a husband from her court. Mary had only been a few years in Scotland when she married her cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Dunley, a weak, conceited youth who had both Tudor and Stuart blood in his veins. The result was disaster. The old feudal factions, now sharpened by religious conflict, seized Scotland in their grip. Mary's power melted slowly and steadily away. Favourites brought from the cultured French court to cheer her in this grim land were unpopular, and one of them, David Riccio, was killed before her eyes. Her husband became a tool of her opponents. In desperation she connived at his murder, and in 1567 married his murderer, a warlike border lord, James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell, whose unruly sword might yet save her throne and her happiness. But defeat and imprisonment followed, and in 1568 she escaped into England and threw herself upon the mercy of the waiting Elizabeth. Mary in England proved even more dangerous than Mary in Scotland. She became the focus of plots and conspiracies against Elizabeth's life. The survival of Protestant England was menaced by her existence. Secret emissaries of Spain crept into the country to nourish rebellion and claim the allegiance of Elizabeth's Catholic subjects. The whole force of the Counter Reformation was unloosed against the one united Protestant country in Europe. If England were destroyed, it seemed that Protestantism could be stamped out in every other land. Assassination was to be the first step. But Elizabeth was well served. Francis Walsingham, Cecil's assistant and later his rival in the government, tracked down Spanish agents and English traitors. This subtle intellectual and ardent Protestant, who had remained abroad throughout the reign of Mary Tudor, and whose knowledge of European politics surpassed that of anyone else in Elizabeth's council, created the best secret service of any government of the time. But there was always a chance that someone would slip through, there was always a danger so long as Mary lived that public discontent or private ambition would use her and her claims to destroy Elizabeth. In 1569 the threat became a reality. In the north of England society was much more primitive than in the fertile south. Proud, independent, semi-feudal nobles now felt themselves threatened not only by Elizabeth's authority but by a host of new gentry like the Cecils and the Bacons, enriched by the dissolution of the monasteries and hungry for political power. Moreover, there was a deep religious division between North and South. The South was largely Protestant, the North remained dominantly Catholic. In the bleak, barren dales the monasteries had been the centre of communal life and charity. 
their destruction had provoked the pilgrimage of grace against Henry VIII, and still incited a stubborn and passive resistance to the religious changes of Elizabeth. The idea was now advanced that Mary should marry the Duke of Norfolk, senior of the pre Tudor nobility, and his somewhat feeble head was turned at the prospect of gambling for a throne. He repented in time. But in 1569 the earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland led a rising in the north. Mary was confined at Tutbury in the care of Lord Hunsdon, Elizabeth's soldier cousin on the Boleyn side, a trustworthy servant throughout her reign, and one of her few relations. Before the rebels could seize many she was conveyed hurriedly southwards. Elizabeth was slow to realize the danger. The earls, she said, were old in blood but poor in force. The rebels planned to hold the north of England and wait to be attacked. They were far from sure of each other. In the south the Catholic lords made no move. There seems to have been no common plan of action, and the rebel force scattered into small parties in the northern hills. Ignominiously they dribbled across the border to safety, and the first act of the widespread Catholic conspiracy against Elizabeth was over. After twelve years of very patient rule she was unchallenged Queen of all England. Rome was prompt to retaliate. In February 1570 Pope Pius V, a former Inquisitor General, issued a bull of excommunication against Elizabeth. From this moment Spain, as head of Catholic Europe, was supplied with a spiritual weapon should the need for attack arise. Elizabeth's position was weakened. Parliament became increasingly agitated at the spinsterhood of their Queen, and their constant petitioning irritated her into action. She entered into negotiations with Catherine de' Medici, and a political alliance was concluded at Blois in April 1572. Both women distrusted the Spanish power, since Catherine realized that Catholic France had as much to fear from Spain as Protestant England. For a short time events ran with Elizabeth. Spain's weakness centered in the Netherlands, where a robust population with immense taxable resources had long fretted under Philip's rule. The whole territory was on the edge of rebellion, and the treaty was hardly signed when the famous Dutch resistors of tyranny, who were known as the Sea Beggars, seized the town of Brill, and the Low Countries blazed into revolt. Elizabeth now had a potential new ally on the continent. She even thought of marrying one of Queen Catherine's younger sons, on condition that France did not take advantage of the turmoil to expand into the Netherlands but a terrible event in Paris dashed such prospects. By a sudden massacre of the Huguenots on the eve of the Feast of St. Bartholomew, August 23, 1572, the Guises, pro-Spanish and ultra-Catholic, recaptured the political power they had lost ten years earlier. Feeling ran high in London. The English ambassador, Francis Walsingham, was recalled. When the French ambassador came to explain away the event Elizabeth and her court, clothed all in black, received him in silence. Having thus done her duty as a Protestant queen, Elizabeth stood godmother to the French king's baby and continued her matrimonial negotiations with his brother. Her alliance with the French court however had clearly failed and Elizabeth was now driven to giving secret subsidies and support to the French Huguenots and the Dutch. Success depended on the most accurate timing, as her funds were very limited and she could seldom afford to help except when the rebels were on the edge of disaster. Walsingham, now Secretary of State, and second only to Cecil in the Queen's Council, was far from content. Exile in Mary's reign and service as ambassador in Paris had convinced him that Protestantism would only survive in Europe if England gave it unlimited encouragement and aid. In the long run there could be no compromise with the Catholics. Sooner or later war would come, and he urged that everything should be done to preserve and secure potential allies before the final clash. Opposed to all this was Cecil, now Lord Burghley. Friendship with Spain, symbolized in the marriage of Catherine of Aragon and nourished by commercial interests, had been a Tudor tradition since the days of Henry VII and good relations with the power that still controlled a large part of the Netherlands could alone preserve the great market for English wool and cloth. Queen Mary's marriage with Philip had been widely unpopular in England, 
but in Burghley's view this was no time to go to the opposite extreme and intervene in the Netherlands on the side of Philip's rebels. Such a step would inflame the Puritan extremists and inject a dangerous fanaticism into foreign policy. When Burghley became Lord Treasurer in 1572 his attitude hardened. Aware of the slender resources of the state, deeply concerned for the loss of trade with Spain and the Netherlands, he maintained that Walsingham's policy would founder in bankruptcy and disaster. Elizabeth was inclined to agree. She did not much like assisting other people's rebels, you and your brethren in Christ, she once said mockingly to Walsingham. She was unsympathetic to irreconcilable Puritanism. But Walsingham's case had been violently strengthened by the massacre of St. Bartholomew, and she was compelled to move into a cold war in the Netherlands, and an undeclared war at sea, until she was confronted with the massive onslaught of an armada. These happenings had their effect on politics in England. Most of the Puritans had at first been willing to conform to Elizabeth's church settlement in the hope of transforming it from within, but they now strove to drive the government into an aggressive Protestant foreign policy, and at the same time secure their own freedom of religious organization. Their position in the country was strong. They had allies at court and council, like Walsingham, with whom the Queen's favorite, Leicester, was now closely associated. In the towns and counties of southeastern England they were vociferous. In defiance of the church settlement they began to form their own religious communities, with their own ministers and forms of worship. Their aim and object was nothing less than the establishment of a theocratic despotism. Like the Catholics they held that church and state were separate and independent. Unlike them, they believed the seat of church authority lay in the council of elders, the presbytery freely chosen by the flock, but, once chosen, ruling with unlimited scope and supplanting the secular power over a large area of human life. To such men the Elizabethan settlement, the Anglican Church, with its historic liturgy and ceremonial, its comprehensive articles and its episcopal government, were abhorrent because unscriptural, as Galvin interpreted scripture. It had indeed some of the weaknesses of a compromise. Moreover, Outside London, the universities, and a few great towns, the average parson in the early years of Elizabeth's reign was not an impressive figure. Sometimes he had kept his benefice by conforming under Edward Vi, changing his creed under Mary, and finally accepting what a rural bench once described as the religion set forth by Her Majesty as the only way of earning a living. With barely enough Latin to read the old service books, and scarcely literate enough to deliver a decent sermon, he was no match for the controversialists and disputants charged with enthusiasm and new ideas, eloquent preachers, scurrilous pamphleteers, who were stealing his flock from him, and implanting in them novel and alarming notions about the rights of congregations to organize themselves, to worship in their own way, and to settle their own church order. And why not, some day, their own political order? if not in England, perhaps in another land? A crack was opening in the surface of English society, a crack which would widen into a gulf. The Lutheran church fitted well enough with monarchy, even with absolutism, but Calvinism, as it spread out over Europe, was a dissolving agency, a violent interruption of historic continuity and with the return and resurgence of the exiles who had fled from Mary Tudor an explosive element was lodged in the English church and state which ultimately was to shatter both. Elizabeth knew that the Puritans were perhaps her most loyal subjects, but she feared that their violent impulse might not only provoke the European conflict she dreaded, but imperil the very unity of the realm. Neither she nor her government dared yield a fraction of their authority. This was no time for religious war or upheaval at home. Elizabeth's council therefore struck back. The censorship of the press was entrusted to a body of ecclesiastical commissioners, known as the Court of High Commission, which had been constituted in 1559 to deal with offences against the church settlement. This combining of the functions of bishop and censor infuriated the Puritan party. They set up a secret itinerant press which poured forth over the years a stream of virulent and anonymous pamphlets, culminating in 1588 with those issued under the name of Martin Marprelate, 
attacking the persons and office of the wainscot-faced bishops. Their sturdy and youthful invective shows a robust and relishing consciousness of the possibilities of English prose. The pamphlets are loaded with coarse, effective adjectives, and the sentences lumber along like the hay cart in which the press itself was at one time concealed. For months the agents of High Commission hunted the originators of this secret propaganda. In the end an accident precipitated the press out of the hay cart in a village street and led to the arrest of the printers. The authors were never traced. The Catholic onslaught also gathered force. Throughout the 1570s, numbers of Catholic priests were arriving in England from the English seminaries at Wyand Street, Omer, charged with the task of nourishing Catholic sentiment and maintaining connection between the English Catholics and Rome. Their presence at first aroused little apprehension in government circles. Elizabeth was slow to believe that any of her Catholic subjects were traitors, and the failure of the 1569 Rising had strengthened her confidence in their loyalty. But about the year 1579 missionaries of a new and formidable type began to slip into the country. These were the Jesuits, the heralds and missionaries of the Counter-Reformation. Their lives were dedicated to re-establishing the Catholic faith throughout Christendom. They were fanatics, indifferent to personal danger, and carefully chosen for their work. By their enemies they were accused of using assassination to achieve their aims. Foremost among them were Edmund Campion and Robert Parsons. Their movements were carefully watched by Walsingham's spies, and a number of plots against Elizabeth's life were uncovered. The government was forced to take more drastic measures. Queen Mary had burnt some 300 Protestant martyrs in the last three years of her reign. In the last 30 years of Elizabeth's reign about the same number of Catholics were executed for treason. The conspiracies naturally focused upon the person of Mary Queen of Scots, long captive. She was the heir to the English throne in the event of Elizabeth's removal from the world. Elizabeth herself was reluctant to recognize the danger to her life. Yet the plots sharpened the question of who should succeed to the English throne. The death of Mary would make her son James the heir to the crown of England, and James was in safe Calvinist hands in Scotland. To avoid having another Catholic queen it was only necessary to dispose of Mary before the Jesuits, or their allies, disposed of Elizabeth. Walsingham and his party in the council now concentrated their efforts on persuading the queen that Mary must die. Plying her with evidence of Mary's complicity in the numerous conspiracies, they pressed hard on Elizabeth's conscience, but she shrank from the calculated shedding of royal blood. There were signs that the Jesuit missions were not entirely without result. But Elizabeth would not be hurried. She would wait upon events. They were soon decisive. In the midsummer of 1584, William the Silent, leader of the Dutch Protestant revolt against Spain, was fatally wounded by a Spanish agent in his house at Delft. Walsingham's arguments against Mary were overwhelmingly strengthened by this assassination, and English opinion reacted vehemently. At the same time Spanish feeling against England, already embittered by the raids conducted with Elizabeth's connivance of the English privateers, blazed into startling hostility. The Netherlands, once Spanish order had been restored, were to be a base for a final attack upon the island, and Elizabeth was compelled to send Leicester with an English army to Holland to prevent the complete destruction of the Dutch. A voluntary association of Protestant gentry was formed in 1585 for the defence of Elizabeth's life. In the following year, evidence of a conspiracy, engineered by one Anthony Barbington, an English Catholic, was laid before the council by Walsingham. One of his agents had mingled with the conspirators for over a year. Mary's connivance was undeniable. Elizabeth was at last persuaded that her death was a political necessity. After a formal trial Mary was pronounced guilty of treason. Parliament petitioned for her execution, and Elizabeth at last signed the death warrant. Within 24 hours she regretted it and tried, too late, to stop the execution. She had a natural horror of being responsible for the judicial murder of a fellow sovereign, although she knew it was essential for the safety of her country. 
she was anxious that the supreme and final decision should not rest upon her. The scene of Mary's death has caught the imagination of history. In the early morning of February 8, 1587, she was summoned to the great hall of Fotheringay Castle. Accompanied by six of her attendants, she awaited the servants of the English Queen. From the neighboring countryside the gentry gathered to witness the sentence. Mary appeared at the appointed hour soberly clad in black satin. In the quietness of the hall she walked with stately movements to the cloth-covered scaffold erected by the fireplace. The solemn formalities were smoothly completed. But the zealous dean of Peterborough attempted to force upon the Queen the last-minute conversion. With splendid dignity she brushed aside his loud exhortations. Mr. Dean, she said, I am a Catholic, and must die a Catholic. It is useless to attempt to move me, and your prayers will avail me but little. Mary had arrayed herself superbly for the final scene. As she disrobed for the headsman's act, her garments of black satin, removed by the weeping handmaids, revealed a bodice and petticoat of crimson velvet. One of her ladies handed her a pair of crimson sleeves, which she put on. Thus the unhappy queen halted, for one last moment, standing blood red from head to foot against the black background of the scaffold. There was a deathly hush throughout the hall. She knelt, and at the second stroke the final blow was delivered. The awed assembly had fulfilled its task. In death the majestic illusion was shattered. The head of an aging woman with false hair was held up by the executioner. A lapdog crept out from beneath the clothes of the bleeding trunk. As the news reached London, bonfires were lit in the streets. Elizabeth sat alone in her room, weeping more for the fate of a queen than a woman. The responsibility for this deed she shifted with an effort onto the shoulders of her masculine advisers. Chapter 9 The Spanish Armada War was now certain. The chances were heavily weighted in favor of Spain. From the mines of Mexico and Peru there came a stream of silver and gold which so fortified the material power of the Spanish Empire that King Philip could equip his forces beyond all known scales. The position was well understood in the ruling circles of England. So long as Spain controlled the wealth of the New World she could launch and equip a multitude of armadas, the treasure must therefore be arrested at its source or captured from the ships which conveyed it across the oceans. In the hope of strengthening her own finances and harassing the enemy's preparations against the Netherlands and ultimately against herself, Elizabeth had accordingly sanctioned a number of unofficial expeditions against the Spanish coasts and colonies in South America. These had continued for some time, and as yet without open declaration of war, but she had come to realize that scattered raids of which she professed no prior knowledge could do no lasting harm to the Spanish Empire beyond the seas or the Spanish power in northern Europe. Gradually therefore these expeditions had assumed an official character, and the Royal Navy surviving from the days of Henry VIII was rebuilt and reorganized by John Hawkins, son of a Plymouth merchant, who had formerly traded with the Portuguese possessions in Brazil. Hawkins had learned his seamanship in slave running on the West African coast and in shipping Negroes to the Spanish colonies. In 1573 he was appointed treasurer and controller of the navy. He had moreover educated an apt pupil, a young adventurer from Devon, Francis Drake. This master thief of the unknown world, as his Spanish contemporaries called Drake, became the terror of their ports and crews. His avowed object was to force England into open conflict with Spain, and his attacks on the Spanish treasure ships, his plundering of Spanish possessions on the western coast of the South American continent on his voyage round the world in 1577, and raids on Spanish harbors in Europe, all played their part in driving Spain to war. From their experiences on the Spanish main the English seamen knew they could meet the challenge so long as reasonable equality was maintained. With the ships that Hawkins had built they could fight and sink anything the Spaniards might send against them. Meanwhile Elizabeth's seamen had been gaining experience in unexplored waters. Spain was deliberately blocking the commercial enterprise of other nations in the New World so far as it was then known. A Devon gentleman, Humphrey Gilbert, began to look elsewhere, and was the first to interest the Queen in finding a route to China, 
or Cathay as it was called, by the Northwest. He was a well read man who had studied the achievements of contemporary explorers. He knew there were plenty of adventurers schooled in the straggling fighting in France and in the Netherlands on whose services he could call. In 1576 he wrote a discourse to prove a passage by the Northwest to Qatar and the East Indies. His book closed with a notable challenge, he is not worthy to live at all, that for fear or danger of death shunneth his country's service and his own honor, seeing death is inevitable and the fame of virtue is immortal. His ideas inspired the voyages of Martin Frobisher, to whom the Queen granted a license to explore. The court and the city financed the expedition, and two small ships of 25 tons sailed in search of gold. Having charted the bleak coasts round Hudson Straits Frobisher came back. High hopes were entertained that the samples of black ore he brought with him might contain gold. There was disappointment when the ore was assayed and proved worthless. No quick riches were to be gained from adventures in the northwest. Gilbert however was undaunted. He was the first Englishman who realized that the value of these voyages did not lie only in finding precious metals. There were too many people in England. Perhaps they could settle in the new lands. The idea of planting colonies in America now began to take hold of men's imaginations. A few bold spirits were already dreaming of New England's that would arise across the ocean. At first they had strictly practical aims in mind. In the hope of transporting the needy unemployed to the New World, and of finding new markets among the natives for English cloth, Gilbert himself obtained a charter from Elizabeth in 1578, to inhabit and possess at his choice all armed and heathen lands not in the actual possession of any Christian peoples. With eleven ships manned by many gentlemen adventurers, including his own stepbrother, Walter Raleigh, of whom more hereafter, he made several hopeful voyages, but none met with success. In 1583, Gilbert took possession of Newfoundland in the Queen's name, but no permanent settlement was made. Resolved to try again in the following year, he set out for home. The little convoy encountered terrible seas, breaking short and high pyramid wise. A narrative written by one Edward Hayes survives. Monday, the 9th September, in the afternoon, the frigate was near castaway, oppressed by waves, yet at that time recovered, and giving forth signs of joy, the general, sitting abaft with a book in his hand, cried out to us in the hind so oft as we approached within hearing, We are as near to heaven by sea as by land. That night at twelve o'clock, the lights of Gilbert's ship, the squirrel, suddenly disappeared. The first great English pioneer of the West had gone to his death. Walter Raleigh tried to continue Gilbert's work. In 1585 a small colony was established on Roanoke Island, off the American continent, and christened Virginia in honor of the Queen. It was a vague term which came to include both the modern state and North Carolina. This venture also founded, as did a second attempt two years later. But by now the threat from Spain was looming large, and to meet it all endeavor was concentrated at home. Colonial efforts were postponed for another twenty years by the Spanish War. In national resources the struggle that broke out was desperately unequal, but the Queen's seamen had received an unrivaled training which was to prove England's salvation. The Spaniards had long contemplated an enterprise against England. They realized that English intervention threatened their attempts to reconquer the Netherlands and that unless England was overwhelmed the turmoil might continue indefinitely. Since the year 1585 they had been gathering information from many sources. English exiles sent lengthy reports to Madrid. Numerous agents supplied Philip with maps and statistics. The Spanish archives contain several draft plans for the invasion of England. Troops were not the difficulty. If order were maintained for a while in the Netherlands, an expeditionary force could be detached from the Spanish army. A corps was deemed sufficient. The building and assembly of a fleet was a more formidable undertaking. Most of the King of Spain's ships came from his Italian possessions and were built for use in the Mediterranean. They were unsuited to a voyage round the western coasts of Europe and up the Channel. 
The galleons constructed for the trade routes to the Spanish colonies in South America were too unwieldy. But in the year 1580 Philip II had annexed Portugal, and the Portuguese naval constructors had not been dominated by the Mediterranean. They had experimented with classes of ships for action in the South Atlantic, and Portuguese galleons therefore formed the basis of the fleet which was now concentrated in the harbour of Lisbon. Every available vessel was summoned into western Spanish waters, including even the privately owned galleons of the convoying force named the Indian Guard. Preparations were delayed for a year by Drake's famous raid on Cadiz in 1587. In this singeing of the King of Spain's beard a large quantity of stores and ships was destroyed. Nevertheless in May 1588 the armada was ready. A hundred and thirty ships were assembled, carrying 2,500 guns and more than 30,000 men, two-thirds of them soldiers. Twenty were galleons, forty-four were armed merchantmen, and eight were Mediterranean galleys. The rest were either small craft or unarmed transports. Their aim was to sail up the channel, embark the expeditionary corps of 16,000 veterans from the Netherlands under Alexander of Parma, and land it on the south coast of England. The renowned Spanish Admiral Santa Cruz was now dead, and the command was entrusted to the Duke of Medina Sidonia, who had many misgivings about the enterprise. His tactics followed the Mediterranean model of grappling with the enemy ships and gaining victory by boarding. His fleet was admirably equipped for carrying large numbers of men, it was strong in heavy short-range cannon, but weak in long-distance culverins, this was why the English kept out of range until the last battle. The seamen were few in proportion to the soldiers. These were recruited from the dregs of the Spanish population and commanded by army officers of noble families who had no experience of naval warfare. Many of the vessels were in bad repair, the provisions supplied under a corrupt system of private contract were insufficient and rotten, the drinking water leaked from butts of unseasoned wood. Their commander had no experience of war at sea and had begged the king to excuse him from so novel an adventure. The English plan was to gather a fleet in one of the southwestern ports, intercept the enemy at the western entrance to the channel, and concentrate troops in the southeast to meet Palmer's army from the Flemish shore. It was uncertain where the attack would fall, but the prevailing westerly winds made it likely that the armada would sail up the channel, join Palmer and force a landing on the Essex coast. The nation was united in the face of the Spanish preparations. Leading Catholics were interned in the Isle of Ely, but as a body their loyalty to the crown was unshaken. An army was assembled at Tilbury which reached 20,000 men, under the command of Lord Leicester. This, with the muster in the adjacent counties, constituted a force which should not be underrated, while the Armada was still off the coasts of England Queen Elizabeth reviewed the army at Tilbury and addressed them in these stirring words My loving people, who have been persuaded by some that are careful for our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes, for fear of treachery. But I assure you I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that, under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects, and therefore I am come amongst you, as you see, resolved, in the midst and heat of the battle, to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God, and for my kingdom, and for my people, my honour and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which, rather than any dishonour shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms, I myself will be your general, judge and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already for your forwardness you have deserved rewards and crowns, and we do assure you, in the word of a prince, they shall be duly paid you. Hawkins's work for the Navy was now to be tested. He had begun over the years to revise the design of English ships from his experience of buccaneering raids in colonial waters. The castles which towered above the galleon decks had been cut down, 
Keel's were deepened, and design was concentrated on seaworthiness and speed. Most notable of all, heavier long range guns were mounted. Cannon were traditionally deemed an ignoble arm, fit only for an opening salvo to a grappling fight, but Hawkins, with ships built to weather any seas, opposed hand to hand fighting and advocated battering the enemy from a distance with the new guns. The English sea captains were eager to try these novel tactics against the huge overmasted enemy galleons, with their flat bottoms and a tendency to drift in a high wind. In spite of Hawkins's efforts only 34 of the Queen's ships, carrying 6,000 men, could put to sea in 1588. As was the custom however all available privately owned vessels were hastily collected and armed for the service of the government, and a total of 197 ships was mustered, but at least half of them were too small to be of much service. The Queen had urged her seamen to keep an eye upon Palmer, and she was nervous of sending the main fleet as far west as Plymouth. Drake was for bolder measures. In a dispatch of March 30, 1588, he proposed sending the main body to attack a port on the Spanish coast, not Lisbon, which was well fortified, but somewhere nearby, so as to force the Armada to sea in defense of the coastline. Thus, it was argued, the English would be certain of engaging the Spanish fleet and there would be no danger of its slipping past them on a favorable wind into the channel. The government preferred the much more perilous idea of stationing isolated squadrons at intervals along the south coast to meet all possible lines of attack. They insisted on concentrating a small squadron of the Queen's ships at the eastern end of the channel to keep watch on Palmer. Drake and his superior, Lord Howard of Effingham, the commander of the English fleet, were alarmed and impatient, and with the greatest difficulty prevented a further dispersion of their forces. A southerly gale stopped their attacking the Spanish coast, and they were driven into Plymouth with their supplies exhausted and scurvy raging through the ships. In the event they had plenty of time to consider their strategy. The Armada left the Tigus on May 20, but was smitten by the same storms which had repulsed Howard and Drake. Two of their 1,000-ton ships were dismasted. They put in to refit at Coroner, and did not set sail again until July 12. News of their approach off the Lizard was brought into Plymouth Harbour on the evening of July 19. The English fleet had to put out of the Sound the same night against light adverse winds which freshened the following day. A sober nautical account of the operation is preserved in Howard's letter to Walsingham of July 21. Although the wind was very scant we first warped out of harbour that night, and upon Saturday turned out very hardly, the wind being at southwest, and about three o'clock of the afternoon described the Spanish fleet, and did what we could to work for the wind, which, by this, morning we had recovered, descrying their fleet to consist of 120 sail whereof there are four galleases, galleys, and many ships of great burden. At nine of the clock we gave them fight, which continued until 1.1 if Medina Sidonia had attacked the English vessels to leeward of his ships as they struggled to clear the land on the Saturday there would have been a disaster for the English. But his instructions bound him to sail up the channel, unite with Palmer, and help transport to England the veteran troops assembled near Dunkirk. His report to Madrid shows how little he realized his opportunity. By difficult, patient, precarious tacking the English fleet got to windward of him, and for nine days hung upon the armada as it ran before the westerly wind up the channel, pounding away with their long-range guns at the lumbering galleons. They had gained the weather gauge. On July 23 the wind sank and both fleets lay becalmed off Portland Bill. The Spaniards attempted a counter-attack with Neapolitan galleys, rowed by hundreds of slaves, but Drake, followed by Howard, swept in upon the main body, and, as Howard reported, the Spaniards were forced to give way and flock together like sheep. A further engagement followed on the 25th off the Isle of Wight. It looked as if the Spaniards planned to seize the island as a base. But as the westerly breeze blew stronger the English still lay to windward and drove them once more to sea in the direction of Calais, where Medina, ignorant of Palmer's movements, 
hope to collect news. The channel passage was a torment to the Spaniards. The guns of the English ships raked the decks of the galleons, killing the crews and demoralizing the soldiers. The English suffered hardly any loss. Medina then made a fatal mistake. He anchored in Calais Roads. The Queen's ships which had been stationed in the eastern end of the channel joined the main fleet in the straits, and the whole sea power of England was now combined. A council of war held in the English flagship during the evening of July 28 resolved to attack. The decisive engagement opened. After darkness had fallen eight ships from the eastern squadron which had been filled with explosives and prepared as fire ships, the torpedoes of those days, were sent against the crowded Spanish fleet at anchor in the roads. Lying on their decks, the Spanish crews must have seen unusual lights creeping along the decks of strange vessels moving towards them. Suddenly a series of explosions shook the air, and flaming hulks drifted towards the anchored armada. The Spanish captains cut their cables and made for the open sea. Collisions without number followed. One of the largest galleys, the San Lorenzo, lost its rudder and drifted aground in Calais Harbour, where the governor interned the crew. The rest of the fleet, with a south-southwest wind behind it, made eastwards to Gravelines. Medina now sent messengers to Palmer announcing his arrival, and by dawn on July 29 he was off the sandbanks of Gravelines expecting to find Palmer's troops ready shipped in their transports. But there was no sail to be seen. The tides in Dunkirk Harbour were at the neap. It was only possible to sail out with a favourable wind upon a spring tide. Neither condition was present. The army and the transports were not at their rendezvous. The Spaniards turned to face their pursuers. A desperate fight raged for eight hours, a confused conflict of ships engaging at close quarters. The official report sent to the English government was brief. Howard in fight spoiled a great number of the Spaniards, sank three and drove four or five on the banks. The English had completely exhausted their ammunition, and but for this hardly a Spanish ship would have got away. Yet Howard himself scarcely realized the magnitude of his victory. Their force is wonderful great and strong, he wrote on the evening after the battle, yet we pluck their feathers by little and little. The tormented armada now sailed northwards out of the fight. Their one aim was to make for home. The horrors of the long voyage round the north of Scotland began. Not once did they turn upon the small, silent ships which followed them in their course. Neither side had enough ammunition. The homeward voyage of the armada proved the qualities of the Spanish seamen. Facing mountainous seas and racing tides, they escaped from their pursuers. The English ships, short of food and shot, their crews grumbling at their wretched outfits, were compelled to turn southwards to the channel ports. The weather helped the Spaniards. The westerly wind drove two of the galleons as wrecks upon the coast of Norway, but then it shifted. As Medina recorded, we passed the isles at the north of Scotland, and we are now sailing towards Spain with the wind at northeast. Sailing southwards. They were forced to make for the western coast of Ireland to replenish their supplies of water. They had already cast their horses and mules into the sea. The decision to put in on the Irish coast was disastrous. Their ships had been shattered by the English cannonades and now were struck by the autumn gales. Seventeen went ashore. The search for water cost more than five thousand Spanish lives. Nevertheless over sixty-five ships. About half of the fleet that had put to sea, reached Spanish ports during the month of October. The English had not lost a single ship, and scarcely a hundred men. But their captains were disappointed. For the last thirty years they had believed themselves superior to their opponents. They had now found themselves fighting a much bigger fleet than they had imagined the Spaniards could put to sea. Their own ships had been sparingly equipped. Their ammunition had run short at a crucial moment. The gunnery of the merchant vessels had proved poor and half the enemy's fleet had got away. There were no boastings, they recorded their dissatisfactions. But to the English people as a whole the defeat of the Armada came as a miracle. For thirty years the shadow of Spanish power had darkened the political scene. 
A wave of religious emotion filled men's minds. One of the medals struck to commemorate the victory bears the inscription of Flavit Dea Set Discipentia. God blew and they were scattered. Elizabeth and her seamen knew how true this was. The armada had indeed been bruised in battle, but it was demoralized and set on the run by the weather. Yet the event was decisive. The English seamen might well have triumphed. Though limited in supplies and ships the new tactics of Hawkins had brought success. The nation was transported with relief and pride. Shakespeare was writing King John a few years later. His words struck into the hearts of his audiences come the three corners of the world in arms, and we shall shock them. Nor shall make us rue if England to itself do rest but true. Chapter 10 Gloria Noith 1588 The crisis of the reign was past. England had merged from the Armada year as a first class power. She had resisted the weight of the mightiest empire that had been seen since Roman times. Her people awoke to a consciousness of their greatness, and the last years of Elizabeth's reign saw a welling up of national energy and enthusiasm focusing upon the person of the Queen. In the year following the Armada the first three books were published of Spencer's Fairy Queen, in which Elizabeth is hymned as Gloriana. Poets and courtiers alike paid their homage to the sovereign who symbolized the great achievement. Elizabeth had schooled a generation of Englishmen. The success of the seamen pointed the way to wide opportunities of winning wealth and fame in daring expeditions. In 1589, Richard Clatt first published his magnificent book, The Principal Navigations, Traffics and Discoveries of the English Nation. Here, in their own words, the audacious navigators tell their story. Clud speaks for the thrusting spirit of the age when he proclaims that the English nation, in searching the most opposite corners and quarters of the world, and, to speak plainly, encompassing the vast globe of the earth more than once, have excelled all the nations and peoples of the earth. Before the reign came to a close another significant enterprise took its beginning. For years past Englishmen had been probing their way through to the east round the Cape of Good Help and overland across the expanses of the Middle East. Their venturies led to the founding of the East India Company. At the start it was a small and struggling affair, with a capital of only £72,000. Dazzling dividends were to be won from this investment. The British Empire in India, which was to be painfully built up in the course of the next three centuries, owes its origins to the charter granted by Queen Elizabeth to a group of London merchants and financiers in the year 1600. The young men who now rose to prominence in the court of the aging Queen plagued their mistress to allow them to try their hand in many enterprises. The coming years resound with attacks upon the forces and allies of Spain throughout the world, expeditions to Cadiz, to the Azores, into the Caribbean Sea, to the Low Countries, and, in support of the Huguenots, to the northern coasts of France. The story is one of confused running fights, conducted with slender resources and culminating in a few great moments. The war against Spain, which had never been officially declared, extended its heavy burden into the first year of the reign of Elizabeth's successor. The policy of the English government was to distract the enemy in every quarter of the world and by subsidizing the Protestant elements in the Low Countries and in France to prevent any concentration of force against themselves. At the same time England intervened to prevent the Spaniards from seizing ports on the Norman and Breton coasts which might be used as bases for another invasion. As a result of these continued though rather meager efforts the slow victory of the Dutch in Holland and the Huguenots in France brought its reward. The eventual triumph of Henry of Navarre the Protestant champion and heir to the French throne, was due as much to his acceptance of the Catholic faith as to victories in the field. Paris, as he is supposed to have said, was worth a mass. His decision put an end to the French religious wars and removed the danger to England of a Spanish-backed monarch in Paris. The Dutch too were beginning to hold their own. The island was at last secured but there was no way of delivering a decisive stroke against Spain. The English government had no money for further efforts. The total revenues of the crown hardly exceeded £300,000 a year, 
including the fruits of taxation granted by Parliament. Out of this sum all expenses of court and government had to be met. The cost of defeating the Armada is reckoned to have mounted to £160,000 and the Netherlands expeditionary force at one stage was calling for £126,000 a year. The lights of enthusiasm slowly faded out. In 1595 Raleigh again tried his hand, this time in search of El Dorado in Guiana. But his expedition brought no profits home. At the same time Drake and the veteran Hawkins, now in his sixties, set out on a last voyage. Hawkins fell ill and as his fleet was anchoring off Puerto Rico he died in his cabin. Drake, cast down by the death of his old patron, sailed on to attack the rich city of Panama. With a dash of his former spirit he swept into the Bay of Nombre de Dios. But conditions were now very different. The early days had gone forever. Spanish government in the New World was now well equipped and well armed. The raid was beaten off. The English fleet put out to sea, and in January 1596 Francis Drake, having assumed his armor to meet death like a soldier, expired in his ship. John Stowe, a contemporary English chronicler, writes of him. He was as famous in Europe and America as Tamburlin in Asia and Africa. As the conflict with Spain drew inconclusively on, and both sides struck at each other in ever-growing, offensive exhaustion, the heroic age of sea fights passed away. One epic moment has survived in the annals of the English race. The last fight of the revenge at Flores, in the Azores. In the year 1591, says Bacon, was that memorable fight of an English ship called the Revenge, under the command of Sir Richard Grenville, memorable, I say, even beyond credit and to the height of some heroical fable, and though it were a defeat, yet it exceeded a victory, being like the act of Samson, that killed more men at his death, than he had done in the time of all his life. This ship, for the space of fifteen hours, sate like a stag amongst towns at bay, and was sieged and fought with, in turn, by fifteen great ships of Spain, part of a navy of fifty-five ships in all, the rest like a betters looking on afar off. And amongst the fifteen ships that fought, the great San Filippo was one, a ship of fifteen hundred ton, Prince of the Twelve Sea Apostles, which was right glad when she was shifted off from the Revenge. This brave ship the Revenge, being manned only with two hundred soldiers and marines, whereof eighty lay sick, yet nevertheless after a fight maintained, as was said, of fifteen hours, and two ships of the enemy sunk by her side, besides many more torn and battered and great slaughter of men, never came to be entered, but was taken by composition the enemies themselves having in admiration the virtue of the commander and the whole tragedy of that ship. It is well to remember the ordinary seamen who sailed in ships sometimes as small as twenty tons into the wastes of the North and South Atlantic, ill-fed and badly paid, on risky adventures backed by inadequate capital. These men faced death in many forms, death by disease, death by drowning, death from Spanish peaks and guns death by starvation and cold on uninhabited coasts, death in the Spanish prisons. The Admiral of the English fleet, Lord Howard of Effingham, spoke their epitaph, God send us to sea in such a company together again, when need is. Victory over Spain was the most shining achievement of Elizabeth's reign, but by no means the only one. The repulse of the Armada had subdued religious dissension at home. Events which had swung England towards Puritanism while the Catholic danger was impending swung her back to the Anglican settlement when the peril vanished in the smoke of the burning armada at Gravelines. A few months later, in a sermon at St. Paul's Cross, Richard Bancroft, who was later to be Archbishop of Canterbury, attacked the Puritan theme with the confidence of a man who was convinced that the Anglican Church was not a political contrivance, but a divine institution. He took the only line on which the defense of the church could be sustained with an enthusiasm equal to that of its assailants, it was not the religion set forth by Her Majesty, but the Church of the Apostles still subsisting by virtue of the episcopal succession. But Bancroft saw also that to maintain the cause a better type of clergy was needed, men of solid learning, 
and such he set himself to provide. If he had lived, Clarendon wrote a century later, he would quickly have extinguished all that fire in England which had been kindled at Geneva. But the fire was still dangerously smouldering when Elizabeth died. Nevertheless, the church she had nursed to strength was a very different body from the half hearted and distracted community of her early years, more confident, more learned, far less inclined to compromise with dissidents within or separatists without strong in the attachment of thousands to whom its liturgy had become dear by habit and who thought of it as the church into which they had been baptized. Their devotion to the Church of England as a sacred institution was as profound and sincere as the attachment of the Calvinist to his presbytery or the independent to his congregation. And, bitter as the coming divisions were to be, England united in prizing Elizabeth's service to her people and to religion. Queen Elizabeth of famous memory, Oliver Cromwell called her, and added, we need not be ashamed to call her so. And those whose memories went back to the dark years of disaster and persecution, who had seen the Spanish peril growing till it broke in ruins, could hardly fail to re-echo in their hearts the majestic utterance of Richard Hooker, author of the classic justification of the Elizabethan Church, of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. As, by the sword of God and Gideon, was sometime the cry of the people of Israel, he wrote, so it might deservedly be at this day the joyful song of innumerable multitudes, and the true inscription, style, or title of all churches yet standing within this realm, by the goodness of Almighty God and his servant Elizabeth, we are. By now the men who had governed England since the 1550s were passing from power and success to their graves. Leicester had died in the last days of 1588, Walsingham in 1590, and Burghley in 1598. The fifteen years which followed the Armada are dominated by other figures. War with Spain had set a premium on martial virtues. Young and ego men like Walter Raleigh and Robert de Verrux, Earl of Essex, quarrelled for permission to lead enterprises against the Spaniards. The Queen hesitated. She knew that the security she had striven for all her life was very fragile. She knew the danger of provoking the might of Spain, backed as it was by all the wealth of the Indies. She was growing old and out of touch with the younger generation, and her quarrel with Essex marked and revealed her changing mood. Essex was Leicester's stepson, and Leicester brought him into the circle of the court. He found the government in the hands of the cautious Cecils, William, Lord Burghley, and his son Robert. The Queen's favour had lighted upon the hard, handsome, and ambitious captain of the guard, Sir Walter Orley. Essex was the younger and the more fiery, and he soon displaced the captain in the affections of Elizabeth. He too was ambitious, and set out to create his own party in court and council and subdue the influence of the Cecils. He found support in the Bacon brothers, Antony and Francis, sons of the Lord Keeper, Nicholas Bacon, who had earlier in the reign been a colleague and brother-in-law of Burghley's. The young nephews were discontented with Burghley's lack of attention. They were dangerous enemies, and Essex was a convenient figurehead for thrusting a more forward policy upon the Queen. They had both served in the embassy in Paris, and, like Walsingham, had built up an admirable intelligence service. It was with their help that Essex became an expert on foreign affairs and showed the Queen that he had ability as well as charm. In 1593 he was made a privy councillor. Relations with Spain were again becoming tense. Essex soon headed the war party in the council, and once the old Lord Treasurer pulled a prayer book out of his pocket and, shaking a finger at his young opponent, read out the verse, Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. In 1596 an expedition was sent against Cadiz under the joint command of Essex and Raleigh. In the sea fight for the harbour Orley was the outstanding leader. The Spanish fleet was burned and the town lay open to the English crews. Essex was the hero of the shore fight. It was a brilliant combined operation, and Cadiz was held by the English for a fortnight. The fleet returned home triumphant, but, to Elizabeth's regret, little the richer. 
During its absence Robert Cecil had become Secretary of State. Victory at Cadiz heightened the popularity of Essex among the younger members of the court and throughout the country. The Queen received him graciously, but with secret misgiving. Was he the incarnation of the spirit of this new generation, whose rash eagerness she feared? Would the younger men look to him rather than to her as their leader? For the moment all went well. Essex was made master of the ordnance. He was given command of an expedition to intercept a further armada now gathering in the ports of western Spain. In the summer of 1597 it seemed that another enterprise of England was about to sail. The English ships headed southwest and made for the Azores. There was no sign of the great fleet whose passage they were to bar, but the islands made a convenient base where they could await the treasure ships from the New World. Raleigh too was in the expedition. The English failed to take any of the island ports, the Spanish treasure fleet eluded them. The armada put out into the Bay of Biscay with the seas clear of defending ships to the north. Once again the winds saved the island. The badly manned galleons tottered into a northern gale scattered and sinking. The disorganized fleet crept back into its ports. King Philip was kneeling in his chapel in the Escorial praying for his ships. Before the news of their return could reach him he was seized with a paralytic stroke, and the tale of their failure was brought to him on his deathbed. Essex came home to find a sovereign still vigorous and dominating. The muddle and quarrelling which had marred the Azores expedition enraged Elizabeth. She declared she would never send the fleet out of the channel again, and this time she kept her word. Essex retired from court, and thunderous days followed. Essex was sure he was misunderstood. There was a plaintive correspondence. Wild thoughts went surging through his mind. A little group gathered round him and schemed to force the son of the royal favour into the heavens again. Troubles in Ireland, which now came to a head, seemed to offer him the chance of recovering both the Queen's goodwill and his own prestige. Throughout the reign Ireland had presented an intractable problem. Henry VIII had assumed the title of King of Ireland, but this involved no real extension of his authority. Though Irish chiefs were given English titles, in the hope of converting them into magnates on the English pattern, they still clung to their ancient feuding clan life, and largely ignored the commands of the Lord Lieutenants in Dublin. The Counter-Reformation revived and reanimated opposition to Protestant England. For the Queen's government in London this meant strategic anxieties, since any power hostile to England could readily take advantage of Irish discontents. Able viceroys with small forces tried hard to impose order and respect for English law, and efforts were made to plant and colonize the country with reliable settlers. But these measures met with no striking success. In the first thirty years of Elizabeth's reign Ireland was shaken by three major rebellions. Now in the 1590s a fourth rising had erupted into a wearing and expensive war. With Spanish backing, Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, was threatening the whole English dominance of Ireland. If Essex became Lord Deputy and destroyed the rebellion he might recover his power in England. It was a perilous gamble. In April 1599 Essex was allowed to go to Ireland, at the head of the largest army that England had ever sent there. He accomplished nothing and was on the verge of ruin. But he planned a dramatic stroke. Disobeying the express orders of the Queen, he deserted his command and rode in haste to London unannounced. Robert Cecil had quietly waited for his rival to overreach himself. Angry scenes followed between Essex and the Queen and the Earl was confined to his house. Weeks dragged by, and a desperate plot was made by Essex and his younger companions, including Shakespeare's patron, the Earl of Southampton. There was to be a rising in the city, a concentration upon Whitehall, and a seizure of the Queen's person. To symbolize the result a new play, which culminated in a royal dethronement, was to be produced at Southwark, Shakespeare's Richard II the scheme failed and the end came in February 1601 with Essex's death on Tower Hill. Among the witnesses of the execution was Walter Raleigh. Silently Raleigh walked across to the door of the White Tower and climbed the stairway through the armory, to look down upon the block where he too, 
last of the Elizabethans, was to meet the same end. The young Earl of Southampton was spared. Elizabeth well understood the issues at stake. Essex had been not simply a courteous soliciting, and even fighting for, the affections of his queen. He was the leader of a bid for power by a faction of her court. Acutely aware of the queen's advancing years, he aimed to control the succession and to dominate the next sovereign. This was not yet an age of party politics, but of patronage and clientage. No fundamental principle divided Essex from Raleigh or the Bacons from Cecil. The spoils of office, power, and influence were at stake, and victorious Essex would have dispensed appointments throughout England, and perhaps even have dictated terms to the Queen. But long years of statesmanship served Elizabeth better than the driving ambition of a courtier half her age. She struck back, and in destroying Essex she saved England from the consumption of civil war. For the English cause in Ireland the flight of Essex proved a blessing. He was succeeded by Lord Mountjoy, a tenacious and energetic commander, who soon had the rebellion under control. When a Spanish force, some 4,000 strong, landed at Kinsale in 1601 they were too late. Mountjoy routed their Irish allies and compelled the Spaniards to surrender. Even Tyrone finally made his submission. Ireland had at last, though only temporarily, been conquered by English arms. If Essex challenged the political power of Elizabeth, more significant for the future was the challenge to her constitutional power in the Parliament of 1601. Throughout the reign, the weight and authority of Parliament had been steadily growing. Now the issue turned on monopolies. For some time the crown had eked out its slender income by various devices, including the granting of patents of monopolies to courtiers and others in return for payment. Some of these grants could be justified as protecting and encouraging inventions, but frequently they amounted merely to unjustified privileges, involving high prices that placed a burden upon every citizen. In 1601 grievances flared up into a full-dress debate in the House of Commons. An angry member read out a list extending from a patent for iron manufacture to a patent for drying pilchards. Is not bread there? shouted another backbencher. The uproar in the House brought a stinging rebuke from Mr. Secretary Cecil. What an indignity then is it, he exclaimed, that when any is discussing this point he should be cried and coughed down. This is more fit for a grammar school than a parliament. But the Queen preferred subtler methods. If the Commons pushed their proposals to a division the whole basis of her constitutional authority would be under fire. She acted swiftly now. Some monopolies were abolished forthwith. All, she promised, would be investigated. So she forestalled the direct challenge and in a golden speech to a large gathering of her commons summoned to her chamber she told them, Though God hath raised me high, yet this I account the glory of my crown, that I have reigned with your loves. It was to be her last appearance in their midst. The immense vitality displayed by the Queen throughout the troublous years of her rule in England ebbed slowly and relentlessly away. She lay for days upon a heap of cushions in her room. For hours the soundless agony was prolonged. The corridors without echoed with the hurrying of agitated feet. At last Robert Cecil dared to speak. Your Majesty, to content the people you must go to bed. Little man, came the answer, is must a word to use to princes? The old Archbishop of Canterbury, Whitgift, her little black husband, as she had once called him, knelt praying at her side. In the early hours of the morning of March 24, 1603, Queen Elizabeth died. Thus ended the Tudor dynasty. For over a hundred years, with a handful of bodyguards, they had maintained their sovereignty, kept the peace, baffled the diplomacy and onslaughts of Europe, and guided the country through changes which might well have wrecked it. Parliament was becoming a solid affair based on a working harmony between sovereign, lords, and commons and the traditions of English monarchical government had been restored and gloriously enhanced. But these achievements carried no guarantee of their perpetuation. The monarchy could only govern if it was popular. The crown was now to pass to an alien Scottish line, 
hostile in political instincts to the class which administered England. The good understanding with Parliament which the Tudors had nourished came to a fretful close. The new kings soon clashed with the forces of a growing nation, and out of this conflict came the civil war, the Republican interlude, the Restoration and the Revolution Settlement. Book I the Civil War Chapter 11 The United Crowns King James of Scotland was the only son of Mary Queen of Scots. He had been subjected from his youth to a rigid Calvinist upbringing which was not much to his taste. With little money and strict tutors he had long coveted the throne of England, but till the last moment the prize had seemed elusive. The struggle for power and favour between Essex and Robert Cecil might always have provoked Elizabeth, whom he knew only by intermittent correspondence, into some swift decision which would lose him the crown. But now all appeared settled. Cecil was his ally and skilful manager in the tense days after the Queen died. James was proclaimed King James I of England without opposition, and in April 1603 began a leisurely journey from Holyrood to London. He was a stranger and an alien, and his qualifications for governing England were yet to be tested. So ignorant, says Trevelyan, was James of England and her laws that at Newark he ordered a cut purse caught in the act to be hanged without a trial at a word from his royal mouth. The execution did not take place. James detested the political ideas of his Calvinist mentors. He had fixed ideas about kingship and the divine right of monarchs to rule. He was a scholar with pretensions to being a philosopher, and in the course of his life a published numerous tracts and treatises, ranging from denunciations of witchcraft and tobacco to abstract political theory. He came to England with a closed mind, and a weakness for lecturing. But England was changing. The habit of obedience to a dynasty had died with the last of the Tudors. Spain was no longer a threat, and the union of the crowns deprived foreign enemies of an ally, or even a foothold, in the island. The country gentlemen on whom the Tudors relied to maintain a balance against the old nobility, and on whom they had devolved the whole business of local government, were beginning to feel their strength. England was secure, free to attend to her own concerns and a powerful class was now eager to take a hand in their management. On the other hand, James's title to the crown was not impeccable, and the doctrine of divine right, originally devised to justify the existence of national sovereignties against a universal church or empire, was called in to fortify his position. But how to reconcile a king claiming to rule by divine right and a parliament with no other basis than ancient custom? Over these deep cutting issues the loomed a fiscal crisis of the first magnitude. The importation of precious metals from the New World had swelled the rise in prices, and throughout Europe inflation reigned, every year the fixed revenues of the crown were worth less and less. By extreme frugality Elizabeth had postponed a conflict. But it could not be averted, and bound up with it was a formidable constitutional problem who was to have the last word in the matter of taxation. Hitherto everyone had accepted the medieval doctrine that the king may not rule his people by other laws than they are sent unto, and therefore he may set upon them no imposition, that is, tax, without their assent. But no one had analyzed it, or traced out its implications in any detail. If this were the fundamental law of England, did it come from the mists of antiquity or from the indulgence of former kings? Was it the inalienable birthright of Englishmen, or a concession which might be revoked? Was the king beneath the law or was he not? And who was to say what the law was? The greater part of the seventeenth century was to be spent in trying to find answers, historical, legal, theoretical, and practical, to such questions. Lawyers, scholars, statesmen, soldiers, all joined in this great debate. Relief at an undisputed succession gave the new sovereign a loyal, and even enthusiastic, reception. But James and his subjects were soon at odds about this and other topics. His first parliament at once raised the question of parliamentary privilege and royal prerogative. In dutiful but firm language the commons drew up an apology reminding the king that their liberties included free elections, free speech, and freedom from arrest during parliamentary sessions. 
the prerogative of princes, they protested, may easily and daily grow, while the privileges of the subject are for the most part at an everlasting stand. The voice of the people, in the things of their knowledge is said to be as the voice of God. James, like his son after him, treated these expressions of national grievance contemptuously, brushing them aside as personal insults to himself and mere breaches of good manners. Hitherto James had been straightened, now he thought he was rich. The beggarly Scotsmen who had come south with him also enriched themselves. The expenses of the court increased at an alarming rate. To his surprise James very soon found himself pressed for money. This meant frequent parliaments. Frequent parliaments gave members the opportunity to organize themselves, and James neglected to control parliamentary sessions through his privy councillors, as Elizabeth had done. Robert Cecil, now Earl of Salisbury, had no direct contact with the Commons. The King indulged his taste for lecturing, and frequently reminded them of his divine right to rule and their solemn duty to supply his needs. It was an ancient and obstinate belief that the King should live of his own, and that the traditional revenues from the Crown lands and from the customs should suffice for the upkeep of the public services. Parliament normally voted customs duties to each monarch for life and did not expect to have to provide more money except in emergencies. To meet his needs James had to stress and revive the prerogative rights of taxation of the medieval kings, and he soon irritated a house which remembered its recent victory over Elizabeth upon monopolies. Fortunately the judges ruled that the ports were under the king's exclusive jurisdiction and that he could issue a book of rates that is, impose extra customs duties, as he thought fit. This gave James a revenue that, unlike the old feudal grants, rose with the increasing national wealth and the higher prices. The Commons questioned the judge's ruling, and James made matters worse by turning the argument into a technical one about royal prerogative. Here, but only for a time, the matter rested. The king had decided views on religion. He was greeted upon his accession with a petition from the Puritans whose organization Elizabeth had broken in the 1590s. The opponents of the Episcopal State Church now hoped that the new king from Calvinist Scotland would listen to their case, a milder party would have been satisfied with some modification of ceremony. But James had had enough of the Kirk. He realized that Calvinism and monarchy would quarrel in the long run and that if men could decide for themselves about religion they could also decide for themselves on politics. In 1604 he held a conference at Hampton Court between the Puritan leaders and those who accepted the Elizabethan system. His prejudice was soon manifest. In the middle of the debate he accused the Puritans of aiming at a Scottish presbytery which agreeth as well with the monarch as God and the devil. Then Jack and Tom and Will and Dick shall meet and at their pleasure censor me and my counsel and all our proceedings. Then Will shall stand up and say, It must be thus, then Dick shall reply and say, Nay, marry, but we will have it thus. Stay, I pray you, for once seven years before you demand that from me, and if then you find me Percy and fat, and my windpipes stuffed, I will perhaps hearken to you, for let that government be once up. I am sure I shall be kept in breath, then shall we all of us have work enough, both our hands full. James made it clear there would be no changes in the Elizabethan church settlement. His slogan was no bishop, no king. The Catholics were also anxious and hopeful. After all, the king's mother had been their champion. Their position was delicate. If the Pope would allow them to give their secular allegiance to the king, James might let them practice their own religion. But the Pope would not yield. He forbade allegiance to a heretical sovereign. Upon this there could be no compromise. A European controversy was raging about the nature of obedience and James plunged into the argument. The Jesuits who had assailed Elizabeth were all powerful at Rome, and replied with many volumes attacking his right to the throne. The air seemed charged with plots. James, although inclined to toleration, was forced to act. 
Catholics were fined for refusing to attend the services of the established church and their priests were banished. Disappointment and despair led a small group of Catholic gentry to an infernal design for blowing up James and his whole parliament by gunpowder while they were in session at Westminster. They hoped that this would be followed by a Catholic rising and that in the confusion a Catholic regime might be re-established with Spanish help. The chief plotter was Robert Catsby, assisted by Guy Fawkes, a veteran of the Spanish wars against the Dutch. One of their followers warned a relative who was a Catholic peer. The story reached Cecil, and the cellars of Parliament were searched. Fawkes was taken on the spot, and there was a storm of excitement in the city. James went down to open Parliament, and made an emotional speech upon what an honourable end it would have been to die with his faithful commons. Kings, he said, were exposed to perils beyond those of ordinary mortals, only his own cleverness had saved them all from destruction. The house displayed an incomprehensible indifference, and, turning to the business of the day, discussed the petition of a member who had asked to be relieved of his parliamentary duties owing to an attack of gout. The conspirators were hunted down, tortured and executed. So novel and so wholesale a treason exposed the Catholic community to immediate and severe persecution and a more persistent and widespread detestation. The thanksgiving service for the deliverance of November 5 was not removed from the prayer book till 1854, and the anniversary which even now is celebrated by bonfires and fireworks, was marred and enlivened until modern times by anti-popery demonstrations. At this time a splendid and lasting monument was created to the genius of the English-speaking peoples. All the Puritan demands had been rejected, but towards the end of the Hampton Court Conference a Puritan divine, Dr. John Reynolds, president of the Oxford College of Corpus Christi, had asked, seemingly on the spur of the moment, if a new version of the Bible could be produced. The idea appealed to James. Till now the clergy and laity had relied on a number of different translations, Tyndall's, Coverdale's, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible of Queen Elizabeth. Their texts varied. Some were disfigured by marginal notes and glosses upholding and advocating partisan interpretations of scripture and extremist theories of ecclesiastical organization. Each party and sect used the version which best suited its own views and doctrines. Here, thought James, was the chance to rid the scriptures of propaganda and produce a uniform version which could be entrusted to all. Within a few months committees or companies were set up two each in Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster, comprising in all about fifty scholars and divines. They were selected for this work without regard to their theological or ecclesiastical bias. Directions were issued with speed. Each committee was assigned a portion of the text, and their draft was to be scrutinized by all the other committees and finally revised by a committee of twelve. Tendentious renderings were forbidden and marginal notes or glosses were prohibited except for cross-references or to explain the meaning of Greek or Hebrew words which were difficult to translate. About three years passed in preliminary research, and the main work did not get underway till 1607, but it was then accomplished with remarkable swiftness. In an age without an efficient postal service or mechanical methods of copying and duplicating texts, the committees, though separated by considerable distances, finished their task in 1609. Nine months sufficed for the scrutiny of the supervisory committee, and in 1611 the authorized version of the Bible was produced by the King's printer. It won an immediate and lasting triumph. Copies could be bought for as little as five shillings, and even with the inflated prices of today can still be purchased for this sum. It superseded all other versions. No new revision was deemed necessary for nearly 300 years. In the crowded emigrant ships which sailed to the New World of America there was little room for baggage. If the adventurers took books with them they took the Bible, Shakespeare, and later the Pilgrim's Progress, and the Bible they mostly took was the authorized version of King James I. About 90 million complete copies are thought to have been published in the English language alone. It has been translated into more than 760 tongues.
The authorized version is still the most popular in England and the United States. This may be deemed James's greatest achievement, for the impulse was largely his. The Scottish pedant built better than he knew. The scholars who produced this masterpiece are mostly unknown and unremembered. But they forged an enduring link, literary and religious, between the English speaking peoples of the world. James and his parliaments grew more and more out of sympathy as the years went by. The Tudors had been discreet in their use of the royal prerogative and had never put forward any general theory of government, but James saw himself as the schoolmaster of the whole island. In theory there was a good case for absolute monarchy. The whole political development of the 16th century was on his side. He found a brilliant supporter in the person of Francis Bacon, the ambitious lawyer who had dabbled in politics with Essex and crept back to obedience when his patron fell. Bacon held a succession of high legal offices, culminating in the Lord Chancellorship. He maintained that the absolute and enlightened rule of the king with the help of his judges was justified by its efficiency, but his theories were unreal and widely unpopular. The subsequent conflict centered on the nature of the royal prerogative and the powers of an act of parliament. The modern view had not yet emerged that an act of parliament was supreme and unalterable unless repealed or amended, and that the sovereign power of the state could be exercised in no other way. The Tudor statutes had indeed been the instruments of profound changes in church and state, and there seemed little they could not do. But statutes required both the assent of parliament and the approval of the king. No parliament could meet without the summons of the king or sit after he had dismissed it. Little else but financial necessity could compel the king to call a parliament. If money could be raised elsewhere he might govern for years at a time without one. Moreover, a certain undefined prerogative power the king assuredly had. The exigencies of government required it. Who was to say what he could and could not do? If the king chose, on grounds of public interest, to make an ordinance dispensing with a statute, who could say he was acting illegally. At this point the common lawyers, headed by Chief Justice Coke, stepped to the forefront of English history. Coke, one of the most learned of English judges, gave a blunt answer to these controversies. He declared that conflicts between prerogative and statute should be resolved not by the crown but by the judges. It was a tremendous assertion. For if the judges were to decide which laws were valid and which were not they would become the ultimate lawgivers in the state. They would form a supreme court, assessing the legality of both royal and parliamentary enactments. Coke's high claims were not without foundation. They rested on the ancient tradition that law declared in the courts was superior to law published by the central authority. Coke himself was reluctant to admit that law could be made, or even changed. It existed already, merely awaiting revelation and exposition. If acts of parliament conflicted with it they were invalid. Thus at the beginning of his career Coke was not fighting on the same side as parliament. In England his main assertions on behalf of fundamental law were overruled. It was to be otherwise in the United States. James had a very different view of the function of judges. They might have the duty of deciding between the conflicting claims of statute and prerogative, but if so they were bound to decide in the crown's favor. Their business, as Bacon put it, was to be lions under the throne. As judges were appointed by the king and held office during his good pleasure, they should obey him like other royal servants. The controversy was embittered by personal rivalry between Bacon and Coke, who now found himself in an untenable position. No judge could be impartial about the king's prerogative if he were liable to instant dismissal on the king's command. James first tried to muzzle Coke by promoting him from the court of common pleas to the king's bench. Unsuccessful in this, he dismissed him in 1616. The remaining members of the bench sided with James. Five years later, Coke entered the House of Commons and found that the most active lawyers of the day were in agreement with him. Their leadership was readily accepted. Few of the country gentlemen sitting in the Commons had any deep knowledge of parliamentary history, or could produce any coherent theory to justify the claims of Parliament. They simply felt a smouldering injustice at the arbitrary conduct and jarring theories of the King. 
for all its stirring movements, this was an age of profound respect for precedents and constitutional forms. If the lawyers had remained solid for the crown and the whole weight of legal opinion had been thrown into the royal scale the commons task would have been much harder. With all the force of interpreted precedent against them, they would have had to break with the past and admit they were revolutionaries, but the adherence of the lawyers freed them from an agonizing choice. Coke, Selden, and others, including Pyme, who had read law at the Middle Temple even if he had not practiced, formed a group of able leaders, who took and held the initiative. Learned in the law, and not always too scrupulous in the interpretations they twisted from it, they gradually built up a case on which Parliament could claim with conviction that it was fighting, not for something new, but for the traditional and lawful heritage of the English people. Thus were laid the foundations of the united and disciplined opposition which Pyme was to lead against King Charles. James had no sympathy with these agitations. He did not care for compromise, but, shrewder than his son, he saw when compromise would suit him best. It was only the need of money that forced him to deal with Parliament at all. The House of Commons, he once told the Spanish ambassador, is a body without a head. The members give their opinions in a disorderly manner. At their meetings nothing is heard but cries, shouts, and confusion. I am surprised that my ancestors should ever have permitted such an institution to come into existence. I am a stranger, and found it here when I arrived, so that I am obliged to put up with what I cannot get rid of. James's foreign policy perhaps met the needs of the age for peace, but often clashed with its temper. When he came to the throne England was still technically at war with Spain. With Cecil's support hostilities were concluded and diplomatic relations renewed. In all the circumstances this may be deemed to have been a wise and prudent step. The main struggle had already shifted from the high seas to Europe. The House of Habsburg, at the head of the Holy Roman Empire, still dominated the continent from Vienna, the territories of the Emperor and of his cousin the King of Spain now stretched from Portugal to Poland, and their power was backed by the proselytizing fervor of the Jesuits. The commons and the country remained vehemently hostile to Spain, and viewed with alarm and anxiety the march of the Counter-Reformation. But James was unmoved. He regarded the Dutch as rebels against the divine right of kings. The Spanish ambassador, Count Gondomar, financed a pro-Spanish party at the new court, learning nothing from Tudor experience, James proposed not merely an alliance with Spain, but a Spanish match for his son. His daughter however was already in the opposite camp. The Princess Elizabeth had married one of the Protestant champions of Europe, Frederick, the Elector Palatine of the Rhine, and Frederick was soon projected into violent revolts against the Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand. Habsburg attempts to recover for the Catholic faith those areas in Germany which the law of the empire had recognized as Protestant provoked the vehement opposition of the Protestant princes. The storm center was Bohemia, where a haughty, resolute Czech nobility obstructed the centralizing policy of Vienna both in religion and politics. In the 15th century days of John Huss they had set up their own church and fought both Pope and Emperor. Now they defied Ferdinand. In 1618 their leaders flung the imperial envoys from the windows of the royal palace in Prague. This action, later known as the defenestration, started a war which was to ravage Germany for thirty years. The Czechs offered Frederick the throne of Bohemia. Frederick accepted, and became the recognized leader of the Protestant revolt. Although his daughter was now Queen of Bohemia, James showed no wish to intervene on her behalf. He was resolved to keep out of the conflict in Europe at all costs, and judged he could best help his son-in-law's cause through friendship with Spain. Parliament was indignant and alarmed. He reminded them that these matters were beyond their scope. No taunts of personal timidity moved him. He stuck to his convictions and kept the peace. Whether this was wise and far-sighted is not easy to measure, it was certainly unpopular. The elector Frederick was soon driven out of Bohemia, and his hereditary lands were occupied by Habsburg troops. So short had been his reign that he is known to history as the Winter King. 
the House of Commons clamoured for war. Private subscriptions and bands of volunteers were raised for the defence of the Protestants. James contented himself with academic discussions upon Bohemian rights with the Spanish ambassador. He clung to the belief that a matrimonial alliance between the royal families of England and Spain would ensure peace with the strongest power. No convulsions on the continent must impede this scheme. To pose as Protestant champion in the Great War now begun might gain a fleeting popularity with his subjects, but would also deliver him into the hands of the House of Commons. Parliament would assuredly demand some control over the expenditure of the money it voted for arms, and was unlikely to be generous. Puritan forces in the country would make themselves heard in louder tones. Besides, the fortunes of war were notoriously uncertain. James seems genuinely to have believed in his mission as the peacemaker of Europe, and also to have had a deep-rooted nervous dislike of fighting, founded in the tumultuous experiences of his youth in Scotland. He ignored the demand for intervention, and continued his negotiations for the Spanish match. In the midst of these turmoils Sir Walter Raleigh was executed on Tower Hill to please the Spanish government. Raleigh had been imprisoned at the beginning of the reign for conspiring to supplant James by his cousin. Arabella Stewart. This charge was probably unjust, and the trial was certainly so. Raleigh's dream of finding gold on the Orinoco River, which had cheered his long confinement, ended in disaster in 1617. This last expedition of his, for which he was specially released from the tower, had merely affronted the Spanish governors of South America. The old capital sentence was now revived against him. His death on October 29, 1618, was intended to mark the new policy of appeasement and prepare the way for good relations with Spain. This deed of shame sets a barrier forever between King James and the English people. There are others. James was much addicted to favorites and his attention to handsome young men resulted in a noticeable loss of respect for the monarchy. After the death of his wise counsellor, Robert Cecil, the court had been afflicted by a number of odious scandals. One of his favourites, Robert Carr, created Earl of Somerset by the king's caprice, was implicated in a murder by poison, of which his wife was undoubtedly guilty. James, who could deny Carr nothing at first paid little attention to the storm raised by this crime, but even he found it impossible to maintain him in high office. Carr was succeeded in the king's regard by a good-looking, quick-witted, extravagant youth, George Villiers, soon ennobled as Duke of Buckingham. This young man quickly became more powerful at court, and in the affections of James. He formed a deep and honourable friendship with Charles, Prince of Wales. He accepted unhesitatingly the royal policy of a Spanish marriage, and in 1623 staged a romantic journey to Madrid for the prince and himself to view the bride. Their unorthodox behavior failed to impress the formal and ceremonious court of Spain. Moreover, the Spaniards demanded concessions for the English Catholics, which James' new parliament would never grant. They refused to intercede with the emperor for the restoration of the Palatinate lands to Frederick. In the end the king's better feelings triumphed. I like not, he declared, to marry my son with a portion of my daughter's tears. The negotiations with Spain foundered. Contrary winds delayed the return of the Prince of Wales and his companion, now disenchanted with all things Spanish. The English fleet which was to escort him remained weather-bound at Santander. England waited in a tremor, and when the news spread through the country that he was safely back at Portsmouth, unwedded to the Infanta, unseduced from the Protestant faith, a surge of joy arose among all classes. The overpowering wish and potent will of England was to resist, and if necessary to fight, Spain and all that Spain meant. Memories of the Armada and good Queen Bess cheered men's minds. The deadly sin of Papist idolatry, as they conceived it, terrified their souls. Fox's Book of Martyrs, first published in 1563, and still widely read, taught them the duty and the splendor of rising above all physical danger or suffering. 
The streets were crowded with wagons carrying faggots for the bonfires. The red glow of rejoicing was reflected in the London sky. But the king and his council had gone too far on this path not to be smitten and shaken by its sudden closing. The council, deeply committed, told the king that Buckingham had spoiled the affair by his impatience and conceit. They made heavy case against Buckingham's behavior. They cleared the Spanish court from the charge of discourtesy and justified the Spanish attitude towards the Palatinate. But Buckingham and Charles were now eager for war. James at first wavered. He was, he said, an old man who once knew something about politics. Now the two beings he loved best in the world urged him upon a course directly contrary to his judgment and past action. In this sharp pinch Buckingham with remarkable agility turned himself from a royal favorite into a national, if short-lived, statesman. While using all his personal address to over-persuade the sovereign, he sought and obtained the support of parliament and people. He took a number of steps which recognized, in a manner unknown since the days of the House of Lancaster, parliamentary rights and power. Whereas all interference by parliament in foreign affairs had been repelled by the Tudors, and hitherto by James, the minister favorite now invited lords and commons to give their opinion. The answer of both houses was prompt and plain. It was contrary, they said, to the honor of the king, to the welfare of his people, to the interest of his children, and to the terms of his former alliances to continue the negotiations with Spain. Upon this Buckingham did not conceal that he differed somewhat from his master. He said bluntly and publicly that he wished to tread only one path, whereas the king thought he could walk in two different paths at once. He would not be a mere flatterer, he must express his convictions or be a traitor. At these developments, Parliament was delighted. But now came the question of raising funds for the war that was to follow. James and Prince Charles had in mind campaigns in Europe that would seek to regain the Palatinate. Parliament urged a purely naval war with Spain, in which great profits from the Indies might be won. Suspicious of the king's intentions, the Commons voted less than half the sum for which he asked, and laid down stringent conditions as to how it should be spent. Buckingham trimmed his sails and for the moment preserved his new parliamentary prestige. This he used to break his rival, Lord Treasurer Cranfield. The Treasurer, now Earl of Middlesex, was one of the outstanding new men in the kingdom. He was a merchant who had risen to great wealth and high office. He was now dismissed and imprisoned by the parliamentary engine of impeachment. This weapon had already been used against Bacon, who was found guilty of corruption in 1621, dismissed from the chancellorship, fined and banished. It was never to be laid aside until many great issues, already alive, but little comprehended by Buckingham or by his dear friend Charles, had been settled once and for all. No sooner was the Spanish match broken off than Buckingham turned to France for a bride for Charles. When he and the Prince of Wales had passed through Paris on their way to Madrid, Charles had been struck by the charm of Marie de Medici's daughter, Henrietta Maria, sister of Louis XIII, and then in her fourteenth year. Buckingham found the negotiations agreeable to the French court, and especially to Queen Marie. A marriage with a Protestant princess would have united crown and parliament. But this was never the intention of the governing circle. A daughter of France seemed to them the only alternative to the Infanta. How could England face Spain alone? If we could not lean on Spain, it seemed that we must have France. The old king wanted to see his son married. He said he lived only for him. He ratified the marriage treaty in December 1624. Three months later the first king of Great Britain was dead. Chapter 12 of Mayflower The struggle with Spain had long absorbed the energies of Englishmen, and in the last years of Queen Elizabeth few fresh enterprises had been carried out upon the oceans. For a while little was heard of the New World. Hawkins and Drake in their early voyages had opened up broad prospects for England in the Caribbean. Frobisher and others had penetrated deeply into the Arctic recesses of Canada in search of a northwest passage to Asia. But the lure of exploration and trade had given way to the demands of war. The novel idea of founding colonies also received a setback. Gilbert, Raleigh, and Grenville had been its pioneers. 
their bold plans had come to nothing, but they left behind them an inspiring tradition. Now after a lapse of time their endeavors were taken up by new figures, less glittering, more practical and luckier. Piecemeal and from many motives the English-speaking communities in North America were founded. The change came in 1604, when James I made his Treaty of Peace with Spain. Discussion that had been stimulated by Richard Clutt's discourse on Western planting was revived. Serious argument by a group of writers of which he was the head gained a new hearing and a new pertinence. For there were troubles in England. People reduced to beggary and vagabondage were many, and new outlets were wanted for the nation's energies and resources. The steady rise in prices had caused much hardship to wage earners. Though the general standard of living improved during the 16th century, a wide range of prices rose sixfold and wages only twofold. Industry was oppressed by excessive government regulation. The medieval system of craftsmen's guilds, which was still enforced, made the entry of young apprentices harsh and difficult. The square archie, strong in its political alliance with the crown, owned most of the land and ran all the local government. The march of enclosures, which they pursued, drove many English peasants off the land. The whole scheme of life seemed to have contracted and the framework of social organization had hardened. There were many without advantage, hope, or livelihood under the new conditions. Colonies, it was thought, might help to solve these distressing problems. The government was not uninterested. Trade with lively colonies promised an increase in the customs revenue on which the crown heavily depended. Merchants and the richer landed gentry saw new opportunities across the Atlantic for profitable investment, and an escape from cramping restrictions on industry and the general decline of European trade during the religious wars. Capital was available for overseas experiments. Raleigh's attempts had demonstrated the ill success of individual effort, but a new method of financing large scale trading enterprises was evolving in the shape of the joint stock company. In 1606 a group of speculators acquired a royal charter creating the Virginia Company. It is interesting to see how early speculation in its broadest sense begins to play its part in the American field. A plan was carefully drawn up in consultation with experts such as Hlut, but they had little practical experience and underestimated the difficulties of the profoundly novel departure they were making. After all, it is not given to many to start a nation. It was a few hundred people who now took the first step. A settlement was made at Jamestown, in the Chesapeake Bay, on the Virginian coast, in May 1607. By the following spring half the population was dead from malaria, cold, and famine. After a long and heroic struggle the survivors became self-supporting, but profits to the promoters at home were very small. Captain John Smith a military adventurer from the Turkish wars, became the dictator of the tiny colony, and enforced harsh discipline. The marriage of his lieutenant John Rolfe with Pocahontas, the daughter of an Indian chief, caused a sensation in the English capital. But the London Company had little control and the administration of the colony was rough and ready. The objects of the directors were mixed and ill-defined. Some thought that colonization would reduce poverty and crime in England. Others looked for profit to the fisheries of the North American coast, or hoped for raw materials to reduce their dependence on the exports from the Spanish colonies. All were wrong, and Virginia's fortune sprang from a novel and unexpected cause. By chance a crop of tobacco was planted, and the soil proved benevolent. Tobacco had been introduced into Europe by the Spaniards and the habit of smoking was spreading fast. Demand for tobacco was great and growing, and the profits on the Virginia crop were high. Small holders were bought out, big estates were formed, and the colony began to stand on its own feet. As it grew and prospered its society came to resemble the mother country, with rich planters in the place of squires. They were not long in developing independence of mind and a sturdy capacity for self-government. Distance from the authorities in London greatly aided them in this dot beneath the drab exterior of Jacobi in England, with favoritism at court and humiliation in Europe, other and more vital forces were at work. 
the Elizabethan bishops had driven the nobler and tougher Puritan spirits out of the established church. But though they destroyed the organization of the party small illegal gatherings of religious extremists continued to meet. There was no systematic persecution, but petty restrictions and spyings obstructed their peaceful worship. A congregation at Scrooby, in Nottinghamshire, led by one of their pastors, John Robinson, and by William Brewster, the Puritan bailiff of the manor of the Archbishop of York, resolved to seek freedom of worship abroad. In 1607 they left England and settled at Leiden, hoping to find asylum among the tolerant and industrious Dutch. For ten years these Puritan parishioners struggled for a decent existence. They were small farmers and agricultural workers, out of place in a maritime industrial community, barred by their nationality from the guilds of craftsmen, without capital and without training. The only work they could get was rough manual labor. They were persistent and persevering, but a bleak future faced them in Holland. They were too proud of their birthright to be absorbed by the Dutch. The authorities had been sympathetic, but in practice unhelpful. The Puritans began to look elsewhere. Emigration to the New World presented itself as an escape from a sinful generation. Though they might gain a livelihood unhampered by Dutch guilds, and practice their greed unharassed by English clerics. As one of their number records, the place they had thoughts on was some of those vast and unpeopled countries of America, which are fruitful and fit for habitation being devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage and brutish men, which range up and down little otherwise than the wild beasts of the same. Throughout the winter of 1616-17, when Holland was threatened with a renewal of war with Spain, there were many discussions among the anxious community. A mortal risk and high adventure lay before them. To the perils of the unknown, to famine and the record of past failures were added gruesome tales of the Indians, how they flayed men with the shells of fishes and cut off steaks which they broiled upon the coals before the eyes of the victims. But William Bradford, who was to become governor of the new colony, pleaded the argument of the majority. In his history of the Plymouth Plantation he has expressed the views they held at the time. All great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties, and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. The dangers were great, but not desperate, the difficulties were many, but not invincible. For though there were many of them likely, yet they were not certain, it might be sundry of the things feared might never befall, others by provident care and the use of good means might in a great measure be prevented, and all of them, through the help of God, by fortitude and patience, might either be borne or overcome. Such attempts were not to be made and undertaken without good ground and reason, not rashly or lightly as many have done for curiosity or hope of gain. But their condition was not ordinary, their ends were good and honorable, their calling lawful, and urgent, and therefore they might expect the blessing of God in their proceeding. Yea, though they should lose their lives in this action, yet might they have comfort in the same, and their endeavors would be honorable. They lived here but as men in exile, and in a poor condition, and as great miseries might possibly befall them in this place, for the twelve years of truce were now out, and there was nothing but beating of drums, and preparing for war, the events whereof are always uncertain. The Spaniard might prove as cruel as the savages of America, and the famine and pestilence as saw here as there, and their liberty less to look out for remedy. Their first plan was to settle in Guiana, but then they realized it was impossible to venture out upon their own. Help must come from England. They accordingly sent agents to London to negotiate with the only body interested in emigration, the Virginia Company. One of the members of its council was an influential parliamentarian, Sir Edwin Sands. Supported by the London merchant backers of the company, he furthered the project. Here were ideal settlers, sober, hard-working, and skilled in agriculture. They insisted upon freedom of worship, and it would be necessary to placate the Anglican bishops. Sands and the emissaries from Holland went to see the king. James was skeptical. He asked how the little band proposed to support itself in the company's territory in America. By fishing, they replied. 
This appealed to James. So God have my soul. He exclaimed in one of his more agreeable remarks, tis an honest trade. It was the apostle's own calling. The Leiden community was granted a license to settle in America, and arrangements for their departure were hastened on. Thirty-five members of the Leiden congregation left Holland and joined 66 West Country adventurers at Plymouth, and in September 1620 they set sail in the Mayflower, a vessel of 180 tons. After two and a half months of voyaging across the Winter Ocean they reached the shores of Cape Cod, and thus, by an accident, landed outside the jurisdiction of the Virginia Company. This invalidated their patent from London. Before they landed there was trouble among the group about who was to enforce discipline. Those who had joined the ship at Plymouth were no picked band of saints, and had no intention of submitting to the Leiden set. There was no possibility of appealing to England. Yet, if they were not all to starve, some agreement must be reached. 41 of the more responsible members thereupon drew up a solemn compact which is one of the remarkable documents in history, a spontaneous covenant for political organization. In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland King, Defender of the Faith, etc. having undertaken, for the glory of God, and advancement of the Christian faith, and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God, and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In December on the American coast in Cape Cod Bay these men founded the town of Plymouth. The same bitter struggle with nature that had taken place in Virginia now began. There was no staple crop. But by toil and faith they survived. The financial supporters in London reaped no profits. In 1627 they sold out and the Plymouth colony was left to its own resources. Such was the founding of New England. For ten years afterwards, there was no more planned emigration to America, but the tiny colony of Plymouth pointed a path to freedom. In 1629, Charles I dissolved Parliament and the period of so called personal rule began. As friction grew between crown and subjects, so opposition to the Anglican Church strengthened in the countryside. Absolutism was commanding the continent and England seemed to be going the same way. Many people of independent mind began to consider leaving home to find freedom and justice in the wilds. Just as the congregation from Scrooby had emigrated in a body to Holland, so another Puritan group in Dorset, inspired by the Reverend John White, now resolved to move to the New World. After an unhappy start this venture won support in London and the eastern counties among backers interested in trade and fishing as well as in emigration. Influential opposition peers lent their aid. After the precedent of Virginia a chartered company was formed, eventually named the Company of the Massachusetts Bay in New England. News spread rapidly and there was no lack of colonists. An advance party founded the settlement of Salem, to the north of Plymouth. In 1630 the governor of the company, John Winthrop, followed with a thousand settlers. He was the leading personality in the enterprise. The uneasiness of the time is reflected in his letters, which reveal the reasons why his family went. I am verily persuaded, he wrote about England, God will bring some heavy affliction upon this land, and that speedily, but be of good comfort. If the Lord seeth it will be good for us. He will provide a shelter and a hiding place for us and others. Evil times are coming when the church must fly into the wilderness. The wilderness that Winthrop chose lay on the Charles River, and to this swampish site the capital of the colony was transferred. Here from modest beginnings arose the city of Boston, which was to become in the next century the heart of resistance to British rule.
and long remain the intellectual capital of America. The Massachusetts Bay Company was by its constitution a joint stock corporation, organized entirely for trading purposes, and the Salem settlement was for the first year controlled from London. But by accident or intent there was no mention in the charter where the company was to hold its meetings. Some of the Puritan stockholders realized that there was no obstacle to transferring the company, directors and all, to New England. A general court of the company was held, and this momentous decision taken. From the joint stock company was born the self-governing colony of Massachusetts. The Puritan landed gentry who led the enterprise introduced a representative system, such as they had known in the days before King Charles's personal rule. John Winthrop guided the colony through this early phase, and it soon expanded. Between 1629 and 1640 the colonists rose in numbers from 300 to 14,000. The resources of the company offered favorable prospects to small emigrants. In England life for farm laborers was often hard. Here in the New World there was land for every newcomer and freedom from all restrictions upon the movement of labor and such other medieval regulations as oppressed and embittered the peasantry at home. The leaders and ministers who ruled in Massachusetts however had views of their own about freedom. It must be the rule of the godly. They understood toleration as little as the Anglicans, and disputes broke out about religion. By no means all were rigid Calvinists and recalcitrant bodies split off from the parent colony when such quarrels became strident. Outside of the settlement were boundless beckoning lands. In 1635 and 1636 some colonists moved to the valley of the Connecticut River, and founded the town of Hartford near its banks. They were joined by many emigrants direct from England. This formed the nucleus of the settlement of the river towns, later to become the colony of Connecticut. There, 3,000 miles from home, enlightened rules of government were drawn up. A fundamental order or constitution was proclaimed, similar to the Mayflower Compact about 15 years before. A popular government, shared in by all the freemen of the colony, was set up, and maintained itself in a modest way until its position was formally regularized after the restoration of the Stuart monarchy. The founders of Connecticut had gone out from Massachusetts to find new and larger lands in which to settle. Religious strife drove others beyond the bounds of the parent colony. A scholar from Cambridge, Roger Williams, had been forced to leave the university by Archbishop Lord. He followed the now known way to the New World and settled in Massachusetts. The godly there seemed to him almost as oppressive as the Anglican Church in England. William soon clashed with the authorities, and became the leader of those idealists and humbler folk who sought escape from persecution in their new home overseas. The magistrates considered him a promoter of disorder, and resolved to send him back to England. Warned in time, he fled beyond their reach, and, followed at intervals by others, founded the town of Providence, to the south of Massachusetts. Other exiles from Massachusetts, some of them forcibly banished, joined his settlement in 1636, which became the colony of Rhode Island. Roger Williams was the first political thinker of America, and his ideas influenced not only his fellow colonists, but the Revolutionary Party in England. In many ways he foreshadowed the political conceptions of John Milton. He was the first to put into practice the complete separation of church from lay government, and Rhode Island was the only center in the world at that time where there was complete religious toleration. This noble cause was sustained by the distilling and sale of spirits, on which the colony thrived. By 1645, main English settlements had thus been established in North America, Virginia, technically under the direct rule of the Crown, and administered somewhat ineffectually, by a standing committee of the Privy Council since the company's charter was abrogated in 1624, the original pilgrim settlement at Plymouth, which, for want of capital, had not expanded, the flourishing Massachusetts Bay Colony, and its two offshoots, Connecticut and Rhode Island. The last four were the New England colonies. In spite of religious divergences they were much alike. All were coastal settlements, 
bound together by trade, fisheries, and shipping, and soon forced to make common cause against their neighbors. For the French were already reaching out from their earlier bases in Canada, having ousted an adventurous band of Scotsmen who had been ensconced for a time on the upper reaches of the Street Lawrence. By 1630 the river was entirely in French hands. The only other waterway, the Hudson, was ruled by the Dutch, who had established at its mouth in 1621 the colony of New Netherland, later to become New York. By moving their company to the New World the English in Massachusetts had shelved relations with the home government. The Plymouth colony was practically autonomous after the shareholders sold out in 1627. There was however no question of their demanding independence from England. That would have exposed them to attack and conquest by the French or the Dutch. But these dangers still lay in the future. England meanwhile was busy with her own affairs. For a moment in 1635 Charles I and his council had considered sending an expedition to assert his authority in America. The colonists built forts and blockhouses and prepared to fight. But the civil war in England suspended such designs, and they were left to themselves to grow finally a quarter of a century. Two other ventures, both essentially commercial, established the English speaking peoples in the New World. Since Elizabethan days they had often tried to get a foothold in the Spanish West Indies. In 1623, on his way back from a fruitless expedition to Guiana, a Suffolk gentleman named Thomas Warner explored one of the less inhabited West Indian islands. He deposited a few colonists on Street Christopher, and hurried home to get a royal patent for a more extensive enterprise. This achieved, he returned to the Caribbean, and, though much harassed by Spanish raids, he established the English in this disputed sea. By the 1640s Barbados, Street Christopher, Nevis, Montserrat, and Antigua were in English hands and several thousand colonists had arrived. Sugar assured their prosperity, and the Spanish grip on the West Indies was shaken. There was much competition and warfare in the succeeding years, but for a long time these island settlements were commercially much more valuable to England than the colonies in North America. Another settlement of this period was sponsored by the monarchy. In theory, all land settled by Englishmen belonged to the king. He had the right to grant such portions as he chose either to recognized companies or to individuals. Just as Elizabeth and James had granted industrial and commercial monopolies to courtiers, so now Charles I attempted to regulate colonial settlement. In 1632 George Calvert, Lord Baltimore, a Roman Catholic courtier who had long been interested in colonization, applied for a patent for settling in the neighborhood of Virginia. It was granted after his death to his son. The terms of the patent resembled the conditions under which land was already held in Virginia. It conferred complete proprietary rights over the new area, and tried to transport the manorial system to the new world. The government of the colony was vested in the Baltimore family, who had supreme power of appointment and regulation. Courtiers and merchants subscribed to the venture, and the new colony was named Maryland in honor of Charles's queen, Henrietta Maria. Although the proprietor was a Roman Catholic there was a tolerant flavor about its government from the beginning, because Baltimore had only obtained his patent by proclaiming the religion of the established church as the official creed of the new settlement. The aristocratic nature of the regime was much modified in practice, and the powers of the local administration set up by Baltimore increased at the expense of his paper rights. In these first decades of the Great Emigration over 80,000 English-speaking people crossed the Atlantic. Never since the days of the Germanic invasions of Britain had such a national movement been seen. Saxon and Viking had colonized England. Now, 1,000 years later, their descendants were taking possession of America. Many different streams of migrants were to make their confluence in the New World and contribute to the manifold character of the future United States. But the British stream flowed first and remained foremost. From the beginning its leaders were out of sympathy with the government at home. The creation of towns and settlements from the wilderness, 
warfare with the Indians, and the remoteness and novelty of the scene widened the breach with the old world. During the critical years of settlement and consolidation in New England the mother country was paralyzed by civil war. When the English state again achieved stability it was confronted with self-supporting, self-reliant communities which had evolved traditions and ideas of their own. Chapter 13 Charles I and Buckingham of the many descriptions of Charles I at the beginning of his reign none is more attractive than the cameo which we owe to the profound studies of the German historian, Rank. He was, he says, in the bloom of life, he had just completed his twenty-fifth year. He looked well on horseback, men saw him govern with safety horses that were hard to manage, he was expert in nightly exercises, he was a good shot with the crossbow, as well as with the gun, and even learned how to load a cannon. He was hardly less unweariedly devoted to the chase than his father. He could not vie with him in intelligence and knowledge, nor with his deceased brother Henry in vivacious energy and in popularity of disposition. In moral qualities he was superior to both. He was one of those young men of whom it is said that they have no fault. His strict propriety of demeanor bordered on maiden bashfulness, a serious and temperate soul spoke from his calm eyes. He had a natural gift for apprehending even the most complicated questions, and he was a good writer. From his youth he showed himself economical, not profuse, but at the same time not niggardly, in all matters precise. One he had however suffered from infantile paralysis and spoke with a stammer. A great political and religious crisis was overhanging England. Already in King James's time Parliament had begun to take the lead, not only in levying taxes but increasingly in the conduct of affairs, and especially in foreign policy. It is remarkable to see how far-reaching was the interest shown by the educated part of the English nation in Europe and as they thought and moved so did the great mass of the people behind them. Events in Prague or at Ishburn seemed as important to Englishmen as what happened in York or Bristol. The frontiers of Bohemia, the conditions in the Palatinate, ranked as high as many domestic questions. This wide outlook was no longer due, as in the days of the Plantagenets, to dynastic claims of continental sway. The furious winds of religious strife carried men's thoughts afar. The English people felt that their survival and their salvation were bound up forever with the victory of the Reformed faith, and they watched with straining, vigilant eyes every episode which marked its advance or misfortune. An intense desire for England to lead and champion the Protestant cause wherever it was assailed drove forward the parliamentary movement with a force far greater than would ever have sprung merely from the issues which were now opening at home. Lord Acton declares that the progress of the world towards self-government would have been arrested but for the strength afforded by the religious motive in the 17th century. The secular issues were nevertheless themselves of enormous weight. Tudor authority had been accepted as a relief from the anarchy of the Wars of the Roses, and had now ceased to fit either the needs or the temper of a continually growing society. Men looked back to earlier times. Great lawyers like Coke and Selden had directed their gaze to the rights which they thought Parliament had possessed under the Lancastrian kings. Ranging farther, they spoke with pride of the work of Simon de Montfort, of Magna Carta, and even of still more ancient rites in the mists of Anglo-Saxon monarchy. From these studies they derived the conviction that they were the heirs of a whole structure of fundamental law inherent in the customs of the island, and now most apt and vital to their immediate problems. The past seemed to them to provide almost a written constitution, from which the crown was now threatening to depart. But the crown also looked back, and found many precedents of a contrary character, especially in the last hundred years, for the most thorough exercise of the royal prerogative. Both King and Parliament had a body of doctrine upon which they dwelt with sincere conviction. This brought pathos and grandeur to the coming struggle. A society more complex than that of Tudor England was coming into existence. Trade, both foreign and internal, was expanding. Coal mining and other industries were rapidly developing. Larger vested interests were in being. In the van stood London, ever glorious champion of freedom and progress, London, with its thousands of lusty, 
free spoken prentices and its wealthy city guilds and companies. Outside London, many of the landed gentry, who supplied numerous members to Parliament, were acquiring close connections with new industry and trade. In these years the commons were not so much seeking to legislate as trying to wring from the crown admissions of ancient custom which would prevent before it was too late all this recent growth from falling under an autocratic grip. The men at the head of this strenuous and, to our time, invaluable movement were notable figures. Coke had taught the later parliaments of James I the arguments upon which they could rest and the methods by which they might prevail. His knowledge of the common law was unique. He unearthed an armory of precedents, and set many to work upon their furbishing and sharpening. Two country gentlemen stand with him, one from the West, Sir John Eliot, a Cornishman, the other, Thomas Wentworth, a Yorkshire squire. Both these men possessed the highest qualities of force and temper. For a time they worked together, for a time they were rivals, for a time they were foes. By opposite paths both reached the extremity of sacrifice. Behind them at this time, lacking nothing in grit, were leaders of the Puritan gentry, Denzil Halls, Arthur Hazelrig, John Pyme. Pyme was eventually to go far and to carry the cause still farther. He was a Somerset man, a lawyer, strongly anti-high church, and with an interest in colonial ventures. Here was a man who understood every move in the political game and would play it out remorselessly. The parliaments of James, and now those of Charles, were for war and intervention in Europe. They sought to use the money power, of which they were the masters, to induce the king and his ministers to tread these dangerous paths. They knew well, among other things, that the stresses of war would force the crown to come to them. They saw that their power would grow with the adoption of their policy, which was also their faith. The pacifism of James I, often ignominious, had upon the whole avoided this trap. But King Charles and Buckingham were high-spirited men in the ardour of youth. The king was affronted by the manner in which his father's overtures for a Spanish match, and he himself, had been slighted in Madrid. He was for war with Spain. He even wished to call Parliament together without issuing writs for the new election consequent upon a demise of the crown. He at once carried through his marriage with the French princess, Henrietta Maria. Her arrival at Dover surrounded by a throng of French papists and priests was the first serious shock to Charles's popularity. The new parliament granted supplies against Spain, but their purpose to review the whole question of indirect taxation was plain when they resolved that the customs duties of tonnage and poundage without which the king could not live, even in peace should for the first time for many reigns be voted, not for the king's life, but only for one year. This restriction galled and wounded Charles, but did not deter him from the war. Thus at the very outset of his reign he placed himself in a position of exceptional dependence upon Parliament, while resenting its increasing claims. The war with Spain went badly. Buckingham led an expedition to Cadiz in an attempt to emulate the feats of Queen Elizabeth's days but it accomplished nothing. On his return Parliament resolved to unseat the glittering, profuse, incompetent minister. We protest, the Commons told Charles, that until this great person be removed from intermeddling with the great affairs of state any money we shall or can give will through his misemployment be turned rather to the hurt and prejudice of this your kingdom than otherwise. Buckingham was impeached and to save his friend the king hastily dissolved parliament. A new complication was now added to the scene. Charles had hoped to conclude an alliance with France against the Habsburg rulers of Spain and the empire. But France showed no desire to fight for the recovery of the Palatinate on England's behalf. Disputes also arose over the fulfillment of Charles's treaty of marriage with Queen Henrietta Maria, and the breach was widened by the cause of the Huguenots. The new powerful French minister, Cardinal Richelieu, was determined to curb the independence of the Huguenots in France, and in particular to reduce their maritime stronghold of La Rochelle. English sympathies naturally lay with these French Protestants whom they had helped to sustain in the days of Henry of Navarre, and the two countries drifted into war. In 1627 a considerable force was dispatched under Buckingham to help the Rochellites. 
it landed off the coast in the Ile de Ré, failed to storm the citadel, and withdrew in disorder. Thus Buckingham's military efforts were once more marked by waste and failure. At home the billeting of soldiers brought an acute grievance into thousands of cottage homes. This was aggravated by the arbitrary decisions of martial law, which was used to settle all disputes between soldiers and civilians. The king was torn between the grinding need of finding money for the war and the danger that Parliament would again impeach his friend. In his vexation, and having the war on his hands, he resorted to dubious methods of raising money. He demanded a forced loan, and when many important persons refused to pay, he threw them into prison. Five of these prisoners, known as the Five Knights, appealed against these proceedings. But King's Bench ruled that habeas corpus could not be used against imprisonments by special command of the king. From the agitation this aroused sprang the famous petition of right. Forced loans could not suffice to replenish the treasury, and having secured a promise that the impeachment of Buckingham would not be pursued, the king agreed to summon Parliament. The country was now in a ferment. The election returned men pledged to resist arbitrary exactions. The Parliament which assembled in March 1628 embodied the will of the natural leaders of the nation. It wished to support the war, but it would not grant money to a king and minister it distrusted. The nobility and gentry, lords and commons alike, were resolute in defence of property, and also of its twin cause at this time, liberty. The king used the threat of despotic action. He must have such supply as to secure ourselves and save our friends from imminent ruin. Every man must now do according to his conscience, wherefore if you, which God forbid, should not do your duties in contributing what this state at this time needs I must. Use those other means which God hath put into my hands to save that which the follies of other men may otherwise hazard to loose. Take not this as threatening, for I scorn to threaten any but my equals but as an admonition. It must not be supposed that all the wrongdoing was on one side. Parliament, which had approved the wars, was playing a hard game with the king, confronting him with the shame to his princely honour of deserting the Huguenots, or else yielding the prerogative his predecessors had so long enjoyed. Their tactics were artful, and yet justified by their convictions and by the facts. They offered no fewer than five subsidies amounting to three hundred thousand pounds, all to be paid within twelve months. Here was enough to carry on the war, but before they would confirm this in a bill they demanded their price. The following four resolutions were passed unanimously, that no freeman ought to be restrained or imprisoned unless some lawful cause was expressed, that the writ of habeas corpus ought to be granted to every man imprisoned or restrained, even though it might be at the command of the king or of the privy council that if no legal cause for imprisonment were shown the party ought to be set free or bailed, that it was the ancient and undoubted right of every freeman to have a full and absolute property in his goods and estate, and that no tax, loan, or benevolence ought to be levied by the king or his ministers without common consent by act of parliament. At Coke's prompting the commons now went on to frame the petition of right. Its object was to curtail the king's prerogative. The petition complained against forced loans, imprisonment without trial, billeting, and martial law. These and others of the king's proceedings were condemned as being contrary to the rights and liberties of the subject, and the laws and statutes of the nation. Unless the king accepted the petition he would have no subsidies, and must face the wars to which Parliament had incited him as best he could. Charles, resorting to manoeuvre, secretly consulted the judges, who assured him that even his consent to these liberties would not affect his ultimate prerogative. He was none too sure of this, and when his first evasive answer was delivered in the House of Lords a howl went up, not only from the Commons, but from the great majority of all assembled. He therefore fell back upon the opinion of the judges and gave full consent que droict soif et comilist desire, while making mental reservation. Now, said the King, I have performed my part. If this Parliament have not a happy conclusion the sin is yours. I am free of it. On this there was general rejoicing. The Commons voted all the subsidies, and believed that a definite bargain had been struck. We reach here, 
amid much confusion, the main foundation of English freedom. The right of the executive government to imprison a man, high or low, for reasons of state was denied, and that denial, made good in painful struggles, constitutes the charter of every self-respecting man at any time in any land. Trial by jury of equals, only for offences known to the law, if maintained, makes the difference between bond and free. But the king felt this would hamper him, and no doubt a plausible case can be advanced that in times of emergency dangerous persons must be confined. The terms protective arrest and shot while trying to escape had not yet occurred to the mind of authority. We owe them to the genius of a later age. At the back of the parliamentary movement in all its expressions lay a deep fear. Everywhere in Europe they saw the monarchies becoming more autocratic. The States General, which had met in Paris in 1614, had not been summoned again, it was not indeed to be summoned until the clash of 1789. The rise of standing armies, composed of men drilled in firearms and supported by trains of artillery, had stripped alike the nobles and the common people of their means of independent resistance. Rough as the times had been in the earlier centuries, bills and bows were a final resource which few kings had cared to challenge. But now on the parliamentary side forces yet was lacking. Both sides pressed farther along their paths. The king, having got his money, dwelt unduly upon the assurances he had received from the judges that his prerogative was intact. The commons came forward with further complaints against the growth of popery and Arminianism, the form of high church doctrine most directly opposed to Calvinism, about the mismanagement of the war, and about injury to trade and commerce from naval weakness in the narrow seas. They renewed their attack on Buckingham, asking the king whether it was consistent with his safety, or the safety of the realm, that the author of so many calamities should continue to hold office or remain near his sacred person. But now the king and Buckingham hoped that a second and successful expedition would relieve the Huguenots in La Rochelle. Charles dismissed the houses. Before he had need of them again he and his cherished minister would present them with a military or diplomatic result in which all could rejoice. Far better to rescue Protestants abroad than to persecute Catholics at home. A king who had delivered La Rochelle could surely claim the right to exercise indulgence even to papists in his own land. This was not a discreditable position to take up, but fate moved differently. Buckingham himself was deeply conscious of the hatreds of which he was the object and it is clear that in putting himself at the head of a new expedition to La Rochelle he hoped to win again for himself some national backing, which would at least divide his pursuers. But at the moment when his resolves were at their highest, as he was about to embark at Portsmouth, commander-in-chief of a formidable armament, with new engines for breaking the boom which Richelieu had built across the beleaguered harbour, he was stabbed to death by a fanatical naval lieutenant. The murderer, John Felton, seems to have been impaled by nature upon all those prongs of dark resolve which make such deeds possible. He had the private sting of being passed over for promotion. He was embittered by the favoritism shown to officers who had never fought. But the documents which he left behind him proved him a slave of larger thoughts. Parliament's remonstrations to the king against Buckingham's lush splendor and corrupt methods had sunk into his soul. He held that the welfare of the people is the highest law, and that God himself has enacted this law, that whatsoever is for the profit or benefit of the commonwealth should be accounted to be lawful. After the deed he mingled in the crowd, but when he heard men denouncing the villain who had slain the noble duke he came forward, saying, No villain did it, but an honorable man. I am the man. A lean man he was, with red hair and dark, melancholy features. He flung at the crowd who shouted at him, In your hearts you rejoice in my deed. On some of the ships the sailors cheered his name. Afterwards, in the grey approach of doom, he became convinced that he had been wrong. He accepted the view that the common good could no way be a pretense to a particular mischief. He asked to be allowed to testify to this before his execution. The death of Buckingham was a devastating blow to the young king. He never forgave Elliot to whose accusing speeches he ascribed Felton's act. 
at the same time it immensely relieved his public difficulties, for much of the anger of the parliament died with the favourite, and it brought for the first time a unity into his married life. Hitherto he had been morally and mentally dominated by Steeny, the beloved friend of his boyhood and youth, to whom he confided his inmost thoughts. For three years he had lived in cold estrangement from the Queen. It was even said that the marriage had never been consummated, and he had distressed her by dismissing all her French attendants. The death of Buckingham was the birth of his love for his wife. Little but storm lay before them, but henceforth they faced it together. Though the Commons had granted the five subsidies, they held tonnage and poundage in reserve. When the year lapsed for which this had been voted the parliamentary party throughout the country were angered to find that the king continued to collect the tax by his officers, as had been the custom for so many reigns. Distraint and imprisonment were used against those who refused to pay. In all this was seen the king's contempt for the petition of right, and his intention to escape from the assent he had given to it. When copies of the petition were printed it was found that the king's first evasive answer was appended, and not his later plain acceptance in the ancient form. The expedition to La Rochelle, which had sailed under another commander, miscarried. Cardinal Richelieu succeeded in maintaining his boom against the English ships and appliances, and eventually the Huguenots in despair surrendered the city to the king of France. This collapse caused shock and grief throughout England. Thus, when Parliament met again at the beginning of 1629, there was no lack of grievances both in foreign and domestic policy. Yet, it was upon questions of religion that the attack began. The Commons showed themselves to be in a most aggressive mood, and worked themselves into passion by long debates upon the indulgence and laxity with which the laws against popery were enforced. This brought the great majority of them together, and the zealots, who, however intolerant, were ardent to purify what they deemed a corrupt church, joined with the patriots who were laying the foundations of English freedom. Just as the Muslim, defending his native soil, fortifies himself with the Quran, just as the rhinoceros trusts to his horn or the tiger to his claws. So these harassed parliamentarians found in the religious prejudices of England a bond of union and eventually a means of war. In a comprehensive resolution, the Commons declared that whoever furthered popery or Arminianism, whoever collected or helped to collect tonnage and poundage before it was granted, or even paid it, was a public enemy. The personal censures formerly heaped on Buckingham were now transferred to the Lord Treasurer, Richard Weston who was denounced as a papist, if not indeed a Jesuit, engaged in exacting taxes illegally. All this was embodied in a single remonstrance. The Speaker, who had been gained to the King's side, announced on March 2 that the King adjourned the House till the 10th, thus frustrating the carrying of the remonstrance. A wave of wrath swept through the Assembly. When the Speaker rose to leave he was forced back and held down on his chair by two resolute and muscular members, Holles and Valentine. The doors were barred against Black Rod, and the remonstrance, recited from memory by Holles, was declared carried by acclamation. The doors were then opened and the members poured forth tumultuously. It was a long time before any of them met in their chamber again. It had become plain to all that King and Commons could not work together on any terms. The next week Parliament was dissolved and the period of King Charles's personal rule began. Chapter 14 Personal rule The personal rule of the King was not set up covertly or by degrees. Charles openly proclaimed his intention. We have showed, he said, by our frequent meeting our people, our love to the use of Parliaments, yet, the late abuse having for the present driven us unwillingly out of that course, we shall account it presumption for any to prescribe any time unto us for parliaments, the calling, continuing, and dissolving of which is always in our own power, and shall be more inclinable to meet in parliament again, when our people shall see more clearly into our interests and actions and when such as have bred this interruption shall have received their condign punishment. This policy required other large measures. First, there must be peace with France and Spain. Without the support of Parliament Charles had not the strength to carry on foreign wars. It was not difficult to obtain peace. 
Indeed both the French and Spanish governments showed their contempt of English exertions when they voluntarily returned the prisoners they had taken at La Rochelle and in the Netherlands. The second condition was the gaining of some at least of the parliamentary leaders. Upon this there must have been a long discussion. In those days there were few men who did not seek the favor of the crown. Some sought it by subservience, and others by opposition. Eliot was regarded as irreconcilable, but Sir Henry Saville, Thomas Stiggis, and Wentworth were deemed both possible and serviceable acquisitions. Diggers had proved himself willing to endure prison for the parliamentary case, he thought somewhat readily in the royal sunshine. But Wentworth was the man of all others most worth winning. In the debates upon the petition of right he had taken a line marked by certain restraints. Behind the fierce invective of the parliamentarian there had been noticed a certain willingness not to exclude the other side of the argument. His abilities were obviously of the first order and so were his ambitions. His sombre force might mar or make the system the king now sought to establish. To Wentworth therefore the king turned. Indeed, even before the death of Buckingham this champion of parliament had made distinct overtures, all couched in dignified and reasonable guise. The securing of Wentworth had now become essential to the personal rule. Wentworth was more than willing. He knew he judged better than most other men, he was a born administrator, all he wanted was scope for his endeavors. In December 1628 he became Lord President of the Council of the North and a member of the Privy Council. From this moment he not only abandoned all the ideas of which he had been the ablest exponent, but all the friends who had fought at his side. He sailed on in power and favor while Eliot, his rival but for long his comrade, was condemned for contempt of the king's government and languished to his death in the tower. The very force of Wentworth's practical mind led him to a theme which was the exact contrary of all he had previously espoused. Elaborate explanations have been offered to mitigate the suddenness of this transformation. We are invited to regard him as the only man who could have achieved the reunion of Parliament and the monarchy. Allowance must be made for the different values assigned in those days to royal favor and public duty. As Rank justly but severely observes, the statesmen of England have always been distinguished from those of other countries by the combination of their activity in the council and in the cabinet with an activity in parliament, without which they cannot win their way into the other sphere. But there was as yet no clear consciousness of the rule infinitely important for the moral and political development of remarkable men, that the activity of a minister must be harmonious and consistent with his activity as a member of parliament. In the case of Wentworth especially it is clear that he opposed the government of that day, by which he was kept down, only in order to make himself necessary to it. His natural inclination was, as he once avowed, to live not under the frown but under the smile of his sovereign. The words of opposition to the government had hardly died away from his lips when, at the invitation of that government, he joined it, although no change had been introduced into its policy. This was the reason why a hatred centered upon Wentworth different from that which even incompetence attracted to other ministers. He was the Satan of the apostasy, the lost archangel, the suborned traitor to the cause of Parliament. No administrative achievements, no address in business no eloquence, no magnitude of personality, could atone to his former friends for his desertion. And they had eleven years to think about it all. Savile and Diggies had already accepted office, and a couple of eminent lawyers whose opinions had been adverse to the crown were also persuaded to sing the opposite tune. Wentworth therefore was enlisted by the king. The lesser figures of the parliamentary movement either suffered usage at the royal hands or, like Halls, Hazelrig, and Pyme, were allowed to brood and fume in obscurity. But the third and least sentimental condition of the personal rule was dominant money. How to get the money? First, an extreme frugality must be practiced by the executive no wars, no adventures of any kind, no disturbances, all state action reduced to a minimum, quietness by all means. These were the inevitable rules of King Charles's new system. Looking back, 
the modern eye may discern in this arbitrary regime some at least of those results at which Bright and Cobden aimed in the 19th century. The executive was at its weakest. All foreign enterprise was therefore barred. The Crown had to make shift with what it could scrape from old taxes. There even was in the Victorian day a casual saying, an old tax is no tax. The wealth gained by national toil fructified in the pockets of the people. Peace reigned throughout the land. No large question could be stirred. The king, with his elegant, dignified court, whose figures are portrayed by the pencil of Van Dyck, whose manners and whose morals were an example to all, reigned on the smallest scale. He was a despot, but an unarmed despot. No standing army enforced his decrees. There was more tolerance towards religious differences in the king's circle than anywhere else in the land. He sincerely believed, his judges vehemently asserted, and his people found it difficult to deny, that he was ruling according to many of the old customs of the realm. It is a travesty to represent this period of personal rule as a time of tyranny in any effective sense. In later years, under the yoke of Cromwell's major generals, all England looked back to these placid thirties as an age of ease and tranquility. But man has never sought tranquility alone. His nature drives him forward to fortunes which, for better or for worse, are different from those which it is in his power to pause and enjoy. The prerogative of the crown offered a wide and vaguely defined field within which taxes could be raised. The king, supported by his judges, strained all expedients to the limit. He not only persisted in levying tonnage and poundage, to which everyone had become accustomed, but he raised or varied the rates upon certain articles. He empowered commissioners to confirm, at a price, defective titles to lands and to commute frauds in their sale. He profited greatly by exercising the crown's rights of wardship over the estates of heirs who were minors. He mulcted all persons who had not obeyed the summons to receive knighthood at his coronation. Their attendance had long been regarded as a mere form, their absence now opened a source of revenue. He organized into a system the sporadic monopolies in which Queen Elizabeth and his father, to the resentment of Parliament, had indulged. Loopholes in the existing Act against monopolies enabled Charles to make new and more profitable grants, many of them to corporations, in which courtiers and landowners participated. This was in practice a system of indirect taxation farmed out through deeply interested tax gatherers. Large sums of money were paid for each concession, and a handsome due was yielded upon each year's trading. Those who benefited were all for the personal rule, while the many who did not swelled the opposition. The growth of London was widely viewed with apprehension. With its suburbs it numbered some 200,000 people. The plague lurked in their congested habitations, and public opinion had supported strict rules against new buildings. Nevertheless many had built houses and London and other cities grew. The King's commissioners now came along with the hard alternative, demolish or ransom. In some cases the poor, ill-housed society tore down the structures it had raised, in most they paid the fine. Meanwhile Wentworth, now Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, had, by a combination of tact and authority, reduced that kingdom to a greater submission to the British crown than ever before or since. He assuaged internal feuds, he established order and prosperity, and with an undoubted measure of general acquiescence he produced an Irish army and a substantial Irish subvention for the upkeep of Charles's crown. His repute in history must rest upon his Irish administration. At the end of seven years he stood at the head of a country which he had disciplined and exploited, but which, without any apparent violent measures or bloodshed, lay docile in his hands. By all these means under a modest frugal regime King Charles managed to do without a parliament. Hungry forces still lay in shadow. All the ideas which they cherished and championed stirred in their minds, but they had no focus, no expression. The difficulties of travel, the dangers of gathering at any point, the pleasant, easy life of peaceful England, oppressed their movement. Many who would have been vehement if the chance had come their way were content to live their life from day to day. The land was good, springtime, summertime, 
autumn, had their joys, in the winter there was the yule log and new amusements. Agriculture and fox hunting cast their compulsive or soothing balms upon restless spirits. Harvests were now abundant and the rise in prices had almost ceased. There was no longer a working class problem. The poor law was administered with exceptional humanity. Ordinary gentlefolk might have no share in national government, but there were still lords on their own estates. In quarter sessions they ruled the shires, and as long as they kept clear of the law and paid their taxes with a grunt they were left in peace. It required an intense effort by the parliamentary party to rouse in them under such conditions a national feeling and concern for the state. The malcontents looked about for points which would inflame the inert forces of the nation. Presently, Charles's lawyers and sleuth hounds drew attention to an anomaly which had grown with the passage of years. According to the immemorial laws of England, perhaps of Alfred the Great, the whole land should pay for the upkeep of the fleet. However, for a long time only the maritime counties had paid for the navy. Yet was not this navy the shield of all the peace and freedom which thrived in Britain? Why should not all pay where all benefited? There never was a juster demand made of its subjects by an island state than that all counties should share alike in the upkeep of the fleet. Put properly to a loyal parliament, it would have passed, with general consent, on its merits apart from ancient tradition. But the abuse of letting the inland counties go untaxed had grown into a custom not broken by Queen Elizabeth even in the days of the Armada. The project commended itself to the king. In August 1635 he levied ship money upon the whole country. Forthwith the Buckinghamshire gentleman, a former member of parliament, solidly active against the crown, stood forth among many others and refused to pay. His assessment was no more than twenty shillings but upon the principle that even the best of taxes could be levied only with the consent of Parliament he faced the distraint and imprisonment which were the penalties of contumacy. John Hampton's refusal was selected by both sides as a test case. The parliamentarians, who had no other means of expression, saw in it a trial upon which all eyes would be directed, and welcomed a martyr whose sacrifice would disturb the public tameness. They wished to hear the people groan at tyranny. The Crown, on the other hand, was encouraged by the logic of its argument. The case of Hampton therefore became famous at once and for ever. An obelisk at Prince Isresborough records to this day his valiant assertion that the inland counties have no concern for the Royal Navy, except in so far as Parliament shall require them to pay. The Crown prevailed. The judges were justified in their decision. It does not even appear that the law was strained but the grievance ran far and wide. Ninety percent of ship money was eventually collected for the year 1637, but only twenty percent for 1639. Everywhere persons of property looked up from their pleasant life and began to use again the language of the petition of right. Yet this alone would not have sufficed to rouse the country. The parliamentary party knew that upon the constitutional issue alone they could not succeed. They therefore continued to foster religious agitation as the surest means of waking England from its apathy. Here emerges the figure of the man who of all others was Charles's evil genius, William Lord, Archbishop of Canterbury. He was a convinced Anglican, wholehearted in his opposition both to Rome and to Geneva, and a leader in the movement away from Calvinism. But he had an itch for politics, had been a confidant of Buckingham was indeed the reputed author of Buckingham's most successful speeches. He stepped with agility from an academic career at Oxford into national politics and the King's Council at a time when religious affairs were considered paramount. The Elizabethan settlement was dependent on the state. By itself the church had not the strength to bear the strain. An informal compact therefore grew up between the secular and spiritual aspects of government whereby the state sustained the church in its property and the church preached the duty of obedience and the divine right of kings. Lord by no means initiated this compact, but he set himself with untimely vigor to enforce it. Among his innovations was the railing off of the altar, and a new emphasis on ceremony and the dignity of the clergy. The gulf between clergy and congregation was widened and the role of authority visibly enhanced. 
Thus the king's religious ideas marched in step with his politics and resentments multiplied. Lord now found a new source of revenue for the crown. Under the statutes of Elizabeth everyone was obliged to go to church, they might think as they liked, but they must conform in public worship. This practice had fallen into widespread disuse. Some did not trouble to go, to others it was abhorrent. Now all over England men and women found themselves hailed before the justices for not attending church, and fined one shilling a time. Here indeed was something that ordinary men and women could understand. This was no question for lawyers and judges in the court of the exchequer, it was something new and something teasing. The Puritans, already chafed, regarded it as persecution, they talked at large about the fires of Smithfield, to which this broad downward path must assuredly lead. The parliamentary agitation which had been conducted during all these years with so much difficulty gained a widespread accession of strength at a time when the king's difficulties had already massed themselves into a stack. The prosecutions before the prerogative courts of Pr and other Puritan writers, and the pillorying, branding, and cropping of ears which they suffered in punishment, were isolated blots upon a regime mild and good-natured compared with that of other countries in the recent past or the approaching future. One indeed it is by no means certain that, left to herself, England would have broken into revolt. It was in Scotland, the home of the Stuarts and Charles's birthplace, that the torch was lighted which began the vast conflagration. Lord was dissatisfied with the spiritual conditions prevailing in the northern kingdom, and he moved the king to make some effort to improve them. The Scots must adopt the English prayer book, and enter broadly into communion with their English brethren. Besides the desire for uniformity in religious ceremonies throughout the whole island, King Charles had practical and secular aims. His father had re established bishops in Scotland with the aim of disciplining the outspoken Presbyterian ministers. James had also adroitly backed the Scottish nobles in their resistance to the pretensions of the Kirk. Charles on his accession had alienated the nobles by an act which sought to take away from them all the church lands they had acquired since the Reformation. Furthermore, he was determined to reform the system of collecting tithes, which had largely fallen into their hands. The burden on the smaller landholders was to be reduced and the stipends of the clergy increased. Charles's plans for reinforcing episcopacy in Scotland thus drove the Scottish nobles into opposition. The bishops, for their part, as agents of the distant king, found themselves increasingly disliked by their own clergy as well as by the landowners. In order to strengthen the hands of the Scottish bishops a new exposition of canon law was framed emphasizing the position of the crown, and a new prayer book or liturgy was drawn up in London to regulate the forms of public worship in Scotland. These books were promulgated in the year 1636. No one appears to have foreseen the consequences. Charles and his advisers had no thought of challenging doctrine, still less of taking any step towards popery. They desired to assert the Protestant High Church view. They defined with new stress the royal supremacy and they prescribed, especially in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, a somewhat more elaborate ritual. Thus in their course they affronted at the same time the property interests of the powerful, the religious convictions of all classes, and the independent spirit of the Scottish nation. The resentment excited was general, and was immediately turned into the channels of most violent prejudice. The Scottish people believed, and were told by their native leaders to believe that they were to be forced by the royal authority to take the first fatal steps towards Roman Catholicism. Every tenet, every word, of the new prayer book was scanned with profound suspicion. Was not the king married to a popish wife, who practiced idolatry in her private chapel? Were not papists tolerated throughout England in a manner increasingly dangerous to the Protestant faith? Was there not a design to pave the way to Rome? When in July 1637 the dignitaries of Scottish Church and State were gathered in Street Giles's church in Edinburgh for the first solemn reading of the new prayer book it was evident that many ministers of religion and substantial laymen from all over Scotland had come into the city. 
an outburst of fury and insult overwhelmed the dean when he sought to read the new dispensation. A woman of the poorer classes even threw her footstool at the wolf in sheep's clothing now revealed in their midst. The ceremony became a riot. A surge of passion swept the ancient capital before which the episcopal and royal authorities trembled. Edinburgh had defied the crown, and no force was found to resist it. King Charles was startled by the news. He tried to reassure his Scottish subjects. He dwelt in forcible terms upon his hatred of popery, and professed himself willing to amend the new prayer book. But this was vain, only the immediate withdrawal of the offensive book could have availed. Instead a long argument on minor points began, with repeated concessions on the part of the king and growing anger throughout Scotland. Once again we see in a long period of wordy contention and legal interchanges the prelude to a violent convulsion. The Scots, shrewdly advised by their men of law, cast their resistance into the form of a petition, a grand supplication, under the pressure of which the new prayer book was withdrawn. But too late. A tempest was blowing which bore men forward. Respect and loyalty were still professed to the king the blast beat upon the bishops. At length the whole original policy of the king was withdrawn. It had served only to raise a counter-movement, which grew in intensity. All through the year 1637 King Charles was in appearance conceding and virtually apologizing, though at the same time he was meditating the use of force. Meanwhile the Scottish nation was forming a union which challenged existing conditions both in church and state. At the beginning of 1638 the petition was abandoned for the signing of a covenant. There was little new in this covenant. Much of it merely repeated the confession of faith agreed upon by all fifty years before under King James VI. At that time, amid the stress of the religious wars in Europe, there had been a desire to testify against the power and misdeeds of Rome. But the covenant now became the solemn bond of a whole nation. All who signed pledged themselves to adhere to and defend the aforesaid true religion, and forbear the practice of all novations in the matter of the worship of God till they be tried and allowed in free assemblies and in parliaments. Whatever was done against the weakest among them was to be the concern of all. On February 28, 1638, the covenant was read in the Church of Blackfriars in Edinburgh. The Earl of Sutherland, the first to sign his name thereto, was followed by a long list of notables who felt themselves borne forward upon what is described as the demoniacal frenzy of the populace. The scroll was signed in the church by many who cut a vein for their ink, and copies were taken for signature to nearly every town and village. It embodied the unalterable resolve of a whole people to perish rather than submit to popery. Nothing of this sort had ever been intended or dreamed of by the king, but this was the storm he had aroused. He met it by a fresh semblance of concessions. The Marquis of Hamilton, an experienced Scottish statesman, who was to follow his king to the scaffold, was sent to the North as lay commissioner, with the supreme aim of making friends again. Hamilton fought for nothing more than some show of dignity to cover the temporary royal retreat. He was expostulating with the whirlwind. It was agreed that a general assembly should be convoked. The committee of the Covenanters, sitting in Edinburgh, set themselves to organize the elections as elections had never been managed before. The assembly which met in Street Mungo's Cathedral in Glasgow was found to be dominated by the religious convictions of the Northern Kingdom, supported by a formidable lay element, who, surrounded by fervent adherents of all classes, sat armed with sword and dagger in the middle of the church. Before Charles sent Hamilton to Scotland they had had a significant conversation. The king had said that if the reconciliation failed Hamilton should collect troops and put down rebellion. But, said Hamilton, what if there be not enough troops found in the country for this purpose? Then, answered Charles, power shall come from England, and I will myself come in person with them, being resolved to hazard rather my life than to suffer the supreme authority to be contemned. This occasion now arose. The king was confronted with a hostile and organized assembly, gathered to adjust religious differences, but now led by armed lay elders, 
whose aims were definitely political and whose demand was the actual and virtual abolition of the episcopacy. He ordered the dissolution of the assembly. That body declared itself resolved to continue in permanent session. They took this step with full knowledge of what it meant. The refusal of the General Assembly of Scotland in November 1638 to dissolve upon the demand of the King's Commissioner has been compared to that of the French National Assembly in 1789, when for the first time the members resisted the royal will. The facts and circumstances no doubt were different, but both events led by unbroken chains of causation to the same end, namely, the solemn beheading of a King. Hamilton, the baffled peacemaker, returned to Whitehall, full of self-reproach for the advice he had given to the king. He now declared himself in favour of drastic measures. The matter was long debated in the king's council. On the one hand, it was asked, why draw the sword upon a whole people who still proclaimed their love and reverence for the crown? And how levy war upon them without money or armed forces and without the support of a united England? Moreover, Charles' ministers could not fail to see the deadly recoil of the Scottish revolt upon the English situation, so outwardly calm, so tense and brittle. If this succeeded where would it stop? The royal authority, supported by the courts of law, had reigned, not without challenge, but effectually, for more than ten years without a parliament. Here in the north was open defiance. Lord in England and Wentworth in Ireland were in constant correspondence, and to stamp it out while time remained was the mood of both. That mood prevailed, and both King and Covenanters looked about for arms and means of war. Force was now to be invoked. The King's Council turned its eyes to Wentworth's troops in Ireland, and even to Spain. There was talk of hiring 2,000 Spanish infantry to form the nucleus around which the well affected in Scotland, of whom there were many, especially in the eastern highlands, might gather. But the Covenanters had far better resources overseas. The famous part played by the Scots brigades and by Scottish generals under Gustavus Adolphus in Germany had left Scotland with an incomparable military reserve. Alexander Leslie had risen in the Thirty Years' War to the rank of Field Marshal. He felt himself called upon to return and fight the same quarrel on his native soil. To him it was but a flanking operation in the vast conflict of the Protestants with the Catholic Church. The appeal of Scotland to her warriors abroad was not in vain. Back they flowed in thousands, trained officers and men, the hardened, experienced leaders of many harsh campaigns. They became instantly the core of a disciplined army, with an organized, competent staff and an outstanding, capable commander-in-chief. The nobles of Scotland bowed to Leslie's military reputation. They obeyed his orders. Their personal rivalries were allayed. In a few months, and long before any effective preparations could be made in the south, Scotland had the strongest armed force in the island. It had military knowledge and good officers. It had more, it was inspired with earnest, slowly roused, and now fanatical religious passion. The preachers, sword at side, carbine in hand, aided the drill sergeants with their exhortations. The soldiers stood ranked in humble supplication, chanting their psalms. Overall there was a rigorous restraint, not only in religious but political opinion. They still had reverence for the king. They would even on occasion cheer his name. But their banners displayed the motto for Christ's crown, and the covenant. The lines of antagonism were drawn with cold, pedantic, inflexible resolve. In May 1639 this army, about 20,000 strong, stood upon the Scottish border opposite the weaker, ill-disciplined, and uncertain forces which Charles and his advisers had gathered. It was clear from the first that in the king's camp there was no united desire to make war upon the Scots, on the contrary, parleys were set on foot in a good spirit, and on June 18 the so-called pacification of Berwick was agreed. The Scots promised to disband their army and restore the royal castles which they had seized. The king agreed to the summoning in the following August both of a general assembly and of a parliament, that these should henceforth be regularly summoned, and that one should have the decision of ecclesiastical and the other of temporal affairs. He declined to recognize the enactments of the assembly at Glasgow, 
because they reflected upon his duty as a sovereign, but for the time being he accepted the abolition of the episcopacy. So far had he traveled since the gay plan of a high church liturgy. Charles however thought of the pacification as a device to gain time, and the covenanters were soon convinced of this. The spirit of independence was now aroused throughout Scotland. Wrath was expressed at the restoration of the royal fortresses, and fears at the dispersal of the Scottish army. Hamilton, returning to Scotland, found himself in a world of rising antagonism. The Scottish Parliament, which met in Edinburgh at the end of August 1639, claimed forthwith that the King's Privy Council should be responsible to it, and that the King should follow its advice in appointing commanders of troops, and especially of fortresses. They repudiated the jurisdiction of the Treasury, particularly in the coinage, which was being debased, and they even required that honours and dignities should be bestowed in accordance with their wishes.